This is Audible. Surviving the Evacuation, Book Eight, Anglesey, written by Frank Tail, narrated by Tim Bruce. Prologue: Elysium, the Republic of Ireland, ten hundred hours, the twentieth of September, day one hundred and ninety-two. Trapped. There's no other word to describe it. I'm trapped in a small room with zombies beating against the walls outside. I have a liter of water, a handful of high-calorie ration bars that only the most desperate of submariners would call food, and I'm alone. Unlike when I was trapped in my flat in London, I'm not worried. Just over a month ago, when I wrote my last entry, I really did intend it to be the end of my journals and a conclusion to that part of my life. I thought we'd found a refuge on Anglesey. A place where we could be safe. I wasn't completely wrong, but that's another way of saying I wasn't entirely correct. I promised Annette that I'd write an account of the last tumultuous month, and, as she insists on describing it, how she saved civilization. As I currently have a pen, paper, and little else to do until Kim rescues me, I might as well record it now. And there's no better place to start than with where I am. I'm a few miles south of Kinmare Bay in County Kerry, on the southwestern coast of the Republic of Ireland. More specifically, I'm in the garage of a walled fifty-acre farm called Elysium. At least that's the name that's carved into the plaque by the main gate. According to the address at the top of an unpaid parking ticket I found in the desk drawer, it's called Ifran. My Irish Gaelic is almost non-existent. The little I know comes from a dismal childhood holiday at Caulfield Hall, the Masterton's family estate. It rained non-stop, and I was beyond bored as Jen spent most of that summer visiting family friends in Monaco. I found little with which to entertain myself, other than a few books on Celtic legends. They were in English, but with a handful of Gaelic words peppered in. At the back was a vocabulary list. Ifram was often used. And I always understood it to mean hell, not some Elysian paradise. The garage is large enough for four partially dismantled cars parked abreast, though there are only three in there right now. I'm in the stiflingly hot office at the side. It's about twelve feet by ten, with a door to the outside, a door to the garage, and a hatch leading to the roof. I've barricaded the exterior door with a filing cabinet. If I listen carefully. I can hear the zombies that chased me in here. They're pawing and clawing at the door, but it's sturdy and secure. I'm safe. The reason I need to listen carefully is that two dozen more are hammering at the metal shutters that cover the entire north face of the garage. Inside, there's a set of sliding transparent doors that can be opened so the cars can be driven out. With the shutters down, there's no light in the garage. And no light in this office except that which comes from the hatch immediately above my head. Beyond the zombies immediately outside, there are forty or so gathered in the driveway near the fountain. There are at least that many, and probably more, near the tennis courts, and pushing their way through the trees that screen the fifty acres of farmland from the three-story mansion. I didn't get too good a view of the building before the zombies appeared through that screen of trees. It's a mystery where they came from. They, it is they, not they. I've only just noticed that I've been writing it in the lower case. Kim said that my use of the capitalization was a way of dissociating myself from the impossible horror surrounding us. I won't lie and say I don't fear them, particularly when I can hear their desiccated fingers dragging against the brickwork outside. It's simply that they are no longer my greatest fear. The nuclear power plant on Anglesey could melt down. The water treatment plant could break. The old world food stores may run out before we have productive farmland. And of course, there are threats that only come with people. I don't mean disease, though it is an increasingly present danger. I mean violence and murder, and the fear and disunity those bring. That is why the undead are they, not they. Not any more. Whatever I call them, whatever my fears for the future, right now the zombies are my most immediate problem.
Bringing this fifty-acre estate as a wall that appeared unbroken on the satellite images. Then again, from those images we thought this property was free of the undead. A mile beyond the wall is the Atlantic coast and a concrete jetty at which our boat is tied. It's a racing yacht guarded by Lilith and Will. Kim is inside the mansion with Simon and Rob. When I climbed up onto the garage's roof, I saw her hanging a sheet from one of the house's second-floor windows. I waved and she waved back, so I know she's inside the mansion and she knows I'm here. In the chaos of the fight and the rush to reach my shelter, I lost my pack. It was ripped from my shoulders by a ragged creature with blonde hair, wearing top-of-the-line hiking boots and a fleece to match. It's telling, isn't it, that even the best prepared stood no chance against the undead. I suppose my pack is lying in the dirt outside, only a few yards away. That's as good as saying it's back on angle, see. Unfortunately, my radio is inside the bag, so I can't call Kim. She'll have hers, and would have relayed our predicament to Lilith and Will. They have a sat phone, so news will already have reached Anglesey. There's a fifty-fifty chance that Sholto has drafted some sailors from the Veermund, or marines from the Harpers Ferry, commandeered a ship and is already halfway here. Assuming Kim can reach Will and Lilith, of course. The radios work on line of sight, and I don't know whether the coast can be seen from the house. Even if Kim can't reach the boat and Sholto isn't on his way, I'm not worried. Though we thought there were no zombies here, we planned for the possibility. It's just a matter of waiting a day or two. The zombies will drift away or adopt that squatting, sedentary stance. They'll make easy targets for Kim, Simon and their silenced rifles. Perhaps even Rob will manage to hit one. I'm not sure whether it can be defined as ironic, though it's certainly amusing. But I wasn't meant to be on this trip. Sholto was. He's as close to an expert on Kempton and this property as we have. The ironic part, and the reason he's watching Annette and Daisy instead of being here, is that he twisted his ankle the night before the expedition was due to depart. I was meant to watch the children and spend this time planning the island's upcoming election. Instead, we swapped places. Perhaps it isn't ironic, but watching him supporting himself on crutches as he waved us off made me smile. It wasn't out of enjoyment at his pain, but because such an injury is a minor irritation, not the potential death sentence it would have been out in the wasteland. As I say, I'm not worried. I'm trapped, but I'm safe, and I just have to be patient. I'll admit that I wish we had some of Admiral Gunderson's marines or some of the French special forces on this trip. Even with the arrival of the Harper's Ferry and its mostly American crew, we've too few trained personnel to spare. Ours isn't the only group taking advantage of the Indian summer that swept across Ireland and Wales. Most of the Rangers, Marines and Special Forces have gone with Heather Jones and our newly recruited volunteers to investigate the lights seen on the Isle of Man. Others are scouting Blackpool, Liverpool, and the dozens of small islands that dot the Irish Sea. The rest are going to Belfast International Airport. By comparison, our mission to loot a billionaire's estate should have been a holiday. Certainly, we were expecting it to be straightforward. We were to see whether the solar panels were undamaged, the wind turbines intact, the electric cars were still in the garage, and whether Lisa Kempton had laid in a large stash of supplies. I don't know what Kim's found in the house, but there's no electric cars in the garage, just three ancient Rolls Royces. The solar panels on the garage's roof look undamaged, and the turbines still tower over the farmland, but Lilith will need to inspect them before we know if they still work. I've just reread that, and realized I probably need to explain who Lisa Kempton was. She was a billionaire, whose face graced the covers of all the right magazines, and she was part of the conspiracy that destroyed the old world. Cholto isn't sure how much she knew, but we're certain she bought this farm as a retreat, in case the apocalypse should occur. I think that says a lot about her confidence in Quigley and his ilk. Though I doubt I need to explain who Quigley was, there are some details of the conspiracy that have come to light since I began my first journal back in March, and which I should record here. The initial outbreak 
was on the 22nd of February. The footage of people savagely attacking one another in New York was broadcast on social media and news networks across the planet. At the time, no one knew why or how it was happening. Even if the footage was disbelieved, people couldn't ignore when their neighbors, their friends, their siblings, parents and children were attacked and infected, died, and then returned as inhuman monsters. Though that initial outbreak occurred in February, the foundations of this apocalypse were laid long before. Some of the conspiracy's details will forever be clouded in mystery, and that's for the best. We know enough to be collectively bewildered at the selfish and ultimately misguided opportunism of those involved. During the early days of the Cold War, concerned with a biological attack by the Soviets, Britain began work on a super-vaccine. The goal was to create a one-injection-cures-all solution to the world's most feared diseases. The project was an abject failure, and when the threat of bio-warfare was superseded by mutually assured destruction, the scheme was mothballed. It wasn't forgotten. Decades later, it was resurrected by a cabal of politicians principally from Britain and the United States. Their plan was to use the super-vaccine as a bargaining chip in pursuit of a new, multilateral empire. Governments across the world would be offered a vaccine for a price, and not one that could be paid with hard currency. The cabal wanted policies and treaties favorable to Western democracy. Of course, they had a very different definition of democracy than you or I. Any nation that refused would be destroyed in nuclear fire. That was their plan. It was insane, but so were its architects, consumed by an obsession with power and glory that the ballot box could never satisfy. The vaccine worked, more or less, but with an unfortunate side effect. It turned patients into monstrous beasts for which we have to rely on fiction to name. Calling them zombies is inaccurate, but there was little time for scientific research during the initial outbreak. Not enough scientists are left to do it now. We do know that some people are naturally immune. We estimated at around 50% of those who made it to Anglesey. That's another way of saying that only those lucky enough to be immune, or simply very lucky, have survived. I was not a digital spectator to Manhattan tearing itself apart. I missed the reports from New Jersey, California and Quebec, from Mexico, France, and Korea. I miss the imposition of martial law in Britain, the nationalization of the press, the introduction of a curfew. It happened by chance, an absurd twist of fate that ultimately saved my life. As news of Manhattan was filtering through to a stunned planet, I broke my leg. I was unconscious in hospital for three days. When I woke up, the world I'd known was gone. With one leg in plaster, I was sent home. It was a dismal little flat with little charm and less space. With nothing for company but a bottle of painkillers and an occasional visit from Jen Masterton, I came up with an evacuation plan. The less defensible inland cities will be evacuated to the coast. The people, the machinery, even some factories would be relocated. We would create giant, fortified farms. We would survive and retake Britain, and then save the world. I'll admit that my inspiration owed as much to the painkillers as it did to my knowledge of disaster management. I gave my plan to Jen Masterton. She belonged to one of those old English families that could trace their lineage back for centuries and pitied those who couldn't. Her grandfather had renounced the peerage so he could sit in the commons. Her father had been Chancellor. She, in a tepid act of rebellion, had stood for the opposition. She'd won a seat in Parliament by a landslide, partly thanks to me. My parents had died when I was young, and I'd been informally adopted by hers. Jen and I grew up together, and together we were planning her rise to the leadership of the party, and then the nation. What I didn't know then, and only learned much later, was that her family had been involved in the super-vaccine project for decades. Because of that, and because he thought he could control her, 
Quigley, the foreign secretary who assassinated the prime minister, gave her a seat in his emergency cabinet. The only similarity between the evacuation plan I devised and the one that was implemented was the name. The cities were emptied, but the evacuees were murdered. Quigley had calculated that following a global collapse there were simply too many people in Britain. Not all could be fed, and those who were left to fend for themselves could too easily become infected, and so join the ranks of the undead. There may have been some twisted logic to this perversion of the ultimate sacrifice, but there's no forgiving that genocidal act of betrayal. Quigley's plans were thwarted by nuclear war. It was his own fault. His and the other members of the cabal who'd seen the outbreak as an opportunity to seize power. They'd forgotten that there were other nations in the world who would hold them responsible and so take revenge. It's unclear who launched the first nuclear missiles. We're not even sure how many were detonated. We do know that some commanders rebelled. Some missiles weren't launched and some targets were changed. Even so, vast swathes of the planet are now radioactive deserts. I missed that, too. I was stuck in my flat for months, hoping for rescue. It didn't come, when I ran out of food before my leg was properly healed. I had no choice but to limp my way through London and then beyond. It was a nightmare journey, made in constant pain and just as much fear. I found safety in a ruined abbey in Hampshire. Soon after, I found Kim. She'd been held prisoner, though enslaved, may be a better word, in an old country house in Wiltshire. Together, the two of us rescued thirteen-year-old Annette and the infant Daisy. We met Barrett, Stuart, and some other survivors. At first, we didn't realize how their experiences had warped their souls. Not until they abducted the children and left Kim and I for dead. As we pursued them, we came to Lenham Hill, the facility where the vaccine virus was created. There we found Sholto, the American political fixer, who'd fed me secrets and data on my allies and enemies. And there, and then, I learned that Sholto is my brother. Our father worked for the government as an off-the-books assassin, whose handler was Quigley, and whose superior was old Lord Masterton. Something happened to our father on his last mission. When he returned home, he shot our mother, then himself. I was just an infant. Sholto was a teenager, and he saw it all from the back garden. He stayed there, frozen with shock, and saw Quigley arrive. He saw his infant brother taken away. He saw Quigley light a match and burn the house to the ground. My brother ran. The next day, he saw the news reporting that a man, woman, and two children had died in that inferno. He kept running, and never really stopped. He ended up in the U.S., working as a campaign advisor, similar in some ways to me, though on a much grander scale. He planned his revenge until he learned of the plot that would destroy the world. He tried to stop the conspiracy. He tried, but he failed. Together, Kim, Sholto, and I rescued Annette and Daisy. We went north and west, searching for a refuge. We stumbled across George Tull and a group of survivors on a beach in Wales. They claimed to have a safe haven, but told us that Quigley was still alive. I found him in the old Masterton family home in Northumberland. I also found Jen. She was infected. She died. Cholto and I killed Quigley. We escaped and we went to Anglesey, where we discovered ten thousand survivors. There was electricity, thanks to the nuclear power plant. There was grain, thanks to the three giant cargo ships hijacked by the Royal Navy during the days following the outbreak. There was fish, thanks to the hundreds of sailing boats. Most importantly, there were no zombies. It seemed like paradise. You know what they say about paradise? Evil lurks within. That was at the beginning of August, and shortly before I wrote my last entry. As to what happened next, 
I suppose that the best place to begin is with the day when I first met Lilith, Will, Simon, and Rob. Chapter 1 Anglesey 0430, the 15th of August, Day 156 The day began with a plaintive whimper. Though my eyes were closed, I hadn't been asleep. And that insisted that the lights be left on day and night, and I couldn't get used to it. I couldn't get used to a proper bed either. I had left hours for the more familiar comfort of a chair an hour before. At least the ever-present light meant I could read. I was working my way through the various books I'd picked up in the wasteland and discarded half-read, rather than be burdened by the additional weight. The whimper came again. I pushed myself out of the chair and over to Daisy's cot. She was as unfamiliar with its newfound comfort as we were with beds covered in genuine laundered sheets. At least I thought that was why she found it hard to sleep. Come on, I said, and carried her downstairs. Our cottage has five bedrooms, if you count the annex, my brother claimed. Two bathrooms, if you count the one Annette insists, is for her sole use. A few living rooms, an old-fashioned library, and a very modern kitchen. There's a small garden in the front and a much larger one at the back, with a trio of fields behind it that are hours to ten should we want to. It's almost exactly the sanctuary I dreamed of during our trek through the wasteland. As with most dreams... Reality was not nearly as perfect. After half an hour of walking the floors with Daisy, it was clear she wasn't going back to sleep. Dawn was close enough that I could distinguish between dirt and shadow in our front garden. It's a tad scruffy, isn't it? I murmured. You know, yesterday I read an interesting book on domestic gardening. Red? Daisy murmured, suddenly interested. I knew what her mispronunciation meant and what she'd thought I'd said. All right, fine, I said. We'll go and get some bread. It had become a morning ritual. I strapped her into the pushchair and strapped on my belt with its hatchet, knife and holstered pistol. That was just as much part of the ritual as our trips to the bakery. So was checking the front and back windows to make sure there were no zombies outside. There weren't. Our cottage is on Holy Island, the small island to the west of Anglesey. Famous for its burial sites and ancient religious landmarks, it was best known in recent years for the port of Holyhead, from which ferries to Ireland departed. The bridges connecting Holy Island to Anglesey still stand, but those connecting Anglesey to the Welsh mainland were destroyed in the early days of the outbreak. Shortly after that, the island was cleared of the undead. No one says much about that, but the recently dug graves in the cemetery speak to the difficulty of the task. Old instincts that have kept you alive die hard. I checked the front and back a second time before opening the door. Isn't it a beautiful day? I said to Daisy, as I pushed her outside. Red, Daisy said again, this time more emphatically. That's right, dear, bread, I said. We'll see if the baker's awake. Daisy half swiveled in her chair, stared at my face, as if making sure I was to be trusted, then turned around again, satisfied. It was a beautiful day, and despite the early hour, I didn't mind being out in it. Our time in the wasteland had been days of travelling until exhaustion forced us to stop, and sleepless nights taking turns to stand sentry. It was wonderful being able to walk the empty roads, without worrying that the undead lurked behind every overgrown hedge or inside every abandoned car. Our cottage is half a mile to the northeast of Holyhead. The old ferry terminal had become the principal port, and the population hub for our little community. That wasn't by design, but simply because it was the harbour into which the grain ships had been towed. They'd been hijacked by the Royal Navy during the chaos that followed the outbreak, but were still at sea when the nuclear missiles were launched. Abandoned on the open ocean, the grain carriers were salvaged by Mr. Mills and the crew of his submarine, the formerly HMS Vehement. The wheat, oats and maize coupled with fresh-caught fish have become the survivor's staple diet. Bread and fish, however you cook it, is hardly a balanced diet, but compared to the lean months in the wasteland, it's a feast. 
My first emotion on seeing hundreds of boats lining the coast had been shock. That sank into dismay when I realized that most of their occupants only ventured ashore to claim their daily allotment of grain. Even the return of electricity hadn't enticed them into the houses on the mainland. In fairness to them, some of the sailors did take their boats out every morning and brought back more fish than we could eat. Fishing was how they'd survived the outbreak. It had become routine, and therein was the problem. Some of the farmland was being turned over by hand, but it was the exception. The number of people trying to forge something close to a new life could be counted in the hundreds. Those who stayed on their boats, listening to old music, watching old DVDs or otherwise trying to pretend that the last seven months hadn't happened, could be counted in their thousands. And then there's the baker, I said. Red? Daisy asked. Ah, so you associate the word baker with bread, I said. Red? Yep, bread, I said. There were a few nascent businesses on the island. The return of electricity also meant the return of Maine's water. An Icelandic plumber had joined forces with a former manager of a Caribbean hotel to open a laundrette in a row of terraced houses near the waterfront. My first thought on seeing that had been pride that not even the apocalypse could dampen the entrepreneurial spirit. My second thought had been that the laundrette was completely unnecessary since a washing machine and the water and the electricity to run it were available in any of the tens of thousands of unoccupied homes. Daisy raised her hand, pointing at a brown feathered bird with wide feet, white markings on its beak, and a wingspan at least that of a raven's. I slowed to watch as it pecked at the green lichen spreading across the road. It gave us a beady stare, flapped its wings and took off, landing in the branches of a tall conifer behind an unoccupied house. Leaves and litter had gathered in the porch, the paint was peeling, and ivy was drifting towards the door. Left like that, damp would soon get in, the wood would rot, and it would become unlivable. Soon after the house would collapse. The bird took wing, flying up and around in a great loop before landing on the roof, on an abandoned blue family four-door with flat tires. Bird, I said to Daisy, hoping she'd parrot it back. Bird! Daisy stayed silent. Don't know what type of bird, I said, pushing her onward. Never saw one like that in London. But there are lots of birds on the island, aren't there? Depending on whom you ask, the birds were either suffering from a population explosion due to the lack of predators, or had sought refuge on Anglesey in much the same way we had. There'll be a problem when we start planting, I said. If we start planting. If! Daisy echoed, that's right, if, I said, but she didn't repeat the word again. I told myself to stop worrying about things I could do nothing about. Quigley was dead. The undead were only a threat on the mainland, and we were safe. Anglesey wasn't perfect, but it was infinitely better than the life we'd led mere weeks ago. Life is good, I said, as we approached a set of traffic lights. They still worked. I suppose no one's figured out how to turn them off, or perhaps no one's bothered trying. The lights changed from green to red. On a whim, I stopped. You have to stop at a red light, I said. Red? Daisy asked, and I knew she wasn't talking about the light. Yes, Daisy, we're going to get some bread. A year ago, the sign had read Fish and Chips. Now it read, Fish for bread. Since our last visit, a stylized plane had been added to the sign. Like the laundrette, my initial good cheer at discovering there was a bakery was soon tempered by the realization that it was just as unnecessary. There was more grain in the three giant cargo carriers than we could eat before it spoiled. Anyone could have bread if they simply ground the wheat into flour. Most people couldn't be bothered and would rather trade for it. Money was worthless. But fish wasn't the only acceptable currency. By the door to the bakery was a handwritten board listing the current prices. Tea was at the top, with spices next. Coffee came in third, in a clear testament to the demographics of the customers. 
Washing detergent was near the middle, with light bulbs below it, and soap below that. Shoelaces, needles, batteries, the list was long, but we had nothing to trade. When Sholto and I had arrived on Anglesey, we'd found the cupboards in the cottage full, and I'd taken that for granted. The food, the clothing, and all the other supplies were gifts from Mary O'Leary and George Tull. Partly it was a thank you for dealing with Quigley, but mostly it was a gift for Daisy and Annette. There were so few children among the survivors that they are more prized than any possession. Daisy and I had discovered that for ourselves during our first early morning walk through the old port town. All she'd had to do was give the fresh bait rolls a soulful glance, and one would be willingly handed over. Today was no different. There you go, Scott Higson said, passing one down to her. Daisy tore into it, scattering breadcrumbs on the ground. Higson was always working the counter when we walked past, though I couldn't tell if the cheerful Australian was the owner or just the baker on the morning shift. The plane's new, I said, pointing at the sign. Yeah, guess what I did before, he said with a shrug. Old Mrs. O'Leary promised I'll be flying a helicopter back from Belfast Airport. That's what I want, you see. One last crack at the sky. It's not the same as a jet, but it's all we've got left. Another few years and the choppers all be covered with more rust than you'll find on a Victorian anchor. I thought the plane out front might remind old Mary O'Leary about Belfast. Keep it fresh in her mind. A few of the seagulls waddled closer. I made to shoo them away. Don't, Hickson said. We'll all net them as soon as he'd gone. Seagull's a bit gamey, but it makes a change from fish. Business isn't good? I asked. Good enough, he said. We've got the yeast perfected now. We'll start working on a proper oven soon. In the makeshift kitchen behind him were dozens of domestic bread makers, alongside almost as many kitchen ovens. Nah, the problem is that people don't have much to trade besides fish, and after a few months at sea, oh, I sorely want a steak. He glanced back at the heat haze billowing from the kitchen. Well, I'd settle for air conditioning. Here. Take one for a sister, he said, passing me another fresh roll. And I'll see you tomorrow, Daisy. He gave her a wave and went back to his ovens, and we continued our walk heading towards the sea. We need something to trade, I said, something other than your smile. I suppose we could plant some crops in the garden. Oh, it's too late in the year for most vegetables. Cabbages, maybe? Radishes? What else comes into season in winter? A better question is where we might find the seeds. Daisy was engrossed in her bread roll, but I didn't mind. I found great pleasure in being able to talk aloud, and as loud as I liked. I suppose we could find goods to trade, of course not on the island. Though few people lived ashore, most of the houses had been emptied of clothing, detergent, toiletries, and anything else that didn't have an expiry date. Well... Either we find something we can make, or we'll have to go back to the mainland and scavenge supplies ourselves. I don't know how we'll do that, except we'll have to start by finding a boat. It's something to discuss with Kim. We'll take a look at the ship, shall we? And then we'll go back. The others should be awake by then. I paused by the wharf so Daisy could watch the loading of a luxury multi-deck yacht. She was more concerned with a pair of pigeons covetously eyeing her role. According to the name painted on the ship's side, it was called the Smuggler's Salvation. I noticed it during one of our previous walks, partly because of its size and shape, and partly because of the solar panels arrayed on the deck. It must have been a billionaire's plaything, not a party boat, but something designed for travelling from one offshore tax haven to the next. The captain, Miguel, a man with a gold tooth who looked like he came straight out of a casting for a swashbuckling villain, saw us, grabbed something from just inside the cabin, and jumped ashore. The first mate, a blonde with alabaster skin, followed close behind. Our historian, Miguel said with a warmth that belied his piratical appearance. I wanted to thank you. You did? I asked. What for? You've given us something to read on our journey, he said waving a bundle of loosely tied papers. Oh, where are you going? I asked. 
Svalbard, the first mate said. My brain whirred trying to remember her name. I thought it was Colette. There was a NATO supply dump there, she said. We're leaving as soon as the tide turns. There should be enough oil to sail a fleet down to Australia, Miguel said, or so the rumours go. He sounded as if he was talking about some long-lost buried treasure. Perhaps he was. Something else he'd said gave my brain a kick. What do you mean, read? I asked. He held out the bundle of papers. It was my journal. You did what? I yelled. You heard? Annette snapped back, switching her tone from apologetic to defensive. Bill, Kim said warningly. I bit down another pointless rhetorical question. Instead, I picked up the bundle of photocopied papers from where I dropped them on the kitchen table. You copied my journal, I said, stating the blindingly obvious. You know, two people came up to me this morning and asked for my autograph. Really? Kim asked, barely able to suppress a laugh. Did you give it? It's not funny, I said. At least, I didn't think it was. Nor had it been funny to be accosted by two almost strangers and asked to sign the bundle of papers. Miguel and Colette had thought it just as hilarious as Kim, and that wasn't helping my mood. How many copies did you make? I demanded of Annette. What does that matter? She replied. You photocopied them, I said. We can't make any more toner. When it's gone, it really will be gone. As it is, I doubt any of it will survive the damp of the winter. Right, exactly, Annette said. So if we don't use it, it'll be gone forever, so where's the harm? Think of all the other things we could have done with the ink, I said. Like what? She said, her tone rising to match mine. I, I, I couldn't think of anything. That's not the point. I said, it was my journal. You had no right to copy it. Then you had no right to put us in it, Annette said. It's just as much my story as it is yours. You said as much. You said you were writing it for me and Daisy so we'd know what happened and why. That means it's ours, and that means I can make a couple of hundred copies if I want. A couple of hundred? You can't be serious. I'd assumed it was just a couple of dozen. It's important. Annette said, it's everybody's story and everybody needs to know. It tells them how they came here. Honestly, I don't see why you're so angry. Really? You don't? Do you even know what invasion of privacy is? Behind her, Kim shook her head. You gave it to me, Annette said. When you went off to kill Quigley without even saying goodbye, you gave it to me. You didn't, didn't. Tears bubbling up in her eyes, she ran from the kitchen. I turned to go after her. Leave her, Kim said. A moment later, the front door slammed. On the whole, she continued, I think it's possible you could have handled that worse. I'm not entirely sure how, but give me time and I'll think of something. You think this is funny? I asked. I think this is one of those laugh or cry moments, Bill, she said. Given all that's happened, I know which I'll choose. She picked up the journal. Your handwriting's terrible. Maybe as a punishment, you could get her to type it out. Doesn't she know about privacy, about boundaries? I said, ignoring the invitation to laugh the whole thing off. If you're just going to start listing words, I'll get you a thesaurus, Kim said. Why did she do it? You don't have much experience of teenagers, do you? She said. Not since there was one, I said. And that was in an all-boys boarding school. Look, there are only about thirty kids here around her age. And they form their own cliques. She wanted to fit in, and she's the latecomer, the outsider. She needed to impress them. How better than with this? It's proof that she did what they didn't. She survived out there on her own. She rescued Daisy long before we found her. She wanted the other kids to know. Be thankful that after all she's been through... This is the way she's acting out. She did this just to fit in? I asked, confusion replacing anger. Not entirely, Kim said, and not consciously, but that's the motivating factor. She lost everything, Bill, her parents, her home, her friends, even her childhood. She's only thirteen, and finds it hard to articulate, so she puts on a cheerful exterior. 
Underneath, she's a roiling cauldron of rage. Wait, you knew about this? I found out last night, Kim said. I was going to tell you after we'd had breakfast. Why not yesterday? I demanded, anger returning to the fore. Because we were having such a nice, normal evening, she said. I had this crazy notion that you weren't going to take the news well. I can't think why I imagined that. Look, Bill, you weren't out in the wasteland alone. What you went through, I went through too, and what I went through on my own was far worse than the betrayal you suffered. If anyone should feel upset about having her secrets told to the world, it's me. And I'm not happy. I'm certainly not happy with the way you portrayed me. But it's done. You wrote it, Annette copied it, People have read it. There's little point arguing over what's done. Kim was right, of course. I've been stuck in my flat during the evacuation and those chaotic months that followed. At the time, I thought I was hard done by. But in comparison with what she and Annette had experienced, I was lucky. They both went on the evacuation and survived it, and the worst that came after. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. But right then I was too angry to consider the truth in her words, or how the amusement had dropped from her voice. This can't be excused, I said, and it can't be ignored. It was just wrong. What she did was wrong, I think, Kim said. You need some time to work out precisely why you're upset. Watch Daisy. Why? Where are you going? To find Annette, she said. She left, and I didn't follow. Considering all I'd said, it was the best decision I'd made that morning. Though we travelled together, fought together, and saved one another's lives, we weren't a family. Not quite, not yet. And not in the way the word would have been used a year ago. For good or ill, though, we were stuck with one another. Daisy was at her quarter-sized plastic table next to the wide windows that looked out on the overgrown garden. She was stabbing a paintbrush at a sheet of paper in a lacklustre fashion. It's all right, Daisy, I said. If we didn't love one another, we wouldn't bother to argue. I pulled out a kitchen chair, sat next to her, and stretched out my leg. The new brace was comfortable, in a way that only emphasised how makeshift were those I'd made myself. The leg is a few inches shorter than it should be. Dr. Knight suggested re-breaking it so it could set properly. I didn't need to spend long remembering my months in a cast before giving a definitive no. My hand gave me the most bother. The stumps of my missing two fingers itched, ached, and occasionally seeped. I resisted the urge to scratch. What are you painting? I asked. Is it a house? No. Daisy had few words or few that she shared with us. It was hard to be sure of her age, but I'd have said she was around two. That was what we were talking about the previous night. We were going to pick a date for Daisy's birthday and plan a real celebration, an event that would mark the beginning of our new lives in our new world. Are they trees? I asked, wondering if the green paint had been chosen for a reason other than that it was the one closest to her hand. No. A boat? I asked, taking a stab in the dark. Daisy turned her head to give me a frown, as if she was wondering how I could be so stupid not to immediately recognise what it was. Then she turned back to her paint. I sighed, stood, and went over to the kettle. It's nice to have a kettle again, I said. A cup of tea always puts things into perspective, doesn't it? Daisy didn't reply. Then we'll go back to the baker's and see what a birthday cake would cost. Daisy turned her head, this time with far more interest. That's right, I said, a birthday cake. I thought back, but couldn't think of an occasion when we'd have used those words during our time in the wasteland. Do you remember cake? Or was it the baker? Baker? Ah, well, wait until you see what a cake is. Of course, that brings us back to the question of how we'll pay for it. There are only eight tea bags in the box. I placed one in a cup. I don't think we'll trade for it. Maybe there's some work we can do for Mrs. O'Leary, 
And again, what work am I qualified for? The water boiled, and the kettle clicked off at the same time as the back door opened. Morning, Daisy, Sholto said. That's a great picture. It's a bird, right? Bird, Daisy said, stabbing the brush at the paper for emphasis. Where's everyone else? Sholto asked as I tried to work out what parts of the blob were the wings. Ah, uh, we had a row. Annette copied my journal and distributed it across the island. I gave him the edited highlights of the confrontation. You want my advice? He asked and continued before I could say no. Apologize. Always apologize and swiftly move on. Life is far too short to let an argument fester. Kim said much the same thing. I said, Where were you? Walking, he said. I couldn't sleep. You're thinking of America again? I asked. Of the people, he said. A house is a house the world over, but the people. Now that I've time, I can't help but wonder what became of them. I don't know if they're still holding on, but if they are, they could be dead tomorrow. Anglesey might be the refuge they need. I was hoping Sophia Augusto might uh, give me a ride over there, but since she's gone south to help tow that hospital ship back, I have to wait. That's what's getting to me. The waiting. The Harper's Ferry? It was a U.S. Navy hospital ship that the vehement had stumbled across when it was hunting Quigley's submarine. There'll be an American crew on board who'll want to know what happened in the States, I said. I'm sure someone will organize an expedition. Yeah, me, he said. Ah, you've decided to go then? I think so, he said. Someone has to. No, it's, it's not that. I have to. I have to know. I have to see it for myself. I won't be able to rest until I do. Is there any coffee? Not much. That's something we need to discuss, but it'll wait until Kim gets back with Annette. In fact, that might be a good way of framing my apology. I drank my tea and he his coffee, talking around his return to America, without ever explicitly mentioning it. I'd spent my life thinking I was an orphan. Having discovered I had a brother, I was reluctant to see him disappear. I wouldn't be so selfish as to ask him to stay. The unfamiliar sound of an engine outside was a welcome relief from the increasingly awkward conversation. We both hurried to the front door. Petrol was scarce on Anglesey, and though there are plenty of abandoned cars, this was the first time I'd seen a vehicle actually being driven. A minibus had pulled into the drive. It looked as if there were only two occupants, George Tull and Gwen, both of whom we'd first met with Donny, Francois, and the others on the Welsh beach before I set out to confront Quigley. Is Kim here? George called out through the open passenger window. No? Why? I asked, taking a step nearer. Where's she gone? George asked. No idea. I said, why? Shame, George said. I wanted to borrow her rifle. Her too. What for? I asked, not bothering to hide the irritation in my tone. Gwen stuck her head out of the window. A group went over to Carnarfon on a supply run, she said, speaking quickly. They were due back this morning, but radioed in to say they were trapped. The radio went dead. We're trying to get a rescue together. By driving around in a minibus? Sholto asked. Are you too busy? Gwen asked, ignoring the question. I'm watching Daisy, I said. Bring her. George said, you can leave her in Menai Bridge. She'll be safe. Come on. I, I, I began. People are in danger, Gwen said. They might already be dead. There's no time for equivocation. Get your daughter, get your weapons, and get in the van. We're the help that comes to others, George said. I met his gaze, saw the concern, and remembered the many times I'd hoped for a rescue that never came. I nodded. As Sholto ran to grab his rifle, I scrawled a quick note for Kim, grabbed Daisy, my weapons belt, and, after the briefest of hesitations, the fire axe I'd left in the umbrella stand, pausing only to note that Kim's rifle was gone, and assuming she'd taken it when she'd gone after Annette, I limped out to the minibus. I reached it just as Sholto appeared from around the side of the house, his rifle slung across his shoulder. 
How quickly things change, I murmured, or change back. I got into the bus. Hi, Bill, Shalto, Gwen said, adding more brightly, Hello, Daisy. There's no child seat, I'm afraid, so hold on to her. Shouldn't be a problem, it's not like there'll be any other traffic. So, uh, what's going on? Shalto asked, as Gwen reversed back onto the road. A group went across to the golf club at Carnarfon yesterday afternoon, George said. They were meant to find out if the electric golf carts were still there, who were recce of the town, and come back with this morning's tide. They radioed in to say they were surrounded. The signal was cut off halfway through. What can you expect? Gwen muttered. Those sets aren't fit to be called scrap. Most of the good radio gear was fried by the EMPs. A lot of the sets that were on the boats were dropped overboard when the rescue operation began, along with anything else that took up space that could be occupied by a person. Besides, the radios were useless. I mean, who were we going to call? Since then our biggest fear has been Quigley's sub, so we had to maintain radio silence. We lost most of the military gear a couple of months ago near Cambridge. That leaves us with a handful of sets that have a theoretical range of fifty miles. But even with the aerial, I'd say it's less than twenty. And it's line of sight. A message from Carnarfon has to be relayed to Menai Bridge and from there to Holyhead. And then out to anyone who's close enough to come to the rescue. Since everyone except us is using sail, that rescue will be too long in coming. Where's Carnarfon? Sholto asked. It's on the mainland at the southern end of the Menai Strait, George said. About nine miles south of Menai Bridge and Banga. It was famous for its castle, I said. The exterior was restored, but the interior wasn't. There's an airfield as well, isn't there? Not really, George said. A 747 crashed into it. There's a lot of metal and rubble and not much else. Carnarfon, though, is a reasonably large town. Heather Jones has visited there a few times. But we've done no systematic looting as of yet. It's the golf carts that'll be the real prize. There's a couple on angle, see? But we need more. Because we have the electricity to charge them, Gwen said. But not much petrol left. She glanced at the dashboard. Really not much at all. It wasn't even half an explanation. But I was happy to sit back and enjoy the unfamiliar familiarity of being a passenger in a motor vehicle. Shelter wasn't. Who's Heather Jones? And why are you driving around looking for Kim, rather than taking some of those French special forces on a rescue mission? He asked. Ah, it's all the same answer, George said. I was specifically looking for Kim because I wanted a sniper, and she comes with her own rifle. As to everything else, what about them? Gwen interrupted as we passed a field with five people hacking at the ground with pickaxes. You want to stop and ask them to come along? Is that Willow Farm? George asked. No, best not. They swore off violence, didn't they? There's no time to persuade them. What about the Parsons? Gwen asked. It's the next turning. George leaned forward. No, it's five miles to their farm. And then there's that dirt track. They'll be tending the fields, won't they? Call it another couple of hours for them to get their gear and get ready. No, it'll take too long. We've wasted too much time. Just get us to the boat. You said the people at Willow Farm swore off violence. What do you mean? I asked. It's a long story, George said, and not a pleasant one. And one that can wait, Shalto said. Why isn't the rescue being left to the special forces? In short, George said, because most of them aren't here, nor is anyone else. I'd usually rely on. Heather Jones works out of the town of Menai Bridge, at the northern edge of the strait. With the news of Quigley's death and his submarine's destruction, she took her boats out to survey the nearby coast. They won't be back until tomorrow, at the earliest. Leon and half his soldiers have gone with her, spread out on the various ships, along with a handful of other military personnel who'd usually be good at this sort of thing. Francois and the other half of the special forces are going to Svalbard with Miguel and his crew. 
Mr. Mills, Sophia Augusto, and their crews are somewhere in the South Atlantic. Chester and Bran are out on the mainland checking on the safe house, along with most of my railroad people. When you discount the doctors, the vets, the engineers, and all the others who can't be spared, there's not many left. I tried to recruit a few people from the boats in the port, but no one stepped forward. He gave a bitter laugh. Most dug back into their cabins, or simply didn't step out of them. I mulled over the implications of that as we passed the skeletal ruins of a wind turbine. What happened there? Sholto asked. Cluster bombs, George said. Don't know if they're aiming for the island, for the bridge, or trying to drop them in the sea. Hundreds of them fell. You must have seen the damage. They got the turbines, and it's a miracle they didn't hit the power plant. Got the bridge, too. As we drove across the island, I was less interested in the bomb damage than the empty farmland. I saw smoke from a chimney, what I was almost sure was a horse and rider, Otherwise Anglesey was empty of everything except birds, erupting from hedges and rooftops, lampposts and trees, abandoned cars, and a half-collapsed electricity pylon. Men I bridge coming up? Gwen said. I thought you said the bridge was destroyed, Sholto said. It's a town, I said. On the Anglesey side of the bridge that crosses the Menai Strait, had a population of around three thousand. The principal employer was the University of Bangor, which ran a campus on Anglesey. It was a battleground constituency during the last election, I added. My first impression was that the small town was somehow different from the area around Holyhead, though I couldn't immediately place why. Some of the broken windows had been boarded up, some front gardens dug over, but just as many had been left to weeds. Abandoned cars had been pushed onto pavements, Smoke drifted from a few chimneys, though most were still. As Gwen pulled the minibus to a halt at the edge of a car park just short of the quay, I realized what was different. It's clean, I said. What? George asked. Nothing. I hadn't realized how filthy Hollyhead had become until I had this town as a comparison. In fairness to the ferry port, it was in better condition than the ruined cities in the wasteland. But other than around the few businesses, the school and clinic, it was covered in rubbish. Dirt, wood, leaves, plastic and cardboard had been pushed aside or trampled underfoot. Even the harbour was filled with discarded clothing and other floating jetsam from the time before the electricity was restored. Menai Bridge was clean. The roads and pavements were covered in leaves, but they looked as if they had recently fallen. There was no paper, plastic or other rubbish mixed in with the leaf litter, and the gutters had been swept. Come on, that's our boat, George said, stiffly pushing himself out of the van. What about Daisy? I asked. The Duponts would look after her, George said. Who? Giselle and Pierre. George pointed across a car park, packed with office desks and classroom tables, and which were overflowing trays of leafy plants. Above each tray was the oddest assortment of pipes and hoses, held aloft by a ramshackle scaffolding of ladders and washing line. It was a crude, outdoor farm, yet a successful one, judging by the abundance of greenery. I wasn't sure what was being grown, but it was being tended by an elderly couple that made George seem youthful by comparison. Their balding heads were covered in a hat for him, a headscarf for her. Their hands were coated in soil, and their backs bent by age as much as by work, but their eyes lit up when they saw Daisy. "'Can you look after the baby?' George asked. Giselle Dupont replied with a staccato of rapid-fire French far beyond the vocabulary I'd learned in school and practiced on the occasional trip to Strasbourg. Oui, Pierre summarized. My reluctance to leave Daisy with two strangers must have been evident. You'll be fine, Bill, George said. Really? She will, Gwen said, but the others might not be if we don't get to them soon. So come with us, or stay here, but we have to go. This was hardly the first time we'd be parted. Daisy spent most days at the school, in the care of teachers, 
and under the observation of the psychologists. This felt different, but Gwen was right, and I'd already made up my mind when I got on the bus. There was nothing but kindness in the old couple's eyes, and it redoubled as I handed Daisy over to them. Be good, I said. Daisy squirmed, confusion flashing across her face. Pierre produced a napkin from his pocket. Unfolding it, he revealed a thin, freshly baked biscuit. Daisy's eyes lit up as she took it and began to eat. I'll be back soon, I said, and she completely ignored me. We're taking the launch, George said. I finally turned around and saw the remains of the ruined bridge. Was that done by the cluster bombs? I asked. Come on, no time to waste, George said, slapping a hand against the short-handled spear strapped to his belt like a sword. I'll give you a history lesson as we walk. The cluster bombs took out the Britannia Bridge, just a little way down the coast. Mr. Mills used a cruise missile to destroy the Menai Suspension Bridge. He gestured at the skeletal ruins jutting out of the fast-flowing water. That was in April, about a week after we got here, and an hour after we realized there was no way we could defend it. The zombies kept coming, Gwen said. So did the refugees. But we were burning through ammunition, and there just wasn't enough of it. I don't know how many we killed, George said. People, I mean. But that's what inspired us to go back out and find all the survivors we could. Turned out to be a scant few of them. But we tried. But now any trip to the mainland has to be by boat. And that adds an interminable delay. You took out everything you need. He was addressing the man and woman standing next to a battered police launch. The lettering near the stern was scorched and in Dutch. I assumed we were taking one of the more obviously seaworthy sailing craft. That's fast, the woman said, as if reading my thoughts. Is this it, George? This is it, George said, the only volunteers I could find. They want to swap your rifle, the woman said to Sholto. Ours have suppressors. We got plenty, more than plenty. You'll want one too. I couldn't hit the barn if I was standing inside it, I said. I'll stick with this axe. Seat yourself, she said, and turned back to George. Could you really get no one else? Get in, Gwen said. We did. The rope was cast off. Gwen took up position behind the controls and the boat set off. I had to grab hold of a strap to keep my balance. Introductions, then, George said, speaking loudly over the roar of the engine and the crash of the waves. This is Lorraine and Simon, and this is Bill and Thaddeus. I prefer Shalto, my brother said. Oh, well, we know who you are, Lorraine said. I have a steely resolve in my eyes, Simon said, grinning. It's undimmed by the horrors I've seen, yet softened by the hopes I have for the future. I'm sorry, I said. For when you describe me in your journal, he said. You've read it? I asked. Of course you have. His green eyes looked no different to anyone else's. He was about twenty, where she was a year or two older. Her accent was Scottish. His was home counties with a trace of the Midlands. Both wore the mismatched clothing that, like their shaven heads, was practical and common among the survivors. Me? Lorraine said, you could describe us having an exuberant cheerfulness that the nightmares surrounding us can't suppress. Focus, George said, this isn't an outing. We're going into danger. You can chat later, when we're all safe. Yeah, Shalto agreed, because I'd say it's time for a few more details. Who are we rescuing? Hopefully there's seven of them, George said. Oh, I'm hoping there's just two, Simon said. I looked between the two of them. George sighed. Lilith and Will work out of Menai Bridge. They sailed the boat over. Like I said, we're short of hands, so when it came to getting volunteers to go over to the mainland, we had to ask Marcus. He rounded up four people from his pub and decided to tag along himself. What pub? I asked. Oh, he calls it the Inn of Iniquity, Simon said. 
that tells you all you need to know. It's the one with a black facade in Hollyhead looking out across the bay. He's a thief. He's, um... George hesitated. Uh, I don't know how to describe him except that he's out for himself. I don't know that you could really call him a thief. But he took over the pub. He runs it as a trading post, though I'm not sure what he wants with all the bartered goods he takes in exchange for his homemade spirits and looted beer. Stolen beer? Simon said. He took it when he turned up on the island. If he doesn't come back with us, I won't complain. Don't speak like that, George said. Not about the living. The beer was in a delivery truck. No one had claimed it, so you can't call it theft. Can't this thing go any faster? Not unless you want to jump out and push, Gwen said. Huh, George growled. We've got a bit of diesel for the boats. And a little petrol, but not enough of either. It's meant to be a reserve. Something to use in the last extreme. And that's what this is. We can't afford to lose people. Not even people like Marcus. I was wondering about that, Shelter said. I've hardly seen anyone on the farms. We might have close to ten thousand able-bodied adults on Anglesey, Gwen said. Were they not... Exactly on the island. They're certainly not part of the wider community. I don't think you could say there is a wider community. Not yet. Everyone's spent too much time on their boats, stuck with the people with whom they survived the outbreak. It's survivor's guilt, Simon said, or post-traumatic stress. Post-apocalyptic stress would be closer, Lorraine said. Dr. Umbert says the outbreak destroyed everyone's personal model of how the universe worked. The people on the boats haven't been able to construct a new one, so they're hiding in what little familiarity they can find. Whatever you call it, George said, it leaves the terrified and traumatized on their boats. When it comes to a time like this, you wouldn't want them by your side, let alone watching your back. I thought electricity would change things. All it did was encourage people to row and sail their way around to the harbors, where they can sneak a power cable across from the island supply. But what about the people we saw on that farm? I asked. They're the exception, not the rule, George said. I'd say there are four hundred people willing to work. There's another hundred that are over-eager, and they found a home in Menai Bridge or out running the safe houses. But that doesn't mean we have four hundred to call on for a mission like this. Obviously, Shalto said. I guess you need them for running the power station. And the sewage plant, George said. The hospital, the animal breeding program, the bakery, the school, and for guarding the grain ships, of course. Their skills are too valuable to risk, and that goes double for those few working the farmland. You give them food and electricity, so why not say there's a charge for those? Shalto said. And risk a rebellion? George said. We can afford to have three guards on duty at the green ships and no more. Those three might deter an individual from taking what they want, but not a large group. To stop them, we'd kill so many this place would have to become a dictatorship. That's not a legacy I want. From winter... Their boats will be far less comfortable than a bed in a centrally heated house. And we've enough of those to spare. The question is whether we can wait until winter. We've enough spares to keep the power plant running for between five and ten years. But that figure came from an equation. If there's a storm or some serious damage, we might have to shut it down tomorrow. And a storm serious enough to damage the power plant will sink those grain ships, Simon said. We'll be out of power and food. I found my eyes tracking to the sky. It was cloudless and blue, promising another hot day. And don't forget the water, Lorraine added cheerfully. With no power, the water plant won't work. Though I can think of some people who'd be glad of an excuse not to wash. It's why we need the oil from Svalbard. George said, loud enough to carry over her voice as well as the waves, and why the moment we thought it safe, we sent everyone we could to the mainland and around the coast. We need to find other islands in case this one becomes irradiated. 
We need more livestock and seeds, machinery and tools, and, well, we need more of everything. Washing powder, Lorraine said. Right, George agreed. It's the little things that we didn't think about because we were too worried about Quigley and his submarine. Now we've got time. It's become clear how little we actually have. It's not just washing powder. But what about antibiotics? Coffee and tea are luxuries we can learn to live without. But what about shoelaces? We can probably make them. But is that a good use of our labor? We'll have to learn how to make light bulbs, and that's going to require a glass factory. Any idea how to set up one of those? What about toothpaste? Because we've only a couple of dentists, and all they can do is extract a rotten tooth. As yes, we can loot the old world stores, but they won't be there forever. Around the time they succumb to time and decay, the death rate will skyrocket, and we'll face a generational crisis. Everyone's received a massive dose of radiation, though there may be close to 10,000 adults on Anglesey. There are only 273 children. In 20 years, there'll be all that's left. There'll be some births, sure. But can civilization survive if there's only a few hundred people? You're a bit of a glass-half-empty kind of guy, aren't you? Shalto said. I'm an old man who knows he hasn't got long for this world, George said. My legacy is all I have left. I don't want our species' future to be a choice between a new dark age and extinction. If Anglesey fails, that's what'll happen. Yeah, Lorraine said, her ever-present grin growing wider. It's not so much glass half empty as glass smashed when it fell on the floor. Like he said, a few weeks ago we were worried that a nuclear submarine was going to destroy us. Now we've got electricity. At this rate, We'll have space flight by Christmas. The optimism of youth, George murmured. Canarfan, Gwen called. You can see the castle. Despite Lorraine's cheerful banter, George's words resonated. I'd worried about the kind of future Annette and Daisy would have, but only in the abstract. Out in the wasteland, I'd had a mental image of a remote house and a few acres, of a cow, some chickens, and wind-blown crops of back-breaking farm work, but always with the result that the larder was full. I'd been so grateful that we'd found somewhere safe from the undead that I'd not thought much on what it would really be like in twenty years. I'd not given much thought to what it would be like in twenty days. But this wasn't the time to think about it further. Gwen cut the engine. Do you see the yacht? she asked. Since it was the only craft by the shore, it was impossible to miss. That's the golf club? Sholto asked, as the boat drifted with the current. Here. Yeah. George passed me a pair of binoculars. My eyes aren't what they were. I braced my feet, trying to adjust to the motion of the waves. The yacht's moored in a small, sheltered dock that's been dug out of the shore, I said. To the south is a coastal road, to the north, no— the road's obscured by a growing mass of wispy vegetation. Inland, behind the road and south of the dock, there's a swathe of overgrown grass, a richer shade of green than in the abandoned paddocks to the north. I'd say that's the golf course. Fifty metres inland are a cluster of rooftops partially hidden by the towering trees. I'm guessing the low-roof building is the clubhouse, while the buildings a little to the south look like houses. That's a great impersonation of an estate agent, Lorraine said. But what about the zombies? Two figures by the dock, three more by the road. I think, yes, they're undead, I'm certain. What about inland? Simon asked. Too many trees, too much vegetation. Any smoke? Gwen asked. No, I said. Five zombies, George said. There's probably going to be more. All right, we've done this before. Thaddy, uh, sorry. Charlotte, I want you to take out the two zombies by the dock. Then you, Gwen, Lorraine, and Simon are to go inland to the clubhouse. Bill and I will secure the boat and follow. 
If there are too many, we fall back to the boat and regroup. This is a rescue mission. We are the help that comes to others, which is a nice way of saying if we get into difficulty, we're on our own. So don't get into difficulty. Everyone ready? Gwen turned the engine back on and sped the boat towards the dock. With both hands on the guardrail and the boat bouncing across the waves, I couldn't see much. There was a jolt as Gwen threw the boat into reverse. As it banged into the dock, Sholto threw himself up onto the seawall. On his knees, he raised his rifle and fired off a shot. The suppressed retort wasn't nearly as loud as the sound of the zombie falling. Another shot, and the second zombie flew backwards. Impressive, Simon said. No, it wasn't, Sholto said, Stanny. I hit its shoulder. The zombie pushed itself to its feet. Sholto took his time, letting the creature take a step. Its head bobbed up. Its mouth opened, exposing a row of broken teeth. Its arm reached up, grasping towards us. Sholto fired. The creatures had exploded in a spray of black-brown pus and off-white bone. With a sight came a flood of memories of the undead that I'd killed. My mood, already somber, turned dark. Up, out! Gwen barked. Tie her off, Bill, George said. Simon, Gwen, and Lorraine clambered out of the boat. I awkwardly followed, and rolled more than climbed onto the concrete jetty. Yeah, catch, George said, throwing a rope. Behind me, I heard thick boots running along concrete, and a few warning commands from Gwen. I tied the rope, though not expertly. The boat was secure, but if we were forced to make a quick retreat, we'd have to hack through it. Pass me my axe. I said. George held it up, and then his rifle. Give me a hand, he said. I helped him out of the boat. Good thing, those suppressors, he said. Not quite perfect yet, though. My brother and the others were now out of sight, and though I wasn't sure I could hear the sound of the shots, I could hear the occasional thump of a body hitting the ground. I hoped that was the undead. I feel useless. I said, Know your limitations, George said. That's a lesson I learned early, but most people never grasp. We can't excel at everything, and when we try here and now, it'll only get others into trouble. I know, it's just... I guess it's not being able to see what's going on. People scream when they're hurt, George said, which was no comfort. I resolved to put in some hours on the firing range when we got back to the island. You say they came over to get electric golf carts, I said, trying to distract myself from the unseen danger that the others were in. That sailing boat can't be large enough to transport them back. The boat in the artificial dock was a single-sail yacht, sleek and expensive, with room for perhaps ten people with their bags, but not much more. Certainly not a four-wheel buggy about the size of a small car. We'll use the rafts for that, George said. This was just a scouting expedition. We wanted to see what damage the zombies had done. That would tell us whether it was worth expending the effort to send a larger group here to empty the golf course and town, or whether we should just secure the golf carts and get them at a later stage. Like I said... It's a question of people and resources. We don't have the time to let things wait, but equally don't have the people to do everything we want all at once. There. I told you they'd be okay. Simon had appeared around the scrubby bushes and was waving us forward. Twenty-four of them, he said when we drew level. The clubhouse is clear. It was over so quickly. I can't say why, but that didn't fill me with relief. Watch the boat, Simon, George said. Go on, Bill. Chapter 2 Carnarvon 1130, the 15th of August, Day 156 When planning the clubhouse, the builders had taken one look at the stunning vista of the Irish Sea, and then, no doubt, a second and third, and decided not to compete with it. 
The building had a simple, unpretentious style suggesting this was a course where people came to play the game without needing some marble and glass edifice that would only have marred the view. My brother was walking between the corpses in the car park, checking each one was truly dead. Lorraine was by the door to the clubhouse, her pensive expression matched by the fingers drumming against her rifle stock. Gwen had already gone inside. George and I followed. Tables and chairs lay strewn about the floor, suggesting they had until very recently been forming a barricade. From the dead zombie I had to step over, it hadn't held. At the rear of the entrance lobby, an upturned desk blocked a doorway. In a room to the left, Gwen knelt by a man whose shirt was covered in blood. Hovering close by was a woman with short-cropped, green-dyed hair and anxiety written across her face. What happened, Lilith? George asked. We'll got bit, Lilith said simply. The radio stopped working. I got some of them, but I couldn't get a clear line of fire on the door. I was going to risk it, I was. I was going to try to shoot our way out, then you came. Where's everyone else? George asked. They went to Carnarvon Castle and never came back, she said. I could see there were a dozen questions George wanted to ask, and I could think of just as many myself, but he left them unsaid and went over to the injured man. Will, can you hear me, Will? he asked. He can't, Gwen said. He's unconscious. He is immune, Lilith said. I know he is. Then we've only got blood loss and infection to worry about, George said. Gwen, Lilith, can you carry him back to the launch? We'll go back to Anglesey. Bill, I'm going to leave Simon to watch the dock. Take Lorraine and your brother. Go as far as the castle. See if the others are there. You've got the yacht if you need to escape. If they're trapped, don't do anything heroic. Just get back to the yacht and wait offshore for us to return. If Miguel's not left... Maybe I can get him to delay his departure. Or we'll come back with Kim, if no one else. Check the castle, don't do anything stupid, I echoed. Stupid I don't mind, George said. Just don't get yourself surrounded. We've not got the people to launch a second rescue. After they'd gone, I stood in the car park looking at the trees. It was better than looking at the bodies of the undead. Their clothes were rags, their skin taut, withered and covered in dirt and worse. But the gunshots that destroyed their faces did little to mask the lack of humanity in their twisted frames. We're going to the castle? Sholto confirmed. Which way? I gestured north. It's about a kilometre on the other side of a river. How much of that journal was true? Lorraine asked. All of it, I said though it wasn't necessarily the complete truth. I meant, how much of that stuff about fighting the zombies was exaggerated? How good are you? Good enough, I said, slinging the axe over my shoulder. I limped towards the road. What about you? What's your story? If I tell you, will it go in the journal? She asked. Sure, then I'll keep it to myself, she said. Marcus and his luck were the muscle on this trip? Sholto asked. You don't need many muscles to pull a trigger, she said. They were meant to help with fetching and carrying. Lilith's a fighter. I've never seen her so discomposed. It's what happened to Will, of course. They survived the outbreak together, I asked. And a lot more, she said. But if you want to know, you'll have to ask her. I was starting to see the drawback in being known as the island's chronicler. Marcus, Sholto prompted, what can you tell us about him? Well, the wheel George summarized the survivors doesn't give the full picture, she said. He's got this top-down approach, a way of looking back on the present from some distant future when he'll be long dead. That's useful, and maybe it's because of his age. But it misses out a key demographic, the people who actually want to go into the wasteland. Like the people setting up the safe houses, you mean, Shelter said. Oh, no, Lorraine said. Those people are damaged. I mean, she added hurriedly, the outbreak changed them. It changed us all, didn't it? But they had to examine their own souls and found themselves wanting. They're on a private mission of forgiveness. 
even though they know they'll never find it. Marcus is different. How? I asked. He runs this pub, Lorraine said, except he doesn't do any of the work. You cannot really say he owns it, not legally, except by possession. He ransacked Anglesey, stockpiling the booze. I guess he's running out. And I think the only reason he wanted to come over here was to restock. There's a baker down by the waterfront that's trading bread for batteries, tea, coffee and a whole list of sundries, I said. Scott Higson! Aye, that's one of the government stores, Lorraine said. It'd have to be, wouldn't it? You know, because the grain is still stored on the ships. It's the same with the laundrette and the music shop. That's all Mrs. O'Leary's doing. Partly it's to make sure people get a balanced diet. You cannot force people to eat vitamin tablets, but you can fortify the bread. They also stop Marcus from setting the prices, while allowing us to build up a national surplus from the things looted when they raided the empty homes. Marcus is just out for profit. His big mistake was selling the booze before he realised how much it was worth. I mean, OK, do you know the first thing he did when the electricity was restored? He put on a film night. He found the biggest TV he could, rigged up a load of speakers, and set it up in the back room of the pub. A cold beer and a movie, Shalto said. That sounds pleasant. There were zombie films, Lorraine said, and after each of them he ran a Q&A session about what the characters did wrong. That's the kind of guy he is. Ah, uh, and this is tolerated, I said. Mrs. O'Leary says it has to be. It's a democracy, isn't it? That's the thing about survivors. In the depths of danger you think everyone's like yourself. It's only when things settle down you realise that not all survivors are selfless or good or even nice. I mean, OK, he's not evil, she added. Not like, bah, what was the name of those people who kidnapped your kids? Barrett and Stewart. You really did read the journal, I said. There's not much else to read, she said. Crime fiction, anything contemporary come to that, it's all out of date. Horror doesn't scare, not any more. Science fiction stories about space exploration and aliens seem like they're taunting us with a future we'll never have. Anyway, yeah, that's Marcus. He's the very definition of self-centred. I think he still believes the universe revolves around him. Not evil, just not the kind of guy you want to be around. The words hung in the air, but there was no mood for them to spoil. The road leading to Carnarvon hugged the coast and so Anglesey was visible to us across the Menai Strait. It looked lush, but the paddocks immediately to our left gave the lie to that. They were overgrown with seeding grasses and flowering weeds. Like those on Anglesey, they'd be good for grazing, but we had very little livestock. I suppose there's not much chance of taking a boat to Kent, I said. What for? Shalto asked. The fruit in the trees, I said. The apples will be ripe soon. Even if this field was full of ripening wheat, I doubt we'd be able to harvest it. But we could pick apples. That'd be nice, Lorraine said. I miss apples and peaches. Oh, and remember bananas. I miss ribs, Shalto said. A big plate of them on Monday night with a game playing in the background. Each of us was lost in our own private fantasy until a quartet of seagulls erupted from the roof of a shed in the next field along. Carnarfon Castle, I said, pointing. It was partially obscured by trees, but there was no mistaking the crenellated walls. Feet, Shalto said. Do you hear them? He raised the rifle. Running feet, Lorraine said, half raising her own. It must be Marcus, it must be. My heart beat faster. It's half a year since the outbreak. Everything I'd seen told me that zombies barely had the coordination to walk, let alone run. Certainly I'd seen none move faster than a lurching stagger, but running zombies were near the top of my list of private dreads. The sound of running feet drew nearer. Two figures jogged into sight around a thicket of alder. Both were male. One was about six foot two with dangerously long, dirty blonde hair. A recent scar, running from nose to lip, was only partially covered by deliberately trimmed stubble. Sunglasses covered his eyes, 
a bandana his neck, and a T-shirt a size too small, barely covered muscles that, quite frankly, weren't any more impressive than anyone else's on the island. It was as if he found a style that suited him in his early twenties, and now, well over a decade later, he'd stuck with it, despite the fact it only highlighted his age. The other man was far younger, probably out of his teens, but only just. His head was shaved in a style that was common in a world where soup was rare, and long hair could be grabbed by the undead. The thick bobber boots were completely impractical, as was the short sword in his hands. It looked like a Roman gladius. The tall guy's Paul, Lorraine said. He's been with Marcus since the beginning. The younger one is Bob, or, or Rob, or something. Hasn't been here long. He came from somewhere in northern England, the Lake District, I think. The two men slowed to a walk. What happened? Lorraine called. My castle's no good, Paul said, giving her a sardonic smile. Too many zombies. Got thirty of them, though, didn't we, Rob? Thirty? Yeah, I guess, Rob mumbled. He looked hot, exhausted, close to terrified. Where are Marcus and the others? Lorraine asked. Gone shopping, Paul said. There's a trailer park over there. He waved a hand vaguely behind him. I'm out of ammo. Rob lost his gun. We were going to get more from the supplies at the golf club. Well was Ben, Lorraine said. He and Lilith were surrounded. We had to come over to rescue them. Will's still alive? Rob asked. Aye, Lorraine said. Well, then it's all worked out, Paul said. That's not the point, Lorraine said. You shouldn't have left them. When did you arrive? Paul asked. About half an hour ago, Lorraine said. And Will's still alive. If you hadn't come, we'd have rescued them. Paul gave another grin, showing a set of perfect teeth. And what was it that our illustrious mayor said? But there aren't enough people for any of us to waste a breath. Seems like we did the right thing. He began walking again. The castle's no good. It'll take an army to clear Canarfin. And now we know. So, you guys coming or what? The rest of you. Marcus and the others. When did you last see them? Sholto asked. When was it, Rob? Paul asked, turning to the younger man. About eight o'clock last night? I guess, Rob muttered. Ah, then they're probably dead, Paul said. Give us five minutes to dump our bags and get some more ammo, and we'll help you look for them. Lorraine opened her mouth, but then bit back the reply. Go back to the boat and wait there, she said through gritted teeth. Suit yourself, Paul said. He walked away. Lorraine did the same, continuing down the road. Sholto and I shared a look, took a glance back at the two men now sauntering along the road, and followed her. You okay going after these other three? Lorraine asked after twenty yards. It won't take long, I said. If they disappeared last night, either they're dead, gone, or dead drunk in some caravan. One hour, Sholto said, checking his watch. Then we go back. Is it safe to leave them with the boat? Simon's there, Lorraine said. He'll shoot them, rather than leave without us. Maybe that would be for the best, Sholto said. I glanced at my brother. He had a thoughtful expression. Penny for them? I said. What? Your thoughts, I said. If they spent the night at a ruined castle and then ran out of ammo, why are their bags so full? He said. Because Paul was lying, Lorraine said. He's probably loaded up on spirits from some abandoned pub. They were running pretty fast to be loaded down with anything heavy, Sholto said. Then it's something else, Lorraine said. And if you want to know what, go to the pub tonight and see what they're selling. I bet he's hoping Marcus is dead, so he can take over the inn for himself. Where's this trailer park? Sholto asked. There's a caravan site a few hundred metres that way, Lorraine said, gesturing inland. We came over in the spring. Heather Jones saw some smoke when she was fishing. It was just a house fire. But that got her thinking. We should grab everything we could while we could. There were too many zombies in Carnarvon, 
So he stripped the houses this side of the river, see, yont. There aren't many, and it wasn't long before we ended up at the caravan park. It's a holiday place, and it was mostly empty and shuttered. There were a few odds and ends, but anything valuable enough to be stolen had been removed at the end of the summer season. There was a restaurant, and a path that leads to the site through the fields somewhere. There, I think. Ivy coiled around a battered signpost, and over a broken stile that marked a footpath's beginning. After months of unchecked growth, the blackthorn and bramble hedge constricted the path to a narrow two feet. You see it? Shalto asked, raising his rifle. I do. It's mine, I said, lowering my voice. Those rifles are quiet, but not silent. Nor were we. Perhaps it was the weeks of safety, or the relative ease with which the zombies around the clubhouse had been dispatched, or the sight of the island just a churning stretch of water away. But months of experience had been forgotten. The zombie had heard us approach, was beginning to stand. It hadn't been on the path long enough for the undergrowth to ensnare it, nor had it been undead for much longer. Its red jeans, blue shirt and thick cracked leather boots were free of the mud that coated those who'd been infected before the stormy spring settled into this stifling summer. I hauled myself over the stile and raised the fire axe over my head. There wasn't room to swing it any direction but straight down. Bravado had made me volunteer, and as I pushed my way through the thicket of thorny spikes, I knew that was a foolish motivation. I had nothing to prove, not even to myself, not any more, and I vowed to never be driven by such cavalier recklessness again. It was a vow that didn't last long. I focused my attention on the creature's lumbering gait, watched its arms catch in the vines and branches, listened to the sound of cloth ripping on a blackthorn's inch-long barbs, saw its mouth gape open, and I brought the axe down, splitting its skull. It fell into the hedge, stripping leaves from breaking branches. I'd say that was as loud as a gunshot, Sholto said. Loud enough to wake the undead, the rain muttered, climbing over the stile. After another hundred meters, the path ended in a thicket of blackberries that almost completely concealed a varnished gate. Two downward strokes of the axe, and we had a route through, and a clear view of the caravan site. It was a mixture of once white static caravans and pine-clad chalets, separated by weather-cracked picket fences and ragged ornamental hedges. Each was surrounded by a patch of withered grass covered in wind-blown debris. Ten yards in front of us, was a curving asphalt road partially covered in a fine dust of sun-dried leaves. I saw what Lorraine had meant about there not being much here to salvage. It was a place for the summer that could be tolerated in the autumn, but which would have been empty during the winter when the undead rose. Since leaves didn't trample themselves into dust, it was clear that zombies had had free reign of the site for the last few months. It was also evident that survivors had steered clear of it. There were no barricades, and little sign of struggle beyond a pair of broken windows either side of a faded, bloody palm print. That made sense. Anyone who reached this far, even if they hadn't known there was a refuge on Anglesey, would have made for the island. That begged the question of why Marcus had come here. It was clear where we'd find the answer. There was no one in sight, but the sound was unmistakable. From the way they raised their weapons, Sholto and Lorraine had heard the noise, too. That way, she whispered, gesturing with her rifle barrel towards a gap between two chalets. Avoiding the drifts of crackling leaves and the narrow constraints of the artificial alleyways between the caravans, I took the lead. I had my head cocked, listening to the sound of flesh beating against metal and wood, trying to confirm it all came from the same direction. The noise grew as the road curved inland. I raised a warning hand, slowed, stopped, inched forward to confirm there weren't any creatures lurking behind a low brick wall to my left. Head extended, but axe raised, I eased forward until I could see around the edge of the caravan. I saw them, 
at least twenty zombies were gathered around a wooden chalet sixty yards down the road. Splinters flew as they kicked and beat against the thin boards. It was a miracle those walls had stood for so long, but they wouldn't stand for much longer. I backed away, and Lorraine and Sholto did the same. At least twenty in sight, I whispered, so probably thirty, all told. This is not what I planned for my summer, Lorraine said, her hand dropping to the spare magazines in her webbing. We've a problem, Sholto whispered. A 5.56 millimeter round will go straight through the chalet's thin walls. We can't shoot them? Then we need to get them to move. I'll be the bait, I said. I'll lure the zombies away from the chalet and onto the road. Well, then we'll be as likely to hit you, he said. So aim carefully, I said, and didn't wait for him to argue. I limped off, skirting a route between the huts and holiday homes, until I was forty meters inland of the encircled chalet. The curving road once again hid the zombies from view, while I heard the creatures beat in a rhythmic storm against the wooden cladding. I took a look around, but the sound was loud enough to carry for a quarter mile. All the zombies on the site had to be gathered by that chalet, probably. Instinct made me take a second look over my shoulder, and as I did, I could feel fear beginning to rise. Before it had time to become an excuse for inaction, I stepped over a fallen signpost for the Holiday Park's restaurant and out into the middle of the road. If Marcus was after beer and spirits, wouldn't that be the more logical place to loot? In fact, wouldn't anywhere be a more logical place than a caravan site that would have been emptied of anything valuable before it was shut for the winter? I took another few cautious steps puzzling over what they might have found in these paint-faded temporary homes as an alternative to thinking about the undead, until the chalet and the zombies came into view. Hey! Hey, you! You alive in there? I yelled. The snapping, banging cacophony drowned out any reply, and it almost drowned out my words, but there was a leathery whisper as the two closest creatures swiveled their heads. Over here! I yelled, Turn around, I'm here! The two zombies pivoted as one. Their heads bucked, and their mouths snapped as they lurched an uneven step towards me. I took an involuntary step back. Come on! I said. And now I was talking to myself. I forced myself forward, shifting my grip on the axe. It wasn't a great weapon for this not with a lack of balance that came from a hand missing two fingers. Come on! I yelled again, and another two turned. I'm here! The zombie next to the chalet's door twisted to its left, and its arms knocked into the creature beside it. That zombie slipped sideways, and into a third. Turn around! I yelled, my eyes alternating between the chalet and the creatures getting nearer with each shuffling step. With three fewer zombies slamming against the thin wood, my voice was finally heard. As one, the pack shifted, pivoting around. The two zombies nearest me were less than twenty meters away. Why haven't you fired? I muttered. Fire! I yelled. And then I realized. I was in the middle of the road, right in the path of any bullet. So I skipped, three steps to the left. Fire! I yelled again. I said! I didn't hear the shot, but I saw the zombie collapse. It was near the back of the pack. Of course it was. I finally saw the obvious flaw in our plan. The roads weren't straight, and the rifles were silenced. The zombies didn't know the shooters were behind them, but they knew I was in front, now less than ten meters from the nearest grasping hands. I started walking backwards, keeping to the verge, and out of direct line of sight of Lorraine and Sholto. I saw another zombie fall, and then turned my complete attention to the nearest of the undead. I gauged the distance at eight meters and closing. Walking backwards, I couldn't limp faster than they could stagger, and so I'd retreated as far as I could. Shifting my weight to my good leg, I skipped forward and swung the axe, bending with a blow. The blade 
bit into the knee of the nearest creature. The axe slid through rotten cloth and necrotic flesh. Bone shattered. I darted backwards as the zombie collapsed, thrashing its arms on the asphalt road. Ignoring it, I back-swung the axe. The shaft twisted in my now sweat-slick grip, and the head hit the second zombie in the side. It staggered a pace and doubled over. I raised the axe up and hacked down on its head. It fell, for my mistimed blow had wasted a valuable second. The rest of the pack got nearer. I couldn't tell how many there were. It was just a sea of open mouths and snarling faces. I limped back, told myself to stay calm, and that I'd been in far worse situations, but somehow this felt different. There were three zombies walking abreast, with at least two bobbing, lurching heads less than five feet behind. I ignored everything else, stepped to the left and skipped forward, swinging the axe at head height. The blade sliced through its cheek, spraying teeth and skin and rotten muscle. The zombie staggered as I punched the axe into its ruined face. The creature fell, and I let the axe fall, swinging it back like a pendulum, twisting my grip and bringing it up and over my head and down onto the skull of the second creature. The scalp split, bone broke, and its brain exploded as its head was cleaved in two. I dragged the axe free, skipped back as the third zombie lurched forward, arms outstretched. I swung at its legs and overshot. The shaft hit its shin. Remembering that old trick with the pike, I yanked the axe towards me. The blade hooked under its leg and pulled the creature from its feet. I changed my stance and brought the axe down on its head just as it landed on the asphalt. Three down, I murmured, skipping back a pace, looking for the next threat. There were two of them, and that was all. There wasn't time to wonder what had happened to the others. I assumed they'd been shot, and there wasn't time to think any more. A snarling monster in a torn tweed jacket was limping closer. Only one arm was outstretched. The other hung uselessly by its side. The coat was missing its sleeve, the arm missing its hand. I slammed the axe into its knee. I heard a pop and the creature collapsed. The axe shaft was slick with sweat, gore and blood. I raised it up over my head and then down in a great scything blow that connected with the second zombie's skull. The axe bit into bone, but I lost my grip and the weapon pinwheeled sideways. I didn't look to see where it landed, but grabbed the hatchet from my belt. I walked over to the tweed-jacketed zombie and slammed the hand axe into its brain. I stalked back up the road, slashing the hatchet left and right, finishing off those twitching, writhing creatures. But then, almost abruptly and sooner than I expected, I realized they were dead. I was alone. The road was empty, and the chalet was out of sight. There were seven bodies around me, and an eighth just a little way ahead. I was reasonably certain I hadn't killed that one. I was right. The eighth zombie had been shot. I found four more zombies that had been shot before I reached the chalet. The rest of the small pack were banging on the doors and walls once more. My heart was pounding in my ears, and only as it slowed did I hear the indistinct yells for help coming from inside. Shut up! I barked. You're making this harder! A zombie turned. I took a step towards it, and it took a step towards me. Come on, then. Over here! Someone inside shouted a reply I couldn't make out. Shut up! I yelled. I don't know if the chalet's occupants heard me, but the zombies did. Two more turned around. The lead creature sauntered towards me. It was another recent addition to the undead. The blows on the laces of its shoes were still tight. I said! The zombie collapsed. I glanced up and to my left and saw Lorraine kneeling on the roof of a caravan. I said! I yelled even louder. Shut up! We're here to rescue you! Oh, I don't know why. You're making this a whole lot... As its foot touched the asphalt... A zombie in a blue anorak collapsed, its coat billowing out behind it as it thumped to the ground. 
All bar one of the remaining zombies turned towards the sound of the falling body. They saw me, the obvious prey. I stood, silent, hatchet in hand as they lurched towards me. One after another as they moved away from the thin-walled wooden hut, Sholto and Lorraine shot them. In less than two minutes, only one zombie remained, languidly beating against the door to the chalet. There was no force to its blows. It was more like it was running its palm down the wood. It didn't notice me until I was right behind it. Just as it began to turn its head, I swung the hand axe down. Dragging the blade free, I walked away from the chalet. Sholto, loading a fresh magazine, was heading towards me. I thought you'd use that to draw him towards you, he said, pointing at my belt. I looked down and saw the pistol still holstered at my side. I... I forgot I had it, I said. He laughed, and I joined in, sharing the relief at a hard job that I'd made harder, but which was now done. You alive in there? Sholto yelled at the chalet. There was a moment of silence when the only sound was the settling of the twice-dead corpses. Then came a reply. Who are you? It was an English voice, gruff, male, with tones from the north. You alive? Unhurt? I replied. Who's asking? Open the door, Marcus, Lorraine yelled. The door opened. A man appeared. I guess I was expecting another Hollywood reject like Paul, but this man was perhaps five-seven, shaven-headed, wiry with a gymnast's frame, and seemed too slight for such a deep voice. Thank you he said. Eyes narrowed, as if he wasn't sure if he meant it. But who are you? The rescue party, Sholto said. What happened? He looked at Sholto, then at me, then turned around and addressed whoever was inside. Let's go. He grabbed a bag from by the door and came out into the sunlight. A man and a woman followed. You're unarmed, Sholto said. Marcus turned around. Your rifles, he snapped. The other two darted back inside, banging into one another in the narrow doorway. You can't get the help, Marcus said. I didn't give him the satisfaction of agreement. There was something contagious about Lorraine's distrust of the man. She climbed down from the chalet's roof and came over to join us. What happened, Marcus? Why did you leave Will and Lilith alone? she asked. The job was to survey the golf club in nearby town, he said. It took ten minutes to confirm the golf carts were there. That left the town. But you ended up here, she said. There were too many zombies in the town, he said. Too many for us, at least. Well, and Lilith were surrounded, she said. They had to barricade themselves in there. Will was injured. He might have died. They had the radio, didn't they? Marcus asked. Yes, but it's broke. I'm not surprised, Marcus said. It's a piece of junk. That's the problem. You're playing at soldiers with broken toys, but this isn't a game. He gave me another look, and then turned his attention to Sholto. My brother met his gaze and returned it with interest. The yacht's that way, Sholto said. We're leaving as soon as we get back, unless you want to swim, get moving. We're out of ammo, Marcus said. What we didn't use getting into Carnarvon, we've earned up trying to get out. I've even lost my bayonet. He tapped the empty sheath at his belt. Otherwise we wouldn't have been trapped. Then you'd better stay close, Lorraine said, walking away down the road. What about you, Mr. American? Marcus asked. Won't you spare a guy around? I started to understand Lorraine's dislike of this man. There was something undefinably unpleasant about him. Sholto weighed him up before passing him a magazine. There's ten rounds left, he said. Thank you kindly, Marcus said, in an almost passable Georgian accent, and headed off after Lorraine. I let the other two follow him before I fell into step with my brother at the rear. We shared a look that we both understood. We'd received half a story, 
and it had the feeling of being just that, a story, not the truth. The full packs on the backs of his two followers, and on Paul and that kid Rob, didn't seem to be heavy, but they were full. I ran through the various possibilities and found none of them appealing. What's in the bags? I called out as we reached the coastal road. Marcus stopped, walked back to the woman, opened her pack, and took out a small cardboard box. For your troubles, he said, throwing it to me. It's tea, I said, awkwardly catching the box. We got coffee if our transatlantic friend would prefer. He took out another small packet. Individual sachets don't spoil, you see. That's why you wanted to come here, Lorraine asked, walking back to join us. No, Marcus said, but I'll settle for it as a consolation prize. There was a lot more to the story, but it was equally clear he wasn't going to share it. I decided I didn't care. All I wanted to do was get back, have a shower, get Daisy, and get home to Kim. The tide was in our favour, but the wind wasn't. It took nearly an hour to sail the nine miles back to Menai Bridge. Gwen was alone on the police launch and looked ready to depart. George and Lilith had driven Will back to the clinic in Hollyhead that served as our under-equipped hospital. The hierarchy on Anglesey was vague beyond that George and Mary were at the top, propped up by Mr. Mills, Leon, and their sailors and soldiers. Where Gwen ranked wasn't clear, but when she told Marcus to clear off, he didn't argue. He started walking the twenty miles back to Hollyhead. Rob looked sullen, and Paul looked reluctant, until Marcus barked at them to follow. During the almost silent boat ride back, I got the impression that those two had disappeared without permission, and that Marcus held them responsible for his being trapped in that chalet. Again, I didn't care. I went to find Daisy. She was happily stamping her paint-covered hand onto flower pots, which Pierre was filling with soil, and into which Giselle was planting seeds. Daisy looked up, saw me, and grinned. There was enough paint around her mouth and crumbs in her borrowed smock to tell me she'd taken frequent biscuit breaks. Adj, she mumbled. Adi, Giselle corrected her. Putting the two together, I worked out what they were planting. How long do radishes take to grow? I asked, and got a burst of French in return that I didn't begin to understand. No, Pierre said, as I stepped closer to Daisy. Bath, wash. I looked down. My clothes were covered in gore. A hot shower and a set of borrowed clothes later, I felt a new man. Daisy's been fed. And dinner for us is on its way, Lorraine said. You guys gonna stay for it? Giselle's cooking and her cooking's good. We have to get back, I said. Annette and Kim will be waiting. I hope George had explained what my note hadn't. The events of the morning seemed an age away, but if I was going to play the apologetic supplicant, admitting that I'd stopped for a hot meal wouldn't count in my favour. Pierre and Giselle like Daisy, Lorraine said. I'd noticed. They had a granddaughter, you see, she said. Their daughter and son-in-law died years ago. It was a car crash. They sent the granddaughter to a boarding school. It's their biggest regret. The school was in England. Ah, their granddaughter was there during the outbreak, I asked. Yes. They tried to cross the channel in a fishing boat, Lorraine said. They would have drowned but the vehement was passing that way. What about their granddaughter? I asked. Leon went to Luke. He grew up in a town ten miles to the north of Pierre and Giselle. He sort of vaguely remembered them from when he was growing up, which these days makes them family. The granddaughter was dead. The school was empty, she said, evacuated. In some ways that's worse, you know, the not knowing. It was clear she was talking about herself, but I didn't want to press. We'll come back, I said, and I'll bring Annette and Kim, but we should get home before dark. We borrowed a pair of bicycles, one of which had a child seat and set off. 
Daisy was reluctant to leave until Pierre produced, as if by magic, another biscuit for the road. It was a nice evening, and the peaceful exercise helped me put the day's events into perspective. We all needed a lot of training, that was clear, as was that we had to have a more professional approach to what we were doing. For that matter, we needed to have a clear and shared idea of what we were doing. That, I thought, might have been what George was getting at during his lecture as we'd sailed over to Carnarfon. As to what that idea was, and how we put it into place, I decided it was something best discussed with Kim. Where I always search for the path around obstacles, she has a way of seeing a route straight through them. By the time we got back to the cottage, dusk had settled, and night was setting in. Daisy was asleep, half a biscuit clutched in an iron grip. I was exhausted, and Sholto didn't look much better. The house was dark. The note I'd scrawled was still on the kitchen table, where I'd left it that morning. Leaving Sholto to put Daisy to bed, I went down to the school that's become the administrative hub for our nascent community. I found George with Mary O'Leary, sorting through newly acquired books in the school library. I was looking for Kim, I said. She never came home. I'm sorry, Bill, George said. They've gone to Svalbard. What? When Annette stormed from your house this morning, she went to the harbour, Mary said. There was only one boat leaving, and she stowed away. Not very well, and she was found before they cast off. So? I asked, unable to think of a more expressive question with which to frame my confusion. It was a smokeless salvation, Mary said. Miguel's boat. The one with the solar panels and the electric motor, and I know the boat. I said, why have Annette and Kim gone to the Arctic? Didn't you notice that Annette took Kim's rifle? George asked. When she was found, she pointed the gun at the electric battery and threatened to shoot it, unless she was taken away from the island. You can't mean that you actually gave in to her, I said aghast. No, Kim did, Mary said. She was there. Annette said she'd leave if you apologized. You couldn't be found. I was in Carnarfon. I said, with you. I'm sorry, George said. No one knew. And with us all on the boat, there was no one in Menai Bridge to radio that pack. It wasn't until I got to the hospital with Will that I was able to tell Mary, and by then it was too late. They'd already left. But I don't understand. Why didn't Kim just take her off the ship, or why didn't it just wait? We need the oil from Svalbard. Mary said. We really do. That ship's going because it has the solar panels and an electric motor. That's how scarce fuel is. Taking that police launch across the Menai Strait used up most of our reserves. I don't care, I said. Why did they leave? A tide in the daylight, George said. Each day there's four minutes less light for the panels. And of course, they're heading north. So that makes it worse. If they'd waited, they'd have lost the tide, and that'd mean losing half a day. That still doesn't explain it, I said. It was Kem's decision that the boat should leave, Mary said. That's what it comes down to. The boat's got a dozen French soldiers on board, and about as seasoned a crew as exists. They're as safe on the boat as they would be here. If Svalbard is overrun by the undead, they won't go ashore. But either way, they'll be back in a couple of weeks. As to why Kim didn't persuade Annette to return ashore, you'd have to ask her yourself. The ship's still within radio range, though it won't be by tomorrow morning. Speak to her yourself. I'd, um, George began, if I was you, I'd remember that it's going to be a couple of weeks before you see them again, he said. When you speak to them, I mean. Completely at a loss as to what I should say. I followed George to the radio room. We'd struggled so hard, so long to find a safe refuge. And our little family had been broken up again.
Chapter 3 Anglesey, the 18th of August, day 159 And which is a circle? Dr. Umbert asked. No, Daisy, that's a square. Which is a circle? I failed to suppress a grin. Daisy noticed, smiled back, and picked up the square again. There aren't many games you can play out in the wasteland, and toys were too heavy a luxury to carry. Picking out the different shapes in the ruined buildings and wrecked vehicles had kept her entertained as much as teaching her had kept us distracted. Though she knew full well the difference between a circle and a square, she clearly enjoyed confusing the psychiatrist. She'd visibly recovered from whatever malady she'd come down with during our time trapped in a tunnel near the Welsh border, but Dr. Knight wanted her under close observation, at least until the end of August. I thought that was more a case of too many specialists and not enough children. Observation meant Dr. Umbert. He meant well, but he was too overqualified for this particular task. Certainly he was too fond of using his qualifications as justification for his old-fashioned techniques. Daisy, clearly bored with the game, put the square down, picked up a crayon, and began scribbling. Taking that as my cue, I returned my attention to the book. It was a history of the American Railroad, and how that history was altered by the introduction of the telegraph. I'd hoped to discover the amount of labor a person could achieve in an unmechanized world, but had chosen the wrong book. It was a lightweight tome full of anecdotes, but few facts. I'd skimmed through another three pages when the door to the small classroom opened. As one, the five children turned to face the door, and just as grateful for the distraction, I did the same. It was Mary O'Leary, alone and in her wheelchair. I stood up to help her, but she waved me away. A pair of four-year-old twins saw the gesture and waved back. Hello, everyone, Mary said brightly. There were a couple of hellos and a few more waves. Daisy gave the old woman a thoughtful stare. Quite what she was thinking about, I don't know. But Mrs. O'Leary gave them all a wide smile and then turned to me. I do like the classroom, she said. It was a real wrench having to leave. But if there's one blessing from this nightmare, it's that I've been allowed to see it again. And how are you, Bill? Adjusting, I said. Aren't we all? Are you still on electricity? She gestured at the book I'd been reading. The front cover showed a photograph of a telegraph line being run up alongside a railroad. It was distinctly anachronistic, taken at least two decades later than the events described in the book, and should have given me the clue as to the usefulness of the contents. I'm trying to get an understanding of our limitations, I said. At the moment I'm getting no further than learning the extent of my own ignorance. It isn't that the first step to enlightenment. The doctor said I had to walk for an hour a day if I ever again wanted proper use of my legs. Usually George takes me. But he's busy meeting with his overground railroad. She smiled. Ah, doesn't that put a spin to a man's usual retirement hobby? Would you mind lending me your arm for an hour? There was something I wanted to discuss. Grateful for an excuse to abandon the book, I wheeled her outside. Sholto was sitting at a picnic table in one corner of the playground. He'd come with us to the school that morning, but hadn't wanted to go inside. Is your brother all right? Mrs. O'Leary asked. He wants to enjoy the sunshine, I said. Personally, I've never been into sunbathing. I can't see the point. And he said that was the reason to enjoy it now. Quite right, she said. We have to make the most of every moment. Learn to really savor life. Of course, that's a lesson most people learn too late. This will do. If you wouldn't mind helping me up. Thank you, and pass me stick. Ah. I held out my arm. Her grip was like a vice, though her legs were unsteady. The doctor said I needed an hour's walk a day so the muscles don't forget what they're intended for. But that was when there was meant to be surgery and physio. I feel like Knut, attempting to turn back the tide. One day I won't be able to get out of the chair, so today I will enjoy being able to. She took a step, and another. 
you know Knut's point was that there was some things beyond even a king's control, I said. The effort it took her to manage a few tottering steps was clear in the set of her jaw and her grip on my arm. I spoke purely as a way of distracting her. Okay, if I'm truly honest, a small part of me, that part that we each have that never quite leaves the classroom, wanted to correct this lifelong teacher. Of course I do, she said. But you should never let the truth get in the way of a good analogy. Now, tell me what direction your research has been taking you. Because every day you've taken a dozen different books from our library. My starting point was that rescue mission to Carnarvon, I said, and how it almost went tragically wrong. I wondered whether we could run a telephone line across the Menai Strait so we'd have a more reliable communication system the next time a group went over. The copper wire would be more susceptible than a portable radio, she said. And what would be the point in running a phone line to that golf club? We've recovered one of the golf carts already, and we'll have the others over here by the end of the week. It was just a starting point, I said. That got me to thinking about electrical transmission, and whether we could restore power to the mainland. I asked that same question, she said, and the answer is no, not without securing the transformers and rebuilding a substation. Now we could manage it, but what would be the point? The labour involved would be the same as stripping Carnarvon and Bangor, and once they're empty, what use would there be in providing them with electricity? Anglesey and Holy Island once had a combined population of 80,000. We have an eighth of that number and only a fraction of those currently use the houses. If we need farmland, it would make more sense to look to the other islands than to the mainland. The Isle of Man, for instance. Did you hear about the light? Kim told me, I said. She said when they went ashore they discovered it was an emergency beacon. Ah, oh, of course. You spoke to her on the radio, didn't you? She said. It's been bothering me. We've had anglers taking their boats out in that direction for months but no one reported seeing a light on the Isle of Man. In which case, who set up the beacon? How was it turned on? It's worth investigating. Switch to the other side, and we'll turn around. I agree with you about the light, but not about the rest, I said. The Welsh mainland is only a few hundred metres away. The Isle of Man is at least forty miles, but I take your point. Anyway, that was when I started looking into the shortfall in labour, particularly in farming. We have electricity, and I was wondering, well, do you know how trams and some trains draw power from overhead lines? The railway on the island was never electrified, but we could set up some overhead power lines easily enough. If we had some trains, she said, which we don't. We could get some, I said, but the power lines got me thinking. We could set some up above the fields, and use them to run tractors and threshers and whatever else we needed. I know you can't plug a power cable directly into a combustion engine, but if we got a few electric cars, we could rig those engines to the tractors. Or just modify the electric cars, she suggested. Ah, yes, I hadn't thought of that, I admitted. Nor the amount of wire needed, or the effort involved in running it up above each field, or even the monumental danger to anyone operating one of your jury-rigged tractors just a few feet below a net of live wires. But no, actually I did. I said. I thought we could run them remotely, but we wouldn't need GPS if we set a row of digital markers at either end of the field. The old teacher gave a sigh that once again took me back to my school days. We have plenty of tractors on the island, including twenty-three superb Massey Fergusons and another twelve that'll be just as good after some spit, polish and new tyres. If the fuel dump in Svalbard is intact, we'll have more than enough oil to run them. It would take far less effort and time converting that to diesel than anything you're proposing. Far safer, too. I suppose it would, I admitted, feeling foolish for the wasted effort. You're doing what a lot of people have done, she said, though most of us got it out of our systems a few months ago. You're trying to reinvent the wheel by starting with the road. Leave the electricity to the people who spent their lives working with it. Leave the fields to the farmers. You have a different type of specialised knowledge, and we'd be foolish to waste it. What knowledge? I asked. Politics, she said. We need it more than ever. 
or certain parts of it. We have plenty of engineers and pilots, soldiers and sailors, of that, and doctors, teachers, nurses, architects, builders and plumbers. What we lack are politicians and civil servants, at least the kind who know how a society can be run. Take the election. We promised to hold one in November, and it will take place. But how do we organise it? How do you split the island into constituencies when the majority of people live offshore? Every voice should be heard. I don't want the minority silenced by the majority or by the individuals with the loudest voices. You start by getting the electorate registered, I said. Set a deadline for the end of September. Then anyone who wishes to be a candidate has one week to gather, say, 200 signatures from registered voters. We'll run some debates, proper debates, and perhaps publish some interviews and profiles. We can set the rules so that there's a runoff if the winning candidate gets less than 50% of the vote, but the reality is that it'll have to be a popular vote. There's an obvious downside to that, but no system's perfect. Hmm, I'm not standing, she said. I don't know who will, but I, I don't want all the power held in one person. So have the entire cabinet elected, say ten people, plus the mayor makes eleven. You need an odd number so that there's never a tie. In time, assuming we survive long enough, we can introduce candidates based on geography as well as skill set. By having both, we might avoid the pitfalls of a party system. However we decide on the details, the key feature would be initially short-term limits. Ah, you see, Mr. Wright, that's what I meant. I spent four hours last night reading up on the early days of the Dal Aaron and the First Continental Congress. Had I asked you this yesterday, I could have spent the evening watching The Remains of the Day with George. As it is, he spent it watching some dreadful science fiction thing, which I suspect he preferred. Specialised knowledge, Mr. Wright, that's what we need. And there isn't time for each of us to become specialists. So that's our election solved? Well, no, not really, I said. There's a lot more to it. What are the cabinet posts? What are the qualification requirements of a candidate or an elector? Do we have one polling station? Dozens? And you'll solve all of those, I'm sure, she said. The next problem, the large one to which everything is connected, is getting people off their boats. Electricity didn't do it, and that makes me worry that the winter won't either. We need something more. I can't imagine what. I actually thought Marcus's trading post might help. What did you make of him? Not much, I said. I don't trust him. We can't pick and choose who survived the outbreak, she said. Do you know the saying about making your greatest weakness your most valuable strength? That's what I try to do. When Marcus arrived, this was after the island was secure, he began systematically emptying the houses, and we didn't realize for weeks. Well, why didn't you vote in a law making everything he took communal property? I asked. That is what Mr. Mills wanted to do, but there's a limit to how far you can push things, to how far you can push people, and I could see it would only end in a bloodbath. Instead, I tried to make it work for us. I took his bartering system and opened my own shops. The laundrette, the bakery, the book, film and music exchange. We have a tailor's opening next week, did you know? You won't believe the trouble there was in finding sewing machines and people who know how to use them. I set the prices low and Marcus had to match them. That helped rein him in, and there are advantages in knowing where he and his customers are. I'm just not sure that advantage outweighs the potential harm. We did vote in a law giving a third of the island to Heather Jones. She's a local, you know. Lived and worked here as did about half of those currently resident in Menai Bridge. She's holding one-third of the island in trust against the return of those who went on the evacuation. Of course, as she went with them and was one of the few survivors, she knows there's no chance they'll return. But that third will give us a little margin. Besides, it wasn't just Marcus looting the houses. Everyone was doing it. Why scrub clothes by hand in, and in seawater? when you can come ashore and empty the nearest house. Few people thought we had a future here or anywhere. But now, now that we know we can stay, now we know there is unlikely to be a better home anywhere on earth than this, those houses are empty. 
Dirty clothes have been thrown into the sea. The cupboards are bare. The gardens are barren. We fish and grain, and soon won't have anything else. We need to think on a grander scale. Luton Coastal Homes isn't enough. Trading shoelaces for lows will not preserve civilization. We have to become an agricultural powerhouse. We have to rid the mainland of the undead. We have to find a way to do more than just survive. But saying it is easy. She sighed. Help me back to my chair. I know that wasn't an hour, but it's as much as I can manage. I helped her back to her wheelchair and then took her inside to the office in the library that she'd claimed as her own. She made a comment about looking through some papers, but I got the feeling she was going to rest. She has a formidable resolve, but not the stamina that leadership requires. As to who would replace her, I had no idea except that it wouldn't be me. Walking away from the library, I decided to do what she said and focus on that election. I went outside to see what advice my brother might have. I suppose we need nomination papers, I said, after I'd summarized my conversation with Mary O'Leary and ballot papers. To avoid fraud, I was thinking we could use colored paper, but not say what color until the day. Do you think we should use the Iraq model? Sat phones, Sholto said. I'm sorry, I asked. When I was escaping the U.S., I had a sat phone and a tablet, he said. With those, I was able to plot a route free of stall traffic and the undead. That's how I got to Crossfield's Landing. How does that help plan an election? I asked. It doesn't, he said. And I realized he'd not been listening to me. If the satellites are still up there, I should be able to access them. The radio's range is limited. With a sat phone, you'd be in contact with Kim. We'd have had images of the Isle of Man and that place where they saw a light. He'd have been in touch with Lilith and Will and would have known precisely what had happened to them. I forced my brain onto a new track. Satellites? You mean the GPS network? No, I'm talking about a private network Lisa Kempton was building. You remember her? The billionaire investor, sure. She had her own satellites. Control the means of communication and you control the message, he said. Specifically... She wanted early access to the messages her competitors were sending each other. Why bother with corporate espionage when the data is flowing through your hands? He was part of the conspiracy. She was? Her commercial operations provided cover, he said. People notice when a government plane sets down a remote airfield, even more so with a military flight from a foreign power. If it's a corporate jet belonging to a company with fingers in every national pie, no one bats an eyelid. Why? What was she going to get out of it? The license to produce the vaccine, Sholto said. Of course, that was when they thought it would actually cure the world of disease. I don't know how much she was going to charge per dose, but whatever number you think of, I bet you could double it and not even come close to the answer. Looking back, taking in Quigley his ambitions, his actions, and those of the cabal in America, I reckon Kempton planned to seize power herself. I'm not sure how she was going to achieve it, but every conspirator I met envisioned a tyranny of one. Not that it matters now. What does is the satellite network. I had someone working on the inside, and that got me access in an interface that's almost as simple as point and click. We can alter the orbits, just as long as the satellites have propellant. I was saying to Mary O'Leary that yesterday's debacle wouldn't have happened if we had proper communications. This is the answer. I found myself looking up at the sky. How do we do it? For altering the orbits, I'd like to get some professional help. Maybe the comms officer from the vehement. But first, we need to see whether the satellites are still there. To do that, we need a sat phone. I've been looking for one ever since I got to Britain. No luck, obviously. I mean... They would have been beyond useful when we were escaping that horde. Military bases would be one option, I said, or one of the ships, perhaps. Otherwise, we're going to have to look at a large city. Bangor's too small to have a shop that would stop them. Cardiff, perhaps? Or Bristol? Except didn't someone say they were hit with a bomb? We should check with Mrs. O'Leary.
sat phones? George asked. Leon went looking for some back in June, but he didn't find any. I can tell you, there's none over at RAF Valley on Anglesey. That was cleared out during the evacuation, right down to the tools. Somebody on a ship might have one, but I can't think of a name. He glanced at the window to Mary O'Leary's office. The blinds were drawn. We'd found George sitting almost on guard outside the door. So we're going to have to make a trip to the mainland, Sholto asked. Is it worth the risk? George asked. Anyone who leaves here would be able to keep track of the hordes ripping through the mainland, Sholto said, and we'd be able to keep in contact with them. I understand that, lad, George said, but it's not the real reason, is it? Sholto chewed his lip as if weighing up his response. It's Crossfield's Landing, he said. That's the village I set out from when leaving America. There were seventy people there. They might be alive. They might need help. A satellite image isn't going to transport you thousands of miles across an angry sea, George said. But try Heather Jones. She'd know where the nearest shop would be. She's the one from Menai Bridge, I asked. Yes, George said, but she's somewhere in town. She'll be around here later. When? Sholto asked. It's not like I have an appointment book. George said. Give it a couple of hours. Outside, Sholto bridled at the delay, and the reason was obvious. These aren't spy satellites, are they? I asked. What? No. They were built for communications. It was all about the data passing through them. The cameras were a cover. They were originally part of a package designed by a university group studying coastal erosion. So the cameras have a low resolution. You can tell the difference between people and cars, he said, but you can't read their license plates. And Crossfield's landing is in Maine, right? There's a five-hour time difference. So? So if the resolution isn't going to be enough to tell the difference between a zombie and a person, I said, then the only real way of knowing if those people are alive is by looking for the lights at night. Our eyes looked upward at a blue sky dotted with fluffy, cumulus clouds. Maybe, yeah, fine. He sat down on the edge of the only adult-sized picnic table in the playground, then stood up. So, uh, do you wanna... I don't know. What are we meant to do for fun when we've time on our hands? No cinema, no theatre, not even a coffee shop. I suppose we could go to the pub, I suggested. I'd like to see Marcus in his own environment, see for ourselves if he's as bad as his first impression implied. Perhaps he's got a sat phone. It's the sort of thing someone might have traded for a couple of pints. Come on, I added, when it looked like Sholto would say no. That'll keep us busy until Heather Jones arrives. At first, I assumed the group outside the pub were customers queuing to get in. Before depression at all that meant had time to settle— I realized that though they were customers, it wasn't for the pub itself. A pair of tables had been set up in the car park. I recognized Rob, the young man with the sword, standing by the entrance. Buying or selling? he asked. Neither, I said. Then you've no business here, he said, wrapping his hand around the hilt of his sword. Think of us as the health inspectors, Sholto said, or the ATF, if you prefer. I can see the firearms and guess you've got the alcohol inside. No tobacco, though. A woman walked over to us. It was the same one who'd been with Marcus and the chalet in Carnarfon. She was armed, but unlike Rob, with a sleek pump-action shotgun. I smiled. She didn't. You want cigarettes? She asked. No problem. You just cannot smoke them on the premises. Not if you ever want to buy any more from us. Color me curious, Sholto said, but no, we don't want to buy any. Is uh, Marcus around? He's inside, she said. Is this an official visit? Idle curiosity, I said. She weighed that up. You can go in, she said. I took another look at the lines of people. 
From what I could see, they were selling anything and everything, but it wasn't clear what they were buying. I followed my brother inside. I don't know what I was expecting. Dark, dank, dirty squalor, I suppose, but that wasn't what we found. It was well lit and clean, and looked more like an office than a pub, though there was a price board and bottles behind the bar. At a stool at the far end sat Paul. He was nursing an almost empty coffee mug and sporting a fresh black eye. What happened to you? I asked. He glanced at me, then Sholto. Slipped, he muttered. Deciding I wasn't going to get an answer better than the one I could guess, I went for the direct approach. Where's Marcus? Out the back, Paul said. Go and get him, Sholto said, taking a seat at the bar. Paul made a point of emptying the dregs from his mug before slipping behind the bar. He wasn't the only person in there. The pair of women sat by a window, a stack of books on the table between them. Near the stairs an older bearded man was running a cloth over a long knife, not in a threatening way, but with a keen eye of a craftsman tending his tools. Only the four people on the pub's other side looked as if they were taking their ease. But they weren't drinking. No one was. I began revising my opinion of Marcus. Ah, the two brothers of literary fame, the man himself said, coming out of the back room. Paul followed, with a sharp-faced woman bringing up the rear. Get them some drinks, Rachel. Tea? Coffee? she asked. Or this beer, but it's hot far, I'm afraid, unless you want to try our own brand vodka. You don't have any named brands? We keep those for trade, Marcus said. Except the hot var. Vile stuff. But we found a lorry full of it just after we got here. That's why we decided we'd open the pub. There was more than we wanted to drink, but then one bottle of that brew's usually more than anyone wants to drink, right, Rachel? That's right, Marcus, the woman said, in a tone that suggested it wasn't. There was something about her expression that made me think she didn't like the man. Tea would be fine, I said. Yeah, why not, Shalto said. When in Wales, after all. Two teas, then, Rachel, Marcus said. And to what do I owe the pleasure? We were looking for a sat phone, I said. Then you're out to look, Marcus said. We don't have one. No one's traded them with you, I asked. They might have tried, but we're not buying, he said. What use would it be? Oh, sure, there's the battery. But you can find a hundred mobile phones on every street. Finding a use for them is more difficult. I'm glad you came, actually. You can take these off her hands. He walked behind the bar and through the door to the back room, returning with a blue cracked leather gym bag. He placed it on the counter. Pills? Shalto asked, looking inside. Yeah, people trade them, Marcus said. No idea if they still work. Thought you could take them to the hospital. I've no use for them. Sholto took out a pill bottle. Vitamin C. He took out another. Neonatal supplements. This is for arthritis. This is a painkiller. It's an opioid. And we've definitely no use for those, Marcus said. You don't sell pills? I asked. Where's the profit in that? He asked. I glanced at the board behind the bar. You sell booze, I said. Only after 5 p.m. We have strict licensing hours. And again I found myself disconcerted by how atypical he was being. So why not pills? Because they'll run out, Rachel said, returning with a tray on which were two mugs of tea. There's no point creating a habit you can't supply. That's right, isn't it, Marcus? Uh, yeah, he said and I sensed he'd not planned on giving such an honest reply. You said you wanted a sat phone? Rachel asked. Most of the ship's crews dumped them over the side during the escape, along with anything else that was useless weight. I went looking months back. You can ask, but I don't think you'll get anywhere. After two minutes of good tea and awkward conversation, we left. That wasn't what I expected, I said. 
I thought it would be a dive, lots of guns and bandoliers of ammunition. And gold-toothed pirates? I think that's who Kim sailed off with, Shalto said. Nope, Marcus is a lot more organized than I was expecting. And that's what that place reminds me of. Organization, specifically organized crime. You remember me telling you what happened after our parents died. You fell in with some gangsters. They had a place like that, and I've seen others like it since. Places where there are very strict rules. It's a place of work and run as such. So the question becomes, what are they working towards? No, Shalto said. You're not thinking like a criminal. The bigger question is whether they were telling the truth about not having any sat phones and why they were looking for them in the first place. Taking the bag of pills to the hospital took care of an hour. We killed another, speculating whether they represented the only pharmaceuticals Marcus had been given. When we got back to the school, a red-headed woman was deep in conversation with George Tull. When she turned around, I saw a jagged scar running from her temple down to her chin. It gave a sardonic edge to her thoughtful expression. Heather, George said, this is Bill and Thaddeus. The two brothers, she said with a far less pronounced Welsh accent than I was expecting. George said you can get some satellites working. If we had some sat phones, Sholto said, then you want to go to Bangor. There's ten at the university, she said. When do you want to leave? Chapter 4 Menai Bridge 0730, the 19th of August, day 160 I like it here, I said to Sholto as we headed down to the shore. Anglesey? Menai Bridge, I said. Yeah, me too, he said, glancing back at the small town. It's a bit like Crossfield's Landing. I mean, that's a two-street village. But the people are similar, eager, enthusiastic. No, that's not the right word. They, they haven't given up. And there's the view of the sea. Not as wide here as in Maine, mind you. I waited for him to go on. But as was often the case, when he remembered that village in America, he'd lost himself in the past. When Heather Jones asked when we wanted to leave... My instinct was to say immediately, but there was Daisy to consider. If I'm honest, I felt as restless as my brother. Organizing an election was too much like my old life, but without all the digital distractions and electronic assistance that would have made it routine. After all, the election doesn't only mean new leadership and perhaps a new direction for our community. It also represents the beginning of a new state. If I do the job correctly, it might mean the opportunity for a new kind of state. Added to that was the new burden of parenting. I hadn't realized how much of the work Kim and Annette had done out on the mainland. As such, I was quite happy to bring Daisy with us to Menai Bridge and to let the Duponts dote over her. We'd arrived late, had a good meal where barely any ingredients came from the old world, and listened to other people's stories that had nothing to do with the outbreak. It was pleasant, different, the kind of atmosphere I hoped would become a new normal. If anything, and after an astonishingly good night's sleep, the view of the small town only reinforced that opinion. They've got it together, Sholto said, echoing my thoughts. It's not just that it's organized. It's not just that they planted food back in the spring or even that they keep the streets clean, but that they intend to keep on doing it. We were walking down a narrow terrace of boarded-up houses. On each front door was a plastic envelope, inside of which was a list of the property's contents. Some had an additional mark in large chalk lettering, noting some item that might be of more immediate use, though that use wasn't always obviously practical. Piano was chalked on one door, and I was surprised the small cottages had room for even a stand-up model. Another door was marked with twin-tub washing machine, another with children's clothes. A fourth, with a red and green chalk sketch added to the front wall, proclaimed the wonderful words, Apple Tree, 
September. They really want to make the place work, I said. I know that this road and the parts they took us to see yesterday are the exception. I mean, this was a town of about three thousand, and there's only fifty people here. But they really are trying. If everyone was like this, just imagine what we could do. I think it's because everyone isn't like this that they want us to move here," he said. "And what do you think?" I asked. "You know where I'm going, but I think it'll be good for you, good for Kim and Annette, and definitely good for Daisy. You need to be surrounded by others. It's not just safety, but sanity as well." If Annette had had someone outside our immediate family to talk with, she might not have imploded so spectacularly. And even if she had, the journal wouldn't have been so widely distributed. I added, though I was increasingly of the opinion that Annette's actions had been for the best. Certainly, among the residents of Menai Bridge, there was no ill will directed towards Sholto and I for our unwitting association with the conspiracy. Heather Jones was waiting by a hundred-foot schooner with twin masts that seemed at least that tall. The red paint around the stern was so fresh that it still glistened, though the name needed touching up. What does it mean? I asked as I waved a greeting to her. Heath, it's Welsh for tranquility, Jones said. But we're not taking her. Hey, Bill, Shalto. Gwen said, appearing from inside the boat's long cabin, "I'm taking her to Blackpool, Lancaster, and maybe Barrow and Furness if it's safe enough." Why? I asked. Gwen reached down and picked up a small box, a Geiger counter. She said, "We need to check the radiation levels. There's too many things we can only get from a large city, and there's no way you can call Bangor that." Wait a day, Sholto said. You can take a sat phone and stay in contact with us. George said the same thing," Gwen said. "And I thought about it, but what would be the point? Most of my time will be on the boat. I'll only go ashore if it's safe. And when I'm inland, if I'm surrounded, how would you rescue me? Don't say you'd come in with guns blazing, because there aren't enough of us for that. Not enough boats either. No, we'll manage. We've done this before. Oh, Bill, George asked me to bring you that." She gestured at a bench that faced the sea. Leaning against it was a long pole. On second glance, I realized it was a pike, not an ancient one nor a replica, but a modern take on the old weapon. The axe was broad, with seven perfectly drilled holes an inch apart, following the curve of the machine-sharpened blade. The spike was nearly a foot long and broad at the base. The style reminded me of the assegai. George wore at his waist. Foam padding had been wrapped around the coffee cream wood. I'd have to remove it, as that material would soak up the undead gore. A few strips of easily discarded cloth would be far more practical. Thank you, I said. Thank George, Gwen said. He said it was either an apology, a thank you, or a welcome, and he wasn't quite sure which. I think he was really looking for an excuse to try out the lathe. Now I've got to get going. I'll see you in a few days. Safe journey and safe return, Jones said, and then turned to us. We're taking the rowing boats. She gestured up the coast to where a group of eleven were talking quietly, sipping at mugs. We'd been introduced to them the previous night, but there'd been such a whirlwind of names I could only remember those of the three I'd met before. Lorraine waved. Simon raised a hand to his forehead in an unmartial salute. Lilith gave a nod with the edge of a smile to it. Will, not going with us due to his bandaged leg, sat on a bench a little further down the quay, brooding. "That's a large group just for some phones," Sholto said, as we walked over to meet them. "It would be if we were all going into the city," Jones said, "and if we were only interested in your phones." I've grander plans than that. Four hundred meters across the strait is the mainland. Do you see the houses? We've rowed over to empty the homes by the shore, but it's months since we went into Bangor. It was a horde, Simon said. Almost caught us. Almost caught you, Lorraine said. Simon blushed. It wasn't a horde, 
Jones said. There were barely more than a thousand of them, but Bangers got the sea to the west and north. There was nowhere to run but to our boats. We were going to return, but there was the question of Quigley and whether we'd be scattering to the four winds. Not that we were going to leave, Simon said. This is our home. We were going to fight. Speak for yourself, Lorraine said. Cowardice is always the better part of valour. There were a few snickers. From the way Simon blushed, that was a private joke at his expense. Settle down, Jones said. We are wasting the tide. Everyone went instantly still. I'd noticed it the previous night. Jones was in her mid-twenties, yet spoke with a possessive and protective authority. Regardless of their age, and some of the town's residents were at least twice hers, she acted as if she was something between their captain, parent, and pirate queen. Do you see over there? Jones continued. That's Bango Football Club. The rooftops beyond are the university. Lorraine, Bill, Sholto, and I will go ashore there and leave our boat. Everyone else, you're heading up to the pier. She gestured northwards. You'll secure it and put up a barricade around Garth Point. That'll make the next trip easier. The next trip? Sholto asked. What else are we after, other than the Satrons? Jones pulled a long list from her pocket. Micrometers, scales, glassware. Anything we can't easily make. Everything ideally, but we have priorities. We've been through the high schools and the School of Ocean Sciences, but there's not enough. She gestured at the campus building that dominated the small town. We need vitamins, antibiotics and fertilizers. Finding them is dangerous. Transporting them to the island requires more labor than we have, and with little fuel, more time than we can spare. But making them, that's something we can do if we have the right equipment. I dare say there are some who'd welcome a day in a heated laboratory when the weather turns, but first we need to build the lab. There's no point doing that if we can't equip it. This trip, we'll see what's there and what's salvageable. The sack phones will be a bonus we'll collect on our way out. Check your straps. Make sure they're not loose. Check your laces. Tape them down. Check your ammo. Be certain you've got enough. It took less than ten minutes for everyone to get in their boats and cast off. Our boat took the lead. The other two fell into formation behind. I offered to help row. Now, you'll be more hindrance than help, Jones said. Wish you'd say that about me. Lorraine said, picking up her own oar. Facing forward, I could see Gwen's twin-masted schooner taking advantage of tide and wind to speed northward. Is that the pier? I asked. Probably, Jones said without turning around. Yes, it's at Garth Point, Lorraine said. It's a kilometre long. It was one of the largest piers in the world. It's not even five hundred metres, Jones said. And it's only one of the longest piers in Wales. Lorraine rolled her eyes. And isn't that about as big as the world is now? You're a local, right? Sholto asked. Not even close, Lorraine said. I'm from the land of jute jam and journalism. I'm Welsh, if that's what you mean, Jones said. Born and raised in Glamorgan, but I lived here before the outbreak in Menai Bridge. I asked. On the outskirts, Jones said. I worked for the university while I studied. Employees got a discount on fees. That's how I knew about the sat phones. It was a bit of a scandal. They were meant to be given to the oceanographic research teams as a way of keeping the insurance costs down. You know, by making sure they would always be in contact. Unfortunately, when the first bill arrived, it was full of calls to Australia. That's why the sat phones are kept locked up in the finance department. I read your journal, she added. Who hasn't? The evacuation was a good idea, she said. In theory, it could have worked. The thoroughness with which they emptied Anglesey's testament to what they might have achieved, if only it had been a different politician in charge. On two, let it run. The two women gave another stroke and raised their oars out of the water. As the boat glided, Jones looked at the seaweed, caught in her oar's blade. Hmm, 
You see the bloom? Sure, Sholto said, though I just saw a green slimy plant. It's wrong for this time of year, in far too shallow a depth, Jones said. Is that a bad sign? I asked. Everything is a bad sign these days, Jones said. Shish, Lorraine murmured. On two, back it down, Jones said a little forcefully. You can't just see row and stop, Lorraine said. I couldn't help but smile. The evacuated Anglesey? Sholto asked. I was curious about why there weren't many locals. The government went house to house, Jones said. They emptied it utterly and thoroughly. Do you know why? I know Anglesey was meant to be a target, Sholto said. Because of the power plant. If they thought it would be hit by a nuclear bomb, Jones asked, why go to the trouble of removing the people? Since they were only planning to kill them at the muster points. They were, you see. They took us out by train. But it would have been quicker to walk. We made about thirty miles before dark and the trains came to a complete stop. There was no food, no water, no information about where we were going or when we might get there. We forced open the carriage doors, but it wasn't a rebellion. We wanted to get to the muster point, and that's the direction we started walking. Some soldiers started shouting at us. There weren't many of them, two dozen maybe. Then they started shooting. We ran. Sixty-five of us made it out of there. The next day I went back. There was no muster point. They were gassing the people in the trains. I don't know what with, but the evacuees were all dead. When I got back to where I'd left the group, most of them had gone. Of those who were left, three were dead, and two were zombies. I headed home. There were twenty of us out of eighty thousand who made it back to Anglesey. All for what? So Quigley could play king. I wonder what happened to them, Lorraine said. Who? I asked. The royals. Cust coming up. The road leading east and inland from Bangor's small football stadium was lined with cars on both sides of the carriageway, though their engines were all pointing towards the sea. Often, parked bumper to bumper or door to door, they were rust mottled, paint scratched and dirt smeared with drifts of leaves gathered around the wheels and against the windscreens. A jet-black open top had failed to shunt a family four-door out of the way, but had broken its windows in the attempt. The back seat was covered in mould and rotten cardboard, almost the same shade as the paintwork. It was a desolate picture, a reminder of the desperate horror of those early months after the outbreak, and one that had been absent in our brief glimpse of Carnarvon. Every few steps I found myself turning around, looking back at the sea, wondering how many of the drivers had made it to the island. After twenty yards, the gaps between the vehicles grew fewer and narrower, and I had to keep my eyes on the road ahead. There's a black cab, Lorraine hissed. Do you think it's from London? A low, rasping sigh answered before any of us could. I've got it, I whispered, leveling the pike as the zombie rose from behind the taxi. Hair sprouted from a patchwork scalp of cracked skin. Withered arms extended from a crimson blazer turned pink by sun and black by dirt. I stepped forward as its receding lips pulled back from the broken stumps of rotting teeth. It gasped, letting forth a plume of fetid air, a tone richer than the damp decay enveloping the stalled cars. As it lunged, I stabbed the spear into its eye. The zombie collapsed with a thump. There was a moment of silence quickly broken by the sound of flesh against glass. It came again, and this time I knew where to look. A three-fingered hand dragged against the grimy window of the black cab, drawing lines through the month's old dirt. What do you think? Sholto asked. Would the sound of a gunshot breaking glass be louder than that creature? Probably not, Jones said. She leveled her rifle and fired. The sound fractured the deceptively still morning. We stood, waiting, listening. 
but all was silent save the distant waves and rustling trees. I can't abide the trapped zombies, Jones said. It's like they've been buried alive. It was a reminder that this wasn't a holiday. A piratical search for abandoned treasure or even a day at work. It was a journey into an undead city, with all the unknown dangers that held. I eyed the gore dripping from the pike's blade. At least I'd learned the weapon was well made. It was a little heavier than the old replica from Longshank's manor, and the balance was a few inches off, but it was reassuring having a weapon I knew how to use. If we'd been completely silent, Lorraine said, climbing up onto the roof of the cab, we might have walked straight into that zombie. I guess we need to be quiet and noisy at the same time. She peered around and ahead. I shared a house with someone like that. She could make tiptoeing up the stairs sound like a stampeding herd of elephants. I considered setting up cameras and putting it on the internet as a spoof wildlife documentary, but moved out instead. I can't see anything, just more cars. She jumped down. Her brittle cheerfulness barely hid the nervousness underneath. Something Lorraine had told us during our trip to Carnarfon clicked into place next to what Jones had said. They'd raided the coastal houses, but not come into the towns for months. This was as new an experience for them as it was for us. Onward, I suggested, and Jones and her rifle took the lead. The lane met the coastal road by a church that had been partially burned to the ground. A multi-vehicle pile-up almost blocked the junction, but I couldn't tell whether that was where the fire had begun or to where it had spread. Jones paused at the remains of a bright blue coupe. In the driver's seat was a charred skeleton. Kerry Schultz, Lorraine muttered. She's the driver? I asked. No, Jones said. She was a survivor. She died. She made it this far and a little further, but not to the island. We saw the fire when we were looting the houses further south. We came up this way and found her about half a mile over there. She was trying to reach Anglesey. She'd found a map in one of the safe houses, Lorraine said. She and some other people. They didn't make it, but she died before she could tell us how many or where they'd come from. She did say that she'd fought her way out of the church with Molotov cocktails. Joan said, burns and blood loss, that's what killed her. If she'd hung on for another hour, we'd have got her to the clinic. I don't know if they could have saved her, maybe even in the old world she'd have died. But she got so close. Onward, ever onward, Lorraine muttered, because that's all that's left. Beyond the Pyrrhic church, the road lay empty. To our left were scrubby fields, to our right was a six-foot stone wall and an embankment covered in trees. It can't have looked much different a year before, except that the road was now tinged green. Without the passage of cars there was nothing to stop a thin film of moss from spreading across the dimpled and cracked asphalt. Jones pointed her rifle barrel at a side road. No words were spoken. The silence had grown, and we were all aware of it. There was no birdsong and only one thing that could mean. One house, then two, then detached houses lined the road on either side. The gardens got smaller as the houses got closer together, but if anything, the bushes grew wilder and taller. Perhaps it was because the roofs and towering trees blocked out the sunlight. In comparison with the wide horizon of the open road, the sepulchral gloom only heightened the sense of impending danger. After a hundred and fifty yards, we came to a white van stopped at ninety degrees to the road. It looked as if it had reversed out of a driveway and slammed into a stone wall in front of the house opposite. A black minivan had followed it, but had been abandoned with its doors open, halfway out of the drive. Postgrad accommodation, Jones whispered gesturing at the house. As we squeezed cautiously between the two vehicles, I spared a glance at the property. The top-floor windows had been broken. Below them lay toasters, 
microwaves, TVs, cabinets, bookcases, chairs, crockery, cutlery, tools and unidentifiable pieces of metal of every shape and size. Underneath those were three twisted bodies. I couldn't tell if they'd been undead, and there wasn't time to investigate. A dozen zombies crouched, nearly motionless, thirty yards down the road. On three, Joan said, raising her rifle. As she spoke, a zombie in a voluminous coat raised its head. At least, it raised its forehead and eyes. Its jaw, hanging by a shred of skin, stayed flush against its chest. Three! Jones fired. Lorraine and Sholto did the same. I tried to count the shots, but there were too many, and it was over too quickly. The zombies were dead before the nearest had managed more than a step. What did you— Lorraine began. Shh! Jones hissed. We listened. There was nothing. What were you seeing? Jones asked. Well, I was going to ask them what they did with the bodies, Lorraine said. What bodies? I asked. You know, the zombies. There weren't many by that house, and that got me thinking about all the undead you've killed. I wondered what you did with the bodies. In the States we dragged them away, Shalto said. Out in the wasteland we left them where they fell. Quigley burned his, I added. We'll have to do the same. Focus, Joan said. There's a lane leading to the university up ahead. No more talking until we're inside. Chapter 5 Banger Ten Hundred Hours, the 19th of August, Day 160 Banger's history stretched back centuries though its modern reputation was as the quintessential university town. Half its population of 20,000 were students. Before the outbreak, I'd been familiar with the train station, the hall where my candidate had given a speech, and the street where the radio car had been parked. The speech had been forgettable, the interview anything but. She'd read a statement in Welsh under the assumption that it followed the same pronunciation rules as English. According to the Internet, it was the seventh worst interview in history, though it gained her enough name recognition to forge a career at one of the more nationalistic English newspapers. To make up for my lack of personal knowledge, I spent the previous evening memorizing the road map. The city had seemed small. Actually walking through it reminded me of a maze. There was no central campus. Different facilities occupied buildings on seemingly random patches of land, divided by roads and interspersed with houses and occasional shops. Jones pointed at a road far too narrow for the white line running down its middle, and almost too narrow for most modern cars. A moped lay on its side twenty yards from the entrance. On either side of the road were stocky terraced houses with single glazed windows and pebble-dashed facades. Jones took the lead. I took the rear. The going was agonizingly slow as we paused at every broken window, checking the house hadn't become a home for the undead. My heart skipped when a shadow flitted across the road. Seagull, I muttered. Jones threw me a cautioning glance, then gestured ahead. The street ended in a T-junction, with a red brick building taller than the terrace houses. The Faculty of Biological Sciences, she whispered. The supply room is in the basement. We followed the road to the building's main entrance. One seagull didn't mean the town was safe, but I found myself looking over my shoulder, trying to catch sight of the bird. There was the soft sound of a silenced shot. I spun around. Lorraine had fired at a zombie staggering around the edge of the faculty building. She'd missed. I've got it, Shalto said. He fired. It fell. In unspoken agreement, we began to jog. It was a shared desire to find shelter, to reach a place where we could regroup and rethink. We reached the main entrance but were stopped by a chain running through the door's handles. It's new, Shalto said, lifting the padlock. Your work? Not mine, Joan said, her back to the door. Her rifle raised, her eyes on the dark windows opposite. And it wasn't here in April— that's when we last came this far. So someone has been here since, 
I murmured. And why did they lock the door? To keep the zombies out? Or to keep them in? Lorraine cupped her hands over the glass window and peered inside. Can't see any. Just a corridor. Looks empty. What's in the supply room? Shalto asked. Digital scales that are accurate to a microgram, Jones said, and microscopes with a magnification to see something that small. And we need that, do we? Shalto asked, slinging his rifle. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a small leather case. It's the difference between regressing to the turn of the century, Jones said, or returning to before the turn of the last one. So yes, we do need them, Lorraine added. Shalto extracted two thin lengths of metal. I lost my original set of lockpicks somewhere in the Atlantic, he said, inserting them into the padlock. I took to making them of an evening as I traveled through Britain. There's not much else you can do without light but work away at a length of metal. He gave a twist. The padlock opened. But everyone needs a hobby, and that's a cheap lock. Lorraine pulled the chain free. We went inside. There was a smell of damp to the building. The problem with that smell is that it's indistinguishable from the slow decay of the undead. Once again, I was at the rear, the pike held across my chest so the pole didn't knock on the floor. It was a bad weapon for this kind of work, too cumbersome when you didn't know from what direction danger would come. An occasional pool of second-hand daylight spilled through the windows of closed doors, but that only emphasized the gloom. We stabbed our torches into every recess and corner. They were all empty, but when the light moved, the returning shadows seemed more sinister than before. You said the basement? Shalto asked, swinging torch and rifle left and right with a pendulous regularity. That's where the supply room is, Jones whispered. There are stairs just after the point where the corridor branches. Look to your left. It's the door with no windows. No windows. Great, Lorraine muttered. We reached the door to the stairwell. Sholto pushed it open. The hinges creaked. Collectively holding our breath, we waited, listening. There was a distant, irregular banging from somewhere, though not close, and not from inside the stairwell. It sounds like a window shutter, I said, more wishful than confident. Let's get this over with, Lorraine said pushing past my brother. Jones quickly followed, then Sholto. I stepped inside, letting the door close quietly behind me. I shone the torch at the stairs leading up, more than half expecting a torrent of the undead to pour down from above. There were scuff marks near the landing, eleven steps above. On the wall, parallel to them, three jagged gashes had been scored through the paintwork. They were roughly at shoulder height, so probably meant a fight, though there was no blood, no body. Bill! Sholto called softly. I went down. Lorraine was standing by a blue painted door. Jones had a rifle trained on it, the light shining on the no admittance notice. Locked? I asked. No, it was electric. Jones whispered. Ready? Sholto raised his rifle. There wasn't room for me to do anything with my pike except keep it out of the way. Lorraine pulled the door open. The corridor beyond was narrower than the one above. The ceiling was lower, tiled with polystyrene panels interspersed with the vents from the now-defunct air conditioning system. Off the corridor on either side were closed doors painted the same blue as the stairwell's handrail. Each had a window, but the glass was opaque. Shall we? Lorraine said, and can we be quick? Jones led us down the corridor, stopping two doors from the entrance. It's here, she said. There were no markings on the door. Shalto. He shone his light on the lock. Sorry, you can't pick that lock. Or I can't at least. We'll have to force it open. Finally feeling like I served some purpose on the trip, I rammed the pipe between frame and door and levered until the wood splintered. Jones went inside. Shalto followed. I'm staying out here, Lorraine said. 
I was glad to wait with her. Are you thinking about the chain on the front door? I asked. Aren't you? She replied. Well? I heard Sholto ask from inside. Is it all here? Hard to be sure, Jones said. I think so. The scales, the microscope, slides. Ah, the micrometers. There was the sound of something being stuffed into a bag. A moment later she came out. Are we done? Lorraine asked. Her earlier bonhomie gone. For now, Jones said, we'll need to come back for everything else. Good. Lorraine walked briskly back to the stairwell. It was a relief to get back to the ground floor and its irregular second-hand light. The knocking we'd heard earlier had ceased. I hoped it was just an open window caught in the breeze, but I kept the pike ready. Back outside, yes? Lorraine asked. Not that way, Jones said. I want to check something. I didn't ask what. It was clear there were other rooms she wanted to check, and equally clear that she wasn't sharing that with Lorraine so as not to ramp up the woman's fears. That did nothing for my own fears, of course but they had shifted from what might be inside the building to what we'd found outside. Why chain up the front door? I murmured as we followed Jones away from the stairwell. To keep it clear of the undead so it could be used as a refuge, Shalto suggested. It would only be a refuge for someone who had the key, I said. Perhaps we should have looked for one. In London I left a notice on the doors of secure buildings for anyone who might come after me. Well, I did that in America, he said. Left notes, I mean. We've had a lot of time to think about why. The conclusion I reached was that it was a rejection of solitude, a quiet plea to the universe that there should be some other survivors. That's odd, isn't it? The thing solitude makes you do. Not that it explains why the chain was on the door. Heather, Lorraine asked a thesaurus of meaning within the name. Yes, fine, we'll go, Joan said. There was a chemical storeroom somewhere on the ground floor. I thought it was down here, but it's not. I'm misremembering. I didn't come inside here that often. We'll go, but not through the front door. We'll check if the back is chained. This way, I think. I paused to shine the light through a dark window. The room inside had white boards and workbenches, but it didn't look like a classroom. And again, the last time I'd spent any time in a science classroom had been in school, and those hadn't been updated since the 1950s. I'm not exaggerating, they still had wooden benches etched with the graffiti of generations of bored children. Since then, the only labs into which I'd ventured had been the high-tech clean room variety. Usually that was when taking a dim parliamentary candidate for the obligatory photo op among very smart people. I moved on to the next door. It was windowless. I tried the handle. The door was locked. I was about to call for my brother to come and pick it, but closed my mouth on the unspoken words. There was no reason to assume a sinister motive in the chain through the door outside, nor any reason to check a locked room. The next window showed a room with a long table at one end and four islands in the middle. Each had a sink and cupboards, but it was too dark to see any more. It was fear that was making me think the worst. Not fear of the undead, but fear of all the unknowns that lay in our future. There was a nearly insurmountable task ahead, for which no one's life before the outbreak could count as preparation. The next door had no windows. I tried the handle. It was unlocked. I pushed the door open, shining the light inside for no reason greater than curiosity. The beam caught an empty room and a zombie's open mouth. The creature was two feet away and staggering towards me. A swinging hand knocked the torch from my grip. I limped back a step, trying to pivot the pike between us. The zombie swung its hand again, banging into the door frame. One-handed, I thrust the pike forward. The point sliced through its thigh. It must have severed a tendon as, when the creature took a step, it toppled forward, knocking me down. I landed hard, but was already kicking out trying to get my legs away from its snapping mouth. My arm was pinned by the pike, trapped between our bodies. 
and I couldn't get the purchase to lever the zombie away. Its mouth snapped closer and closer. Its clawed hand gripped my thigh. I grabbed the knife from my belt, awkwardly stabbing at its scalp. But I didn't have the reach to do more than tear a ragged line through its skin. I was about to scream when a boot slammed into the zombie's head. My brother was there. He kicked the creature off me, stamped on its chest, aimed his rifle at its head, and fired. You all right? he asked. Damn, I muttered. You okay? Jones asked. I ran my hands down my legs. The material was torn. My leg was bruised, but it didn't look like the skin was broken. There's no damage to anything but my ego, I said. Shalto went into the room to retrieve my torch and took that time to look around. There's nothing in here, he said. No desks, no chairs. It's a completely empty room. Why is there a zombie in an empty room? Lorraine nudged at the body with her rifle's barrel, opening the dirt and worse smeared coat. What is it? Jones asked. I, I think I know him, Lorraine said. Or, I sort of think I might. The bullet had done its work well. Too little of the face remained to discern any features. The clothing was reasonably intact. There was a rip on the trouser leg, under which was a ragged wound. That was presumably how the man had been infected. The jacket was of a thin, lightweight, breathable fabric. The T-shirt underneath was embossed with one of those meaningless vintage logos of a car at a beach. It's the belt, Lorraine said. Or oh, the buckle, anyway. I know I've seen it before. Whereas the clothing was the definition of nondescript, the buckle was anything but. Made of steel, it was eight inches by five inches and showed a snarling lion fashioned in an almost baroque style. I'm sorry for your loss, I said. No, I don't mean I know him, Lorraine said. I remember the buckle, and sort of vaguely remember its owner from the island. Where? Jones asked. The inn, Lorraine said. It was about a month ago. I went looking for Darjeeling. Why? Shelto asked. It's my favourite, Jones said. He was at the bar. Him and three others, Lorraine said. Do you remember who? Jones asked. Or maybe a name? No, Lorraine said. I barely stepped inside before I wanted to get out again. Where's this rear door? Shelto asked. I want to know if it's chained. Jones led the way. We went more slowly. I just wanted to get outside and was sure the others felt the same. But we stopped at each door and checked each room, whether it was locked or not. They were all empty. At the end of that corridor was a wide set of stairs leading up. There were none going down. In the alcove underneath where the stairs bent upwards was a vending machine. Oh, I wouldn't mind some chocolate, Sholto said, shining his torch on the glass doors. Bad luck for you, then. Jones said. The on-campus machines only had healthy snacks. Just my luck, Shalto muttered, shifting the light to play up the stairs, then at the corridor beyond. Maybe that explains the smell. It's gotten worse, a lot worse. He stepped closer, shining the light on something almost hidden behind the machine. Okay, that's new. I peered around him so that I could see. Behind the machine was a pair of feet. They weren't moving. But I gave them a prod with a pike to be sure. I eased my way around the machine for a better look. It's a man, I said. Not a zombie. He wasn't shot in the head, but he's dead and decomposing. I stepped back so Sholto could get a view. He crouched down, getting far closer to the rotting corpse than I'd wanted. He's been stabbed. In the side of the neck, he said. I'd say this happened at least a month ago, maybe two. It's hard to pin a time frame on it, and it'll be just as hard identifying him. I'd say he was twenty to forty, but I'm not putting money on it. The only distinguishing mark is a tattoo that runs around his neck and up to his ear, starting just above where he was stabbed. It's a sort of almost 
Celtic pattern, but not quite. It's too blocky. Let me see, Lorraine said, squeezing past. Oh. She backed away again. Yes, definitely. I definitely know him. He was with the other guy, both of them. They were at the inn. Stabbed in the neck, Jones said. Do we call that murder? We can call it homicide, I said. But without knowing the circumstances, we can't say any more. One stabbed, the other infected and locked in a room. Who did it? Shalto asked, easing out of the narrow alcove. Are there any cops on the island? No, Jones said. Or none who'll admit it. Not after the police's involvement in murdering the evacuees. Pity, Shalto said. Why? Lorraine asked. Someone's dead. So what? The man was stabbed in the neck, but it wasn't done behind that machine, Shalto said, shining his light on the floor. The body was moved. Why? If you want to hide a murder, just stab the corpse in the brain. No one would question it. Then there's the wound itself. He eased back around the machine, shining the torch on the body. Yeah, it's hard to be sure, but it looks as if the blade went in about three inches below his ear. One blow, and there was some force to it, so it's hard to imagine the circumstances where it could have been an accident. And don't forget that chain on the front door. Marcus, Lorraine said, I bet it's him. Maybe, Joan said. Maybe not. We've no evidence. Fine, Lorraine said. Then there's no reason to linger. When we come back for the equipment downstairs, we'll bring Dr. Knight with us and bring some more lights. We'll investigate properly, but we're not going to find anything here now. So let's get outside. Get those sat phones and get back. Yeah, Shelter said. Get the sat phones. There was a cop running things in Maine. A homicide detective. This will be right up his street. That body's been here a while. I think this mystery will wait long enough for us to get a boat there and back. The rear door wasn't padlocked, but it was bolted from the inside. After the discovery of the body, I couldn't help but think of that as another clue. To what and what it meant, I didn't know. Outside, the soft breeze did little more than move hot air around. It was refreshing after the darkness, and it put my new fears into perspective. A dead body, albeit belonging to someone seen on Anglesey, didn't mean anything. The wound didn't mean it was murder. What counted as accidental had surely changed in the last few months. The most likely explanation was that a group had come over to loot the university. They must have split up. One had been infected. Perhaps... After locking that person in the lab, another had heard a noise. Expecting the zombie that infected his friend, he'd spun around, lashing out with a knife and stabbed his comrade. It was an accident, a stupid, tragic mistake. There was probably even an innocent explanation for the body being moved. Shame and fear could have propelled the killer to do that. I rolled the idea around and found it fit most of the facts. Not all of them, but I felt it was close to the truth. Zombies, Jones hissed. She ducked behind a post office van stalled a hundred yards from the faculty building. The rain took cover behind her. Sholto and I, a few yards behind, hurried to catch up. The zombie was small, smaller than Annette. I glanced at Lorraine. Her rifle was down, her eyes fixed, almost glazed. I've got it, Shalto said, as Jones tried to turn Lorraine away from the pitiful sight. Lorraine wouldn't move. Shalto fired. The child collapsed. It's gone, Lorraine, Jones said. It's over. It was over a long time ago, Lorraine said. She took a deep breath. And it will never be over. She shook away the memory and stood. Let's go. The side door to the university's administrative building wasn't chained, though it was locked. Shalto had it open in a few seconds, and we went inside. The air felt stuffy, 
as if it had been trapped in there for months, but there was no odour of decay. It just emphasised that we should have realised what had lain in wait for us in the faculty building. They're in here, Joan said, pointing at a door marked Bursa. It was locked. It's too heavy to pick with these tools, Sholto said, after a moment's toying with the mechanism. He tapped the door and then leaned his ear against it. I'd say it's empty. You want to give it a go? I stuck the pike in, splintered the wood, and thought a crowbar would have done the job while making a less cumbersome weapon. Inside was a simple office with three desks and another door. The phones are in there, Joan said, pointing at the door. This is seriously reinforced, Shelto said, examining it. It's almost like a bank vault. We can't pick it or force it. I'll need to cut it open, although it might be easier hacking a hole through this wall. He stabbed his knife into the plaster. Or you could use the key, Joan said. She opened a drawer in the nearest desk, then another. Here. The keys are in the desk. That doesn't seem like much of a security precaution, I said. Calling a sister in Australia isn't a sackable offence, Joan said. Taking the key from the drawer and using it to enter a secure room is. They were trying to encourage theft? Sholto asked. Only by one truly obstreperous professor, she said. The kind who got caught making phone calls to Australia, then hired a lawyer to find a way to prove he'd done nothing wrong. Inside the sealed room were metal filing cabinets. Which one is it? Sholto asked. No idea, Jones said. What else is here? I asked, as Sholto went from one to another. Exam papers, Joan said. I'm not sure what else. I wandered back into the hallway, my mind on the buildings we'd seen, trying to come up with a strategy to salvage everything from the town. Bill, you got your bag? Sholto called. The phones were bulkier than I'd been expecting, a little deeper and taller than an old dial pad mobile. So what now? I asked, pressing the power button. Nothing happened. They have to be charged, and I'll need some tablets to use as screens, Sholto said, and I'll need to install some software on those. After that, it'll just take two or three hours and a clear line of sight. You've been carrying our own software to hack into a satellite network since the outbreak, Lorraine asked as we filled the bag. No, he said. Bill has. I have? It was bundled with the files you downloaded. Didn't you notice? I didn't really look, I said. Before the power went out, before Prometheus, I was just copying as much as I could. There wasn't time to look through it all. After the power went out, there was never enough electricity to look at more than a few videos at a go. Then we found you, and since then I've not seen the point. You done here? Jones asked, as the last phone was put in the bag. Then we can go to the pier. She glanced at her watch. It's taken us longer than I thought. We won't have long to wait for the tide. Jones led us away from the finance building and back into the narrow roads. Once again, I was lost and disorientated. I made a mental note to carry a compass from now on, and then remembered that back in Carnarfon, I'd made a note to visit the firing range. Strange, isn't it? Sholto said walking through an empty town like this, but knowing safety is a few hundred meters away. Hardly knowing, Joan said. The sat phones, they work on line of sight with a satellite? Yeah, so you can't use them inside a building unless you hold the transmitter close to a window, he said. We've been using ship-to-shore radios, she said, the emergency kind. But you've got to have a line of sight with a receiving antenna. That's fine when the signal's going from the top of a boat's mast to the school, relayed via the antenna on the crane at the docks. That would be utterly useless right now, when I want to tell the rest of my crew where we are. She's worried. Lilith's going to play the hero, Lorraine said. The good cheer had returned to her voice. It's a favourite game. She pointed at a battered road sign pointing to a customer car park and added, Supermarket! 
The food's all gone, surely, I said. It is, Jones said, but the freezers aren't, nor are the chiller cabinets. We've so many fish being caught that we could stockpile enough for a year. They'll wait. Everything can wait, in fact. I want to get to the pier. If we don't, Lilith will only charge through the town searching for us. And we'll end up rescuing her, Lorraine said. Again! Jones gestured to an alley that I was seventy percent sure led north. On one side was a terraced house with an architecturally out-of-place window overlooking the alley. Bracketing it on the other side was a detached cottage with a garden wall two feet higher than the terrace's window. The wall, made of cheap yellow brick, looked as new as the window. What was it Robert Frost said about fences and neighbours? I muttered. Something metal rattled behind us. I spun around, but the road was empty. A cairn? Caught in the breeze? Shalto asked. What breeze? Maybe it's a cat, Lorraine suggested. We eyed the apparently empty road behind us, then the narrow alley in front. It widened after twenty feet, but then curved out of sight as it ran behind the houses. There's another way, Jones said, gesturing eastwards. The mutual good humour we'd shared at being outside and heading towards safety evaporated as we passed a car that had crashed into the front of a knitting shop. The ripe smell of rotting wool was added to that of the dead city. More windows were broken in the houses along the road, making me wonder about the cluster bombs that had fallen on Anglesey, and whether any had struck Bangor as well. We reached a junction, and took a left, following the very welcome sign pointing towards the pier. After fifty curving erratic yards, we came to a blue-windowed orange-brick building, about a hundred metres long and three storeys high. Another university building? Sholto asked. Undergrad accommodation, Jones said. That's all? he asked. What do you mean, all? Can't you see the door? There's a lock on it. We crossed the road, getting near enough to the building that I could see the bicycle D-lock running through the door's handles. There's really nothing but student rooms inside? Sholto asked. Nothing, Jones said. So why lock it? Lorraine asked, glancing up at the dark windows. I mean, what's the loot from a student room? Everything, I said. It makes sense when you think about it. A student arrives with their possessions in suitcases. There are no fridges in the rooms, right? So the only things they buy, aside from digital downloads, are a few more clothes, snacks, drinks, and non-perishable sundries. Toilet paper, Lorraine murmured with a touch of wistful longing. Yeah, okay, and the suitcases would still be in the... Wood banged against the D-lock as something slammed into the door. It rattled and shook and opened two inches. Something was pushing, and there was only one thing that could be. Before anyone could shout out and name it, fingers curled through the gap and around the doorframe. Damn it! Lorraine marched up to the door, shoved the barrel through the narrow gap, and pulled the trigger. She'd switched her gun to fully automatic. In a matter of seconds, the magazine was emptied into the building. She stepped back. The door swung closed. That was stupid, Jones said. Maybe, Lorraine said. But it made me feel... A fist beat against wood. Then another. The door shook as the unseen undead kicked, slapped and punched against the door. The hinges shuddered. We should go, I said. Now! I don't know if that door's going to hold. Lorraine had reached the road when the first face slammed into the window. Sholto raised his gaze and the barrel of his gun. He held his fire as the zombie slammed its head into the pane. The glass would be reinforced. By law, student accommodation required a sturdier standard of glass than you could get away with in normal rental properties but it wouldn't withstand a sustained and continuous barrage of face and fist. We walked quickly along the road, and I wished the low wall that separated it from the building was higher. A hand slammed against the window of one of the rooms, then at another ten metres along, and one storey up. There was a rumbling from inside the building, louder than I'd heard from trapped undead before. How many are in there? Lorraine asked. 
giving voice to my own fears. We quickened our pace, but by the time we'd reached the far end of the building, no windows had broken. That door's ching too, Shalto said, sweeping his gun from the door to the windows, but no undead faces peered down at us. The door was secured by a chain with a padlock. Before I could tell whether it was the same make as the one on the faculty building, the door shook, shuddered, and split from top to bottom in a line parallel to the handles. The zombies fell over one another as they found themselves pushing against air. Three, then five, then ten tumbled outside. There were more behind, a bobbing wave of heads and arms. The rain opened fire. A rifle was still set to fully automatic. Bullets sprayed into flesh and brick. The recoil raised the rifle's barrel. The last two rounds hit the windows above and to the right of the door. Glass shattered, raining down on the undulating pile of zombies squirming to get to their feet. A moment later, glass was joined by a falling creature as a zombie toppled through the broken window. Sholto fired a shot, and then another, and then more, with barely half a second between each. Jones joined in. Bill, watch the ones on the ground, she said, sending a shot into the long, dark hallway. Lorraine, eyes on the window. Lorraine loaded a fresh magazine and turned her shaking barrel towards the broken window. They fired shot after shot into the mass of undead, pushing and squirming their way outside. I didn't think it was going to work. Fists pounded against glass at almost every window. The zombies outside were slowly pulling themselves apart and to their feet. I'm going in, I yelled, and darted forward, spearing the pike into the face of a prone, partially trampled creature crawling towards us. Only when I darted back a pace and the firing resumed did I realize they'd paused. It could work. No, it was going to work. The zombies were like fish in a barrel. Their numbers made them an easy target. The rifle's high rate of fire made it merely a question of whether we had enough ammo. Another zombie pushed itself to its feet. I'm going in, I yelled again, and again slammed a spear into a rotting face. No more had appeared at the broken window. The twice-dead creatures inside the doorway were forming a barrier, slowing down the zombies behind. Dim daylight at the far end silhouetted hands and arms, and I was sure there weren't as many as before. Hold your fire, I barked. I stabbed a spear at an necrotic head, pulled it back, then hacked down on the skull of a creature unable to stand. I stepped back and let the firing resume. It was going to work. I was sure of it, right up until I looked around. Run! I yelled. Run! They were coming up the road down which we'd walked. Rank upon rank, a dozen wide, and I don't know how many deep. The firing slackened. Lorraine! The pier! Run! Jones called, grabbing the woman's arm and dragging her a step. Sholto switched aim, firing a shot into the undead column. A zombie spun back, but I don't think the bullet hit its head. It didn't matter. There were a hundred at least, and perhaps the same number inside the building. I could see daylight, I said as I limped. My brother jogged away from the building. What? Daylight, I said. It was silhouetting their hands. The door at the other end broke. I should have realized. Doesn't matter now, he said turning around and firing twice, it surely doesn't matter. What if the boats are gone? I asked Jones when we caught up. She and Lorraine had slowed their run to a walk. They won't, Jones said, tracking the rifle along the dark windows of the houses to our left. Simon and Lilith won't leave. But what if they had to? I insisted. This was the plan, Jones said, training the rifle on the houses to the right. We go into the city and lure the zombies to the pier. That's why they're building a barricade. You might have mentioned that we were playing bait, Shalto said. We're always playing bait, Jones said. Always will be right up until we die. This road was wider, wide enough that I felt confident calling it a road, not an alley. Cars were actually parked outside most houses, 
rather than just lining the curb where they'd been dumped. Most of the homes were detached, with old stone walls and wooden fencing to offer a modicum of privacy. This was the plan, I asked, glancing back down the road. The zombies were following as thrashingly fast as they could, but there was an easy hundred yards between us and them. Not quite this, Jones said, but more or less. It takes a day to bring a boat over, another day to empty somewhere and bring the loot to the shore. We can't afford the time to salvage goods as and when we need them. We have to be systematic. Take a large group, empty a large building, fill up a large boat, and all those rafts we were going to take to Belfast. Do it once. One week, one city, and then leave the ruins to the undead. Nice to be kept in the loop, Shalto said, raising his rifle. I don't think he fired, but I saw three zombies and the lead rank trip and fall to be trampled by those coming behind. Broad beans, Lorraine said. I think that's right. I turned to look. We were passing a house with a six-foot pine fence behind a low wall, trailing over the top were a few broad leaves. Make a note, I said returning my attention to the road. The zombies were a hundred and fifty yards away. They weren't slowing. We'll come back to check it later. There was a sigh, a crack. I spun around as the fence broke. Lorraine raised her hand to shield her eyes as splinters flew from the fracturing wood. A zombie lurched through the gap and over the wall. It landed face first on the road, but its outstretched arm caught on Lorraine's leg. She fell, losing her grip on her rifle. I skipped forward, kicking at the prone creature's skull, pushing it over before stabbing the pike down two-handed. You okay? I asked. Lorraine clutched her leg. I saw the blood. Fine. I'm immune. Hurts, though. There were three wheels on her leg and the creature's clawing hand. I dropped the pike, grabbed her arm and pulled her up. Can you walk? Do I have a choice? Jones raised her gun, firing through the broken fencing and into the garden. I didn't see the zombies, but I saw her expression and didn't need her bark command of move to know we had to hurry. You should draw that, she said, as we limped away. What? Your gun! Again I'd forgotten the pistol was even there. The sound of the sea told us we were getting close as did the presence of the zombies. It was one, then two, then four, then more. All had been shot in the head, some with multiple wounds in the chest or limbs. We gave a pub with a corpse sagging from a broken window a wide berth and saw the sea. We'd reached the headland on which the pier jutted out into the strait, just where the road curved sharply to the left as it followed the coastline, Cars and vans had been pushed together to form a quarter-circular ring. Pub tables and house furniture had been piled up between the vehicles, on the roof of which stood Simon, Lilith, and the rest of the crew. In their hands were rifles, and in front were at least fifty bodies that were a testament to how they'd been used. Simon gave a curt wave, and then continued his scanning of the road behind us. The brevity of the acknowledgement was enough to make us hurry as we picked our way through the corpses. Hands reached down to help us up the side of a blue panelled van. About two hundred, Jones said, coming this way, two minutes behind. Hear that? Simon called out. Ripped your trousers? He added, speaking to Lorraine. Really? She said. I hadn't noticed. Where are the bandages? With the ammo. Lilith gestured towards the pier. Would you mind? She asked me before giving Simon a glare. I helped Lorraine down and towards the pier. Ammunition, spare rifles, first aid kits, a crate of water bottles and what I assumed was food had been unloaded and neatly stored near the secured boats. There, bandages, Lorraine said. Can you look for some disinfectant? It'll be in a purple bottle. Purple? Here. I said, holding up a litre bottle. Purple for disinfectant, she said, splashing it on her leg. Green or blue for drinking water, and never mix the two up. 
Something else we should have been told earlier, I murmured. Then the firing began. Sholto and Jones had taken up positions at either end of the line. Lilith and Simon were in the middle. The others were on roofs of cars and vans in between. Except for Simon, they were all kneeling. I couldn't see what they were aiming at, but I could hear it. That low, snuffling, rustling, groaning noise grew in volume until it drowned out the sound of the waves. The suppressed shots were inaudible, as were the falling bodies, so there was no way of gauging how the battle was progressing. I need your hands, Lorraine said. Can you hold the bandage? What? Sorry. I held the fabric as she taped it off. Right. Help me up. <sighs> Thanks. She tested the leg. Pass me a rifle and grab that bag of ammo. There were ten spare SA-80s stacked on the pier. I slung one on my back, and she did the same, one hand supporting her, the other carrying the bag of preloaded magazines. I helped her back to the barricade. Sholto was kneeling on the roof of a battered white hire car, firing shot after shot into a dense mass of the undead. I don't know if he was aiming, but there were plenty of targets. I had a strong desire to unsling the rifle and empty the magazine into that hideous pack. But I knew at least one of my weaknesses. More than that, the lesson Kim had taught me back in Longshank's manner was vividly clear. Bullets are heavy. You're limited to what you can carry. In this case, we were limited to what had been brought from Anglesey. In turn, that was limited to what had been scavenged from depots and supply dumps over the last few months. I'm out, Sholto called. I grabbed a magazine from the bag, passed it to him, and placed another two next to his foot. He reloaded, and I moved on to the next shooter. Car to van to van to car, I limped along the line, passing out ammunition, only occasionally looking at the undead. I saw some heads bursting apart as bullets impacted square on. More zombies fell or pitched backwards, and some of those pushed themselves back to their feet. The old, the young, and those too wizened to tell. Some wore rags coated in mud, others looked more recently turned. I walked the line, passing out ammo, trying to think of them as creatures, as monsters, as never having been human, because there was no point adding that weight of guilt to our souls. I reached Jones, and had only one magazine to pass to her. The nearest zombie was sixty yards away when it folded in on itself. I returned to the pier, grabbed another bag, and returned to the line, passing out ammunition until I was once more standing behind my brother. The closest zombie was forty yards away, with five almost in a wedge right behind it. I unslung the rifle, thirty-five yards. Three zombies fell, but there were more behind, and that lead creature staggered on. I balanced the rifle on the roof of the car. Ammunition was precious, but lives were more so. I took aim. Jones's plan had failed. Hundreds of zombies were dead, but hundreds more were left and thousands more would come. This wasn't just a few score trapped inside that student housing block, but the undead from the entire city. Soon they would be joined by others from the surrounding countryside. I could imagine the horde travelling through Wales like a spear, of which this pack was only the tip. I pulled the trigger. I'd forgotten the safety. By the time I found it, the zombie was down. But there were more behind. There would always be more. There would never be enough bullets, enough people, enough time. I shifted the barrel, aiming at a corpulent creature in the remains of an ankle-length leather jacket. We could empty Bangor. But to what end? To gather enough supplies to last us through the winter. But what about the spring? What about all the coming years? I pulled the trigger. The zombie shuddered as half a dozen bullets smacked into its arms and chest and legs. I searched for the selector switch and flipped it to single shot. I picked another target a limping woman in a ragged T-shirt for a band I never liked. I fired. 
The woman staggered back two paces, and then came on. I fired again, again she staggered. Again she came on. I fired again, two shots in quick succession. I've got it, Sholto said. He fired. She fell. And I realized I'd heard the shot. I'd heard his voice. The sound of the undead had diminished. It hadn't stopped. They were still there, coming up the road, but the nearest was sixty yards away, and the column had become a ragged line. I stood, watching, counting. There were forty-eight between us and the pub, forty-seven, forty-six, then forty-nine, as another three came into view. Amel, I'm out! A woman barked. I hurried over, and then went up and down the line passing out ammo until the bag was empty. I passed by Jones, watching the road. The firing was sporadic now, the zombies a thin trickle. I'd say, Simon called out, but then paused to fire a shot. A partially scalped zombie missing its left arm slumped forward, but didn't fall. Damn! Simon fired again. It collapsed. I'd say, he continued, that was a good plan successfully executed. I wouldn't, Jones said. She's fire everyone except Lilith. It's sniping work for now. The rest of you, pick up the spent cartridges. We can't afford to waste them. More came than I expected, Jones said as we walked across the car park full of bodies. A hand reached up. I hacked the hatchet down. I'd say a thousand, Shalto said. Maybe a few less. Lilith says eight hundred. Joan said, and she has a good eye for this. You've done it before? I asked. On a smaller scale, twice, she said. Nothing quite like this. She plunged her bayonet through the eye of a twitching creature, and we used up nearly five thousand rounds. That much? The zombie immediately in front of me was missing half its jaw. From the mud caked around the two remaining upper teeth, it hadn't been shot away. The creature wasn't moving, but with no obvious brain injury I didn't want to take a chance. I chopped the axe at its head. Eight hundred dead for five thousand rounds. How much ammo do you have left? Sholto asked. I'm not sure, Jones said. Not enough. We had just over two million five point five six millimeter cartridges the only time anyone did a count. That was back in May after we found a military supply dump down near Exmoor. Everyone who goes out into the wasteland takes a rifle and a couple of hundred rounds. They rarely bring any back. Often they don't even bring the rifles. How many are left? A million rounds less? I don't know. Personally, I've got forty-eight thousand. Less what we fired today. But it wasn't going to be enough was left unsaid. We must have cleared the town, I said. That'll make looting it easier. Maybe for today, she said. Who knows how many tomorrow will bring. She lunged down, spearing a zombie that had half raised its arm. She opened her mouth to say something else, shook her head, and closed it again. Tide's turning, Lilith said, coming up to join us. She had a rifle raised, the barrel tracking back and forth with an easy professionalism. While I was picking up a few fistfuls of spent cartridges, I'd watched her snipe at the undead. She'd done it with a completely blank expression, as if she was forcing her mind to be elsewhere. Now her face was tight-lipped and taut, as if she was barely keeping her emotions in check. We'll send a boat back, Joan said, with Bill, Sholto, and Lorraine. She could have that leg properly seen, too. And you two can get those satellites working. When you do, I want one of the phones over here. You're staying? I asked. Of course. We've got to empty the— Zombie! Lilith said, the barrel coming up. Wait, I said. Why? I need to practice, I said. And as grim a truth as it is, we've not got the ammo to waste it on the range. It was clear Lilith didn't like it. I'll admit I didn't either, but it was true. Get it over with, Jones said. I raised the rifle and took aim. The zombie wore jeans covered in mud below the knees, 
and a red T-shirt a size too small. A ragged beard came halfway down its neck with hair just as long and greasy, hanging lank from its head. As it raised an arm, I saw half a handcuff on its wrist. I breathed out, held it. Stop! Sholto pushed the barrel up just as my finger curled on the trigger. The bullet flew up towards the clouds, but the shout hadn't come from my brother. It had come from the zombie, except it wasn't a zombie. It was a man, a survivor, and he collapsed in the road. Relax, Lilith said. You didn't shoot him. It's dehydration. She held the water bottle to the man's lips. The man's eyes flittered. You're safe. Sholto said. The man croaked something inaudible and raised his hand to tilt the bottle. Water splashed on the dirt around his face. Dehydration exposure, Lilith said. Exhaustion? Malnutrition, maybe, but nothing serious. Nothing contagious? Jones asked. Unlikely, Lilith said. No lice, either. Get into the boat, Jones said. He wasn't heavy. Together, Sholto and I helped him to the barricade. It took four of us to get him over. The man kept getting in his own way, twisting and turning, trying to take in each face as if he couldn't believe any were real. Thank you, thank you, the man said, as we sat him down on the barricade's far side. You're safe, I said. My name's Bill. 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 He repeated the syllable, as if trying to remember if people were called that. What's your name? I asked. Name? Name? Llewellyn. Llewellyn? Nice to meet you, Llewellyn, I said. David. David? David Llewellyn? I asked. David Llewellyn, he echoed as if it had been a long time since he'd heard his own name. You're from Wales? Sholto asked. Llewellyn shook his head. From everywhere, he said. Went everywhere, Oxford, Blythe. Couldn't go to Scotland. Went south. Went east. Went west. Here. He reached into his pockets, searching for something, then triumphantly pulled out a sheet of paper. Here! Here, Anglesey, see? It's one of George's maps, Jones said. The ones they leave in the safe houses with the instruction to come to Anglesey. Anglesey! Llewellyn echoed. Well, you found it, I said. We're going back there. Taking a boat over then, you'll be safe. It's a safe place. No zombies. No dangers. No zombies? No zombies. He shook his head. I looked down at his wrist, and the half a handcuff still attached. What? How did that happen? They left me, Llewellyn said. I got bit. They chained me up. I didn't turn. I haven't turned. I'm not one of them. I'm not a zombie. Not a zombie. Not! Sure, of course, I said, trying to calm him down. I glanced up at my brother. Can you do anything about that? Easily, he said, and took out his lockpicks. A moment later the cuff was removed. Llewellyn stared at his wrist, and then broke into tears. Chapter 6 The 20th of August, Day 161 Daisy wasn't happy to be back at school. She clearly wanted to be in Menai Bridge, close to Pierre, and his endless supply of fresh-baked biscuits. I wasn't happy either, though my irritation was at having to wait for George Tull and Mary O'Leary. In the flurry of activity surrounding David Llewellyn's arrival, I'd almost forgotten about the body we'd found at the university. Almost. I told Mary and George, and after the briefest of ruminations been told we'd discuss it the next day. As Sholto had disappeared to set up the sat phones, I'd spent an evening alone with my thoughts, and was unhappy with the conclusions I'd reached. I picked up a book, put it down, 
and spent a few minutes watching Daisy and the other children moving different shaped bricks from one bucket to another. Dr. Umbert explained it was an exercise in socialization and sharing. I thought it was pointless, but truly didn't care. Outside in the corridor, I could hear the class of five to eight-year-olds giggling as they applied paint to the wall. They were making a giant chart that had something to do with weather patterns. It was uplifting and depressing at the same time. There were a few classes of older children constructing weather balloons out on the field next door. Objectively, it was a truly educational activity that was useful to the community. However, coming into the school that morning... I had seen almost every one of the under-fifteens on the island, and that had been a reminder of how few there were, as well as of how far away Annette currently was. It would be easy to say it was a product of the undead we'd seen the day before, and the undead children that had been among them, but part of it was the gnawing uncertainty surrounding the body we'd found in the university. My eyes tracked to the window. When I saw George pushing Mary's wheelchair into the playground, I went over to talk with them. The vehemence on its way back, George said, before I could open my mouth. It's had to turn around. Why? I asked. Not too sure, he said, helping Mary out of her wheelchair. The signal wasn't great. It's either a problem with the submarine's pumps, or they've got all hands to the pumps I couldn't work out which. It'll be back here in a couple of days. There's nothing we can do about it, and probably no way we can repair it. Does it change anything? I asked. Well, now, Mary said, taking a faltering step, that's the question, isn't it? And one we can't answer until we know how bad the damage is. There's no point fretting and speculating, since we'll know when it gets back and there's plenty for us to worry over in the meantime. Ah, looks like we have takeoff. She jutted her chin towards the field, where three small balloons rose into the air. After ten feet, one began drifting sideways and down. Two out of three, not bad, Mary said. Now, Mr. Wright, what's got you looking so worried today? Where to begin, I said. Perhaps with a body at the university? What are we going to do about it? We can't bury him, she said tottering onward, her hand a vice on George's arm, her eyes fixed to the red-painted line at the end of the playground. If we brought the body here, it would only announce to the island what you'd found, and we can't do that until we know precisely what you found. That's what I meant, I said. That's what we need to discuss. Really? She glanced at George. No matter what some of us think we've learned from television, we're not police, we're not investigators, we know nothing about forensics. We are intelligent people, I said. We have read books and, yes, watch TV shows. You have a kindred spirit, George. Next time you want company to watch one of those dreadful films, you should ask him. Mary said, then said no more until she'd managed another five slow steps, and the tip of her shoe touched the red line. I'm sure the sigh of relief was involuntary, because it was caught halfway out of her mouth. She breathed in, then out, and turned around. Her eyes narrowed as if she was marking her wheelchair as a target. We talked about this last night, George said, and we've talked about problems like this before. This has happened before? I asked. No, George said, not exactly. There have been a few fights and we've dealt with those using military tribunals presided over by Mr. Mills. But that's neither democratic nor appropriate. The one advantage of everyone keeping to themselves and to their boats is that for the most part there's not been enough contact between people for crime to occur. I found bodies out in the wasteland, people who were killed, who definitely were people, not zombies. You wrote in your journal that you saw the same. That's far away and not an immediate concern. Other than a few disappearances, which are more likely to be suicides or accidents, this is the closest to home that a serious incident has come. We can manage taking fingerprints, 
Mary said, as she took a faltering step. But against what samples could we cross-check them? Or should we take the prints of everyone on the island? We can't do that without telling people why. And what if the killer wore gloves? DNA is useless to us. Dr. Knight says she can perform an autopsy, though she's never done one before, and so can't guarantee she'll do it thoroughly. But let us imagine we found an unambiguous clue. What was it you said last night, Mr. Wright, that there is probably a tragically innocent explanation for this? But in the darkness of that corridor, with blood pumping through their ears, a person was mistaken for a zombie and the error not noticed until it was sadly too late. Yes, I said that, but what if I'm wrong? That's the worry that kept me up half the night. Welcome to our world, Mary murmured. She stopped, three feet from her wheelchair, and turned around. We'll never know if we're wrong, she said, leaning more heavily on George as she began another lab, because if we get it wrong, if we get anything wrong, we'll be dead. I walked next to them, in silence. The burden of responsibility was visible in each of the old woman's laboured steps. I could sympathise, but I couldn't let my fears go. What if it does happen again? I asked. Good question, George said. What's the answer? What would you do? I'd start by trying to identify the body, I said. Wrong, George said almost gleefully. Mary sighed. We're on the last lap, George, she said. Nope, George said. We're to do five more today. Three, she counted. Three now? but you'll do the other two later, George said with a finality that wasn't usually in his tone. Three now, one later, and no more of those space movies. We'll watch the film about Queen Victoria tonight. George took a moment to weigh that up. Agreed, he said, though with an edge of reluctance. Why am I wrong? I asked. Surely the first thing in any investigation is to find out who the victim is. That was my first instinct, George said. But Mary's right, we're not cops. A detective might inquire about the victim's identity, while the coroner carried out an autopsy, and the lab techs analyzed the dirt under the fingernails and all the rest. We don't have any of those people or their skills. Let's say that our worst fears are correct. Let's imagine this isn't an accident. That makes it murder and all we have to go on is that Lorraine saw two of them at the inn. Everyone goes through there, so it doesn't mean much, but it might mean a lot. If we go there and ask, they'll deny knowing them, or they might even confirm it. They might thank us finding their long-lost friends. That won't help us work out what happened. So what do we do? I asked. We have to do something. Go back to your original question. Mary said. We want to prevent it happening again. To do that we need laws. We need judges. We need police, I said. You can't give an old man a magnifying glass and call him a detective, Mary said, in what was clearly another dig at George. In the same way, you can't give a man a rifle and call him a soldier. But training a detective is easy. Training a judge. Creating laws. That is a lot harder. Without them we'll end up with a despotism that Quigley desired. What was the point of struggling against him if we throw democracy away now? Judges? I didn't think there were any, I said. I spent my morning going through the records we've made of the people arriving here, George said. I've drawn up a list of people who said they used to be lawyers. It's civil law, for the most part, and so far only one solicitor who actually practiced in England. Since we haven't decided whose laws we're going to use, that doesn't matter. I'll start interviewing them later. What will you tell them? I asked. Not that there's been a murder, surely. No. I said we're putting together a group who could write a constitution, George said. The longer I spent on Anglesey, the greater my appreciation was for the work this old couple had done. On the surface, the lack of working farms and nascent industry 
gave the impression of idleness. Certainly that was my first impression, but it was only accurate to a degree. Simply holding things together thus far, preventing the survivors from taking their boats and scattering to the four winds, from raiding the grain ships or simply stealing from one another, had been achieved mostly through force of will. Their will. I'm not sure I could have managed it. Sure, I might have thought I wanted a formal militia of thousands to descend on towns like Carnarfon. The battle in Bangor had made me see the truth. There would never be enough people for us to reclaim the mainland from the undead. Clearing a city so we could scavenge its remains was as much as we could hope, and almost more than we could achieve. Start with the judges, I said, and the lawyers, but we'll still need laws. And police, and so much else, Mary said. But we have to start somewhere, and the best place to start is with what we have. This is the last lap, George. Do one and a half more, he said, and we'll watch another episode of that Jane Austen thing. Come on. If I can manage to sit through an hour of that, you can manage another few steps. I'm not sure I can, she said but took step after step regardless, only pausing when Sholto walked into the playground. His shoulders were slumped, his eyes heavy. He looked like he hadn't slept. What's wrong? I asked. It's gone, he said, collapsing onto the picnic table's bench. What has? Mary asked, gratefully easing herself down into her wheelchair. Crossfield's landing, he said. He pulled a tablet from his pocket. On the screen was an aerial view of a ruined coastal village bisected by two roads. In the top corner of the screen was what looked like a wrecked helicopter. Those look like figures, like people, I said. They're zombies, Sholto said. He swiped the screen. The image was replaced by an almost identical one. All that had changed was that a pair of figures had moved northward. He swiped it again. One of the zombies had drifted south again. There's no video, Mary asked. Just stills, Sholto said. The satellite's primary purpose wasn't surveillance, but for transmitting communications. There's a camera for photographs. I guess you could program it to take multiple images per second, but I don't know how, and it doesn't matter. The village is a ruin. You see that shell? That was Jimmy's restaurant. I took the tablet and began cycling through the images. There's no smoke, I said, so it didn't happen recently. Well, there's little comfort in that, he said. No, but there might be in this, I said. Didn't you say it was a fishing village, but they had boats? Sure. There are no boats in the harbor, I passed back the tablet. See? He stared at the screen. They got out, I said. That doesn't mean they're alive he said. No, but there's no reason to assume they're dead, Mary said. If we're agreed on that, then perhaps we could focus on the almost miraculous news that you got the satellites to work. How many are there? George asked. Three, Shalto said. The same three I had access to at the beginning of the outbreak. One is over Crossfield's Landing, the second is over New York, and the third is orbiting the Atlantic in an odd pattern that brings it almost overhead. Those must be the positions that Jimmy set up. He looked at the screen again, idly swiping back and forth between the two images. What's New York like? I asked, not really interested but wanting to get his mind off the fate of his friends. It's still there, he said, tapping at the screen. There, that central park. He passed me the tablet. It looks wild, I said. Manhattan wasn't hit with a nuke, Shalto said, but you can make out the buildings that have collapsed. I think a fire must have swept through the Upper West Side. That's where I met... He trailed off, the sentence unfinished. Not all news is welcome, George said, but it's always better to know. Now, can we alter the orbits? Until we use up the propellant, Sholto said. Can we download what they've seen over these last months? Mary asked. Only for the last forty-eight hours. There's virtually no data storage. 
We need images of the nearby coast, Mary said. That should be our priority. Then the mainland, and we want images of Belfast, too. We will? Why? I asked. Before Donny escaped from there, he was sure there were fuel tankers lined up near the airport, Mary said, and helicopters by the runway. If they're still there, we could use them. Pass me the tablet, thank you. I thought we were getting oil from Svalbard, I said. Even if there is oil on Svalbard, George said, we've no way of bringing it south except in barrels strapped to the deck. It'll be a slow, laborious process. Then we'll have to find the ships that can burn it. Most of the boats here run on diesel. We have those grain carriers, but they require a mile to stop and further to turn. It's the helicopters that are the real prize, Mary said, swiping from one image to the next. We can use those to get rid of the undead. What's this? On the screen was a photograph that must have come from the front page of a newspaper. There was something about the stands and smiles that said the people had endured a dozen variations of the same pose. I know her, George said, peering at the screen. That's Kempton, the billionaire, right? Yeah, that's her, Shalto said. The picture was in a local paper about a year ago. I'm more interested in what's behind the group, Mary said. Those are wind turbines, aren't they? And solar panels on the roof of that building. Are those electric cars? Where is this? It's a fifty-acre farm on the Atlantic coast of Ireland, Shalto said. Kempton ran it as an experiment in combining organic farming with modern technological techniques, as part of a far-reaching plan to combat the impending global food crisis. And that's what the article says. The guy to her right, he's the local TD. He wanted to burnish his tech credentials by being in close proximity to her, the job she was creating in his constituency and the foreign exchange she bring into the Irish exchequer. So why is it on the tablet? George asked. It took an age to get the software to load, Shalto said. I was browsing through the other files I sent Bill, particularly those on the cabal behind the outbreak. This was part of the dossier I put together. Kempton bought a fifty-acre farm and equipped it with solar panels and wind turbines, and a bid to make it completely self-sufficient. It was her retreat, her hideaway, in case the U.S. collapsed. It's an odd place to have one, since Ireland had close ties to America. It means that she wasn't worried about extradition. I think she foresaw that some part of Archangel and Prometheus could go wrong, and wanted somewhere remote, but not too remote, to weather the storm. A little more digging discovered other, similar locations in New Zealand, Mauritius, and Micronesia. There were hints in a discretionary budget that suggested more, but I stopped digging. I knew she was involved in a conspiracy, and I was looking for some leverage on her, but this wasn't going to be it. Those are electric cars, aren't they? I said, electric cars, wind turbines, and solar panels. You say it's close to the coast? I think so, he said. The article mentions someone's sea view being obstructed by the turbines. Ireland, Mary said wistfully. My heart yearns to return, though my bones won't. My soul forever resides there. If we're sending an expedition to Belfast, she trailed off and stared at the sky. Ireland's smaller population should mean fewer zombies than on the British mainland. Less radiation as well? I'm not sure, Shalto said. The targeting data I required before the outbreak doesn't match the location the bombs actually fell. Then it's possible, Mary said. And with the satellite data, we could know in a few days. Ireland. Yes. We'd need a base from which to survey it. If the turbines still stand and those solar panels still work, this might be it. If it's not tenable... We could bring those electric cars and solar panels back here. What about the turbines? George asked. The ones on Anglesey were all wrecked. He tapped the screen. I reckon with a bit of scaffolding and a bit more time, we could take them apart. Kempton's turbines wouldn't generate enough electricity for more than a few dozen homes, I said. Enough for the farm and two hundred and forty homes, Shalto said. 
It says so in the article. I think that was the sweetener to get her scheme past the planning authorities. She provided electricity for the three villages nearest the property. Two hundred and forty. That's with old world usage, I said. So for us, perhaps a thousand people. Maybe fifteen hundred. It'll be a start, George said. We need to make provision for when the nuclear plant is shut down. Well, yes, I said. But turbines are only of use if the wind's blowing. And Kempton would have known that, Mary said. If she really planned to survive the apocalypse in that house, then there would be some system to store the energy against a windless, sunless day. If she didn't, what does it matter? We can survive a few days without electricity. We've all done it before. The inconvenience of having no electricity on a calm day is far less troublesome than the risk of a meltdown. Perhaps, I said, but it won't be enough electricity. If we want wind turbines, we'd be better off going to Hull. The factory there was one of the biggest in the world. They made them for the offshore farms, the kind where a single turbine could power a small town. A few of those would more than suit our needs. Since they were destined for the sea, the faculty is right on the docks. They'd have cranes and other equipment for loading them onto barges. We could take a boat there, put a team ashore, and get a turbine loaded far quicker than building scaffolding to dismantle those. Not now we couldn't, Mary said. We're barely able to move something larger than a golf cart, but it's worth investigating. As is Ireland, we don't want all our eggs in one basket. There you are, Thaddeus. We need images of Hull, Belfast, and of this house. Satellites, George murmured. Instant communication and images of the world. There's a lot we can do with that. There is, indeed. Come on, Mary. One more lap. No arguing. And you lads, you've got work to do. We've all got work to do. Mary offered a pro forma protest as George helped her back to her feet. I passed the tablet back to my brother. He swiped at the screen, returning to the image of the ruined village. We have electricity, he said. Replacing nuclear with wind won't fundamentally change anything. True, I said, but a journey to somewhere like Hull might. Who knows what we'll find along the way? Not me, he said. There's only one place I'm going. But the question is whether I then go north or south, or rather it's a question of which way they went, and how long ago. Chapter 7 Elysium, The Republic of Ireland 1800 hours, the 20th of September, day 192 It's getting dark. I don't want to waste the torch's batteries on writing, so I'll leave the account there for now. That was how I first met Lilith, Will, Simon and Rob, and how we first learned that this house was here, on the Atlantic coast of Ireland. Quite where the zombies outside came from is a mystery. When Sholto did get a few satellite images of this estate, it appeared intact and unoccupied. That's the problem with satellite images. You've only got a top-down view. One of those barns in the middle of the farmland must be an open-sided structure, and the undead must have been gathered inside. Or perhaps it's something more prosaic. I've seen them swipe at birds before. Perhaps they chased the animals to the trees, and the bushy canopies hid the zombies from view. Whatever the reason, it hardly matters. I saw Kim in the window of the house a few minutes ago, and we waved at one another. The zombies are beginning to settle down. Perhaps by morning they'll have stopped moving and then Kim will start shooting. Even if more is summoned from the surrounding countryside, Kim has the radio. By now she'll have called Lilith and Will, and they'll have used the sat phone to call Anglesey. Reinforcements may already be on their way. No, I'm not worried. If anything, I'm bored. It's... Call that stupidity, arrogance, or forgetfulness. Call it all three... Having spent so much of the past month with other people and so little of it out here in the wilderness, I'd forgotten that danger lurks in every dark corner. I wasn't alone here in the garage. 
I'd asked Rob to check it was empty, and assumed he'd done it. I guess he'd given it as cursory a glance as I had. Well, you know what they say about assumptions. This one almost got me killed. I was mid-sentence when I heard a sound far closer than the inhuman racket outside. I dropped the pen, grabbed the pike, and went to stand at the office's doorway. The garage was pitch black. Because of the solar panels on the roof, there are no skylights. There's a bank of concealed spotlights in the ceiling, but of course they're dark. The garage's only natural light comes from the floor-to-ceiling sliding glass doors currently covered by the metal shutters. I turned on the torch. It's a cheap two-battery affair with a weak beam that barely stretched further than the second-hand light from the hatch in the roof above and behind me. Like the radio, my miner's lamp is in the pack I lost outside. With a torch held awkwardly in my left hand, flush against the shaft of the pike, I swung the beam left and right, searching for the cause for the sound. The light bounced off the pitted chrome bumper of one of the ancient Rolls Royces, then a discarded toolbox, then something bright blue. Before I could identify that object, a shadow fell across it. I shone the light into the darkness and onto a ragged shadow moving towards me. Old memories came back, and with them came the fear. I pushed it down and forced myself out of the doorway so I'd have room to swing. Not too high, remember the ceiling, I muttered and got a rasping sigh in return. The shadow drew nearer, and I began to make out details. It was five foot seven and hunched over. In life it would have been taller. Probably female, though I couldn't be certain. The trousers might once have been green, and the rotten fleece missing its left sleeve was probably red, except for the peeling logo of a golden, stylized wave. With each lumbering step, its head lolled to the left, as if the muscles in the neck had been partially torn. Its mouth opened and snapped closed, and it was now fifteen feet away. It was time to focus. My actions were familiar to the point of automatic. I lowered my arms, positioning the pike low, ready to hook the blade under its legs. It was a move I perfected out in the wasteland, but that was in daylight. Here, it meant shifting my grip so the light only shone on the zombie's shuffling feet. I could hear the brittle snap of its teeth. I could sense the air move as its arms flailed left and right. All I could see were the stained hiking boots inching closer and closer. I stabbed the pike between its legs, twisted my wrist so the axe-headed blade was parallel to the floor, dragged it back so it hooked behind the zombie's shin, and pull the creature down. As I raised the pike, the light moved with it, dancing across the creature and then about the room. My eyes followed the beam, so I wasn't sure the creature was down until I heard the thump, and then the thuds and slaps as its hands and feet flailed against the polished concrete floor. I actually closed my eyes as I swung the blade up, but opened them as the weapon banged into the low ceiling. Growling with frustration and fear, I flashed the light around until I found its snarling face, and then stabbed the spear point forward. It jerked its head at the last second, and the pike stabbed into its cheek. Skin ripped, muscle tore. I drew the pike back and lunged again, this time smashing the point through its temple. It went limp. As I eased the pike out of its ruined skull, I concentrated on separating the sounds from outside the sheet metal barrier with those that might be closer. As I did, I began doing what I should have done the moment I stepped inside. I took a closer look at my surroundings. I guess it's understandable that Rob hadn't noticed it. After all, neither had I nor had I properly considered the implications of what we'd seen in the photograph Sholto had found. In those pictures, the smiling Lisa Kempton stood in front of four electric cars. In the garage in front of me 
were three ancient Rolls Royces. Behind them were four metal columns, ten inches square and twenty feet apart. I had noticed those during my cursory inspection and filed them away as something structural. They aren't. The garage is built on two levels. The lower level is slightly wider and longer than the ground floor and contains the electric cars and the giant battery transformer for the solar panels and turbines. Access to the lower level is via the vehicle elevator and by a spiral ramp tucked in the corner behind it. The ramp is artfully designed with no guardrail around it. As such, it's just one more patch of darkness in an almost pitch room. I hate ramps. Ladders are the safest. All a zombie can do when it reaches one of those is knock it over with an accidental swipe. Stairs are okay. Zombies can't exactly climb them. By accident they can raise a leg high enough to manage a step. Managing two is a matter of odds, so the higher the staircase, the greater the chance the zombie will trip and fall. They'll still keep on coming, dragging themselves upward, but that makes them an easy target. Ramps are the worst. This one is built in a spiral with a three-meter diameter. It's steep, but that's no impediment to the undead, and certainly not to the creature that was lurching up it. Head, then shoulders appeared above the level of the floor. I took a step back, and then another. As it shuffled upward, I saw it wore the same type of fleece jacket as the one I'd just killed. It took another step forward, and I took another one back, knocking a tray of metal tools off a cabinet. I spun around as they clattered to the floor. Torchlight danced across the room. When I turned back, the zombie was at the top of the ramp. Pike outstretched, the light fixed on its blank eyes. I forced myself forward, its arms raised, its mouth opened, its head tilted back, and I stabbed the pike through its open maw. I twisted the weapon, skewering the point through muscle and flesh and into its brain. For a moment I was supporting its weight, but then it fell, thumping to the ground. I limped back into the office at as close to a run as I can manage. The darkness was filled with the sound of fists battering against the exterior of the metal shutters. I told myself I'd been in far worse situations, but didn't find it comforting. I gave the ladder and open skylight a wistful glance, but that was as much reassurance as I would allow myself. If I needed to retreat, I could, but the roof offered a refuge, not an escape, not with undead outside and below. I turned my face back to the dark room. Face it. Deal with it, I murmured. There's no one but us. We are the help that comes to others. And though no sinews stiffened, my resolve strengthened. I walked to the ramp. The curve was too tight for the pike, and the weapon too awkward to grip while holding the torch. I leaned the weapon against the rear of the nearest Rolls Royce, there to grab if I was forced to retreat. I drew the hatchet raising it up above my head, and began my descent. As the ramp drops below floor level, the sides are covered in transparent plastic. Actually, considering the extravagant folly of this property, it's probably some rare type of glass. The weak beam shone through and down into the lower chamber, picking out motionless lumpen shapes. I let the light linger on one, then another, just long enough to confirm they weren't moving. I was stalling, and I knew it, and knew why, when I heard a shuffling, slithering, snuffling, rising in tempo and volume. I spun the light back onto the ramp as a zombie rounded the curve. Its collar was buttoned, but the shirt was missing a sleeve on an arm that was grasping towards me. Almost without thought, I swung the axe up, batting that arm away. I brought the blade down with a practiced flick, hacking at its skull. With an echoing crack of bone and crunch of brain, the blade bit deep.
deep, the zombie fell, and I pulled the hand axe free. There was a moment when the drip of blood was all I could hear, then that slithering sound came again. I raised the hatchet above my head and forced myself forward, down, into the dark, glistening more than looking, letting reflex take over. I was already swinging as the zombie rounded the corner. I misjudged its height. The axe cracked through bone, sliced through brain, and exited just below its ear. The blade slammed into its shoulder. The zombie fell, tumbling back down the ramp, and took my axe with it. I took a hurried step after my lodged hatchet and slipped on the mess of bone and brain now coating the ramp. A shoved elbow against the glass wall arrested my fall, and the jarring pain that came with it brought clarity to my mind. I had to finish this, and quickly. I drew the snub-nosed pistol from the holster. It felt insubstantial against the darkness. Gun raised, I braced my right hand on my left, which still held the torch. It was a stance I'd seen on TV, and hoped it wasn't done merely for cinematic convenience. Twelve rounds in the magazine, I reminded myself, as I walked soft-footed down the ramp. I could hear the creatures below. I hoped twelve would be enough. At the bottom, I took a step to the right, shining the beam out into the gloom, trying to identify movement among the indistinct shapes. The sound got closer, and it was coming from behind me. The zombie was almost on me before I could turn. I spun to the left, my finger curling on the trigger. Glass shattered and metal plinked as three shots spun into the darkness. The light caught the zombie's open mouth just as its flailing arm hit mine. Torch and gun went flying. Something hit my jaw. Instinct took over. I ducked and rolled into the darkness, drawing the hunting knife from my belt. The light was twenty feet away. It illuminated the dropped pistol, but nothing else. And it was the only light in the room. Something tugged at my arm. The tug became a clawing grasp. I grabbed the arm with my left hand, pulling the zombie close as I stabbed the knife up. The blade sliced through flesh, but the zombie kept moving. I did the same, drawing my hand back to stab again and again, and this time, as it bit deep, I knew I'd got the blade in under its chin. I pushed and twisted, tearing desiccated muscle and ravaged sinew, ramming the knife up through its mouth and into its brain. With one final twist, the zombie went limp. The dead weight was too much, and I had to let go of the knife. Something brushed against my back. I spun around, swinging a fist into the darkness. I hit something soft. The zombie sighed, exhaling a noisome gasp of fetid air. I almost gagged, but kicked out instead. Its hands curled around my arms. I slammed my forehead down and immediately wished I hadn't. I don't know if it did any damage to the creature, but my world spun. We fell, rolling in a blind heap on the floor. I got an arm free, grabbed a handful of lank hair, and slammed its head down on the concrete. It did little damage, but the movement jarred my other arm free. I rolled away and to my feet and ran towards the torch. I grabbed it and then the gun. I brought them up, aimed at the ragged zombie now beginning to stand and fired. Its head blew apart. I limped backwards and didn't stop until I reached the ramp. I waited. Seconds turned to minutes that felt like hours. No more appeared. My heartbeat slowed sufficiently that I could hear the sounds of the zombies outside. And they were the nearest sound. I had to be sure, of course. I had to be certain. I checked each corner, each car, and each of the two doors leading off the main chamber, and that took at least an hour. But I was alone, truly alone in the garage. Exhausted, drained, I limped back up the ramp.
That's when I realized. The noise from outside was louder than before. I'd heard it but not understood. Whatever had caused the zombies downstairs to come up the ramp, those creatures outside had heard the fight. And certainly they'd heard the gunshots. They were battering fists and flesh against the metal shutters more furiously than after they chased me in here. They still are. It's incessant. Chapter 8 Elysium, The Republic of Ireland 0200 hours, the 21st of September, day 193 That was about seven hours ago, give or take. I can't be more precise as my watch was broken during the fight. It was a gift from Annette, an apology of a sort. I suppose it's my own fault for wearing it on this trip. And again, we weren't expecting anything like this. Perhaps I can get the watch repaired. The hand stopped at 6.45. I'd say it's close to 2 a.m. It's dark out there. Not pitch black, there are a few stars, but not enough that I can see the undead. I can hear them. I tried crawling between the solar panels so I could see over the edge, but stopped myself when I realized there was little point. It's not like I'm going anywhere. I tried to get some sleep but each time I started to drift off, the racket from outside seemed to grow louder. The reason I felt able to get some sleep, other than that experience has taught me to grab it when I can, is that just after dusk, I saw a light in the mansion. I've learned a little Morse code over the past few months. I'm not fluent, but I was able to send a simple, Are you there? I got a burst of flashes in return that I couldn't begin to decipher, but the pattern was repeated. Kim and Simon are still there, and they know I'm here. It's enough. I just have to be patient. It's hard. I'm not used to relying on others for rescue. 2 a.m. It might be earlier. It might be later. I've sat up like this on too many nights, waiting for dawn, unable to truly believe it will come. The torch flickered just now. It should be good until daylight. I hope it is. I'm not turning it off. It's silly, isn't it? Childish. I've closed the door leading into the garage, and I'm absolutely certain there are no more zombies inside. Not yet, anyway. If they break through the metal shutters, I'll retreat to the roof and wait for there to be enough light for Kim and Simon to start shooting. Three hours? Perhaps four. And it will all be over. I found a first aid kit in the back of one of the two lockers in the office. The antiseptic wipes were a tad dry, but they did a reasonable job of cleaning my newly acquired cuts and grazes. I'd have liked to wash my hands with water. What I really want is a hot shower, but I can't even have a cold one. I've barely enough water to drink. I've got my water bottle, of course, but that's already half empty. There's no drinking water in the garage, I checked. The taps are dry. The reservoir for the portable pressure washer is empty. Even the bottles of water for the lead-acid batteries have been drunk. I'm pretty sure that was done by the people in the fleeces, the ones who became the zombies I killed. There's no fuel for the Rolls-Royces. I don't know if that was used up by the people who took refuge here. They were probably responsible for draining the batteries of the electric cars in the lower level. I can't say I blame them. They must have been trapped in here, with the car's headlights as their only source of illumination. I think I understand the presence of the ancient rollers now. They were built in the 1950s, and so contained no circuitry for an electromagnetic pulse to fry. It's out of that same fear that the electric cars and the transformer battery are stored in the lower level. I'm pretty certain that the blocky, plastic-coated hardware behind one of the doors downstairs is the battery for the solar panels, as it has the same logo as that of the cars. That explains, in part, how Kempton planned to cope with the issue of electricity on those calm and overcast days. What it doesn't explain is what's behind the second door. 
There are nineteen corpses in there. Not zombies, but people, and all clad in British Army uniforms. Three have been shot in the head, but most look as if they died from wounds to the chest. Taken with everything else I've seen, I think they died just before Prometheus. As such, and there's too much decay to be absolutely certain, but I think those people worked for Quigley. They have no identification discs, and there's something about the cut of the uniform that reminds me of his guards at Caulfield Hall. After the outbreak in New York, Quigley must have sent them here to cover his tracks. That's why he killed all the people working in Lenham Hill, and why he murdered old Lord Masterton, and who knows how many others. In which case I can only assume that Kempton was here at the time. Perhaps she was one of the zombies I'd just killed. It's impossible to tell now. Those soldiers had to have arrived shortly before Prometheus. Kempton and her people fought back and they won. The bodies were moved to that storeroom in the lower level, kept in the hope that evidence would be needed. Then the bombs fell. The bodies were forgotten. At some point soon after the zombies arrived, Kempton's people were chased into the garage. They couldn't escape, and one was infected. Soon, they all were. There are gaps in the story, but it all happened so long ago that the details hardly matter now. All that's important is that there's no ammunition in the garage. There are guns, four automatic submachine guns, of the type I remember seeing at airports. Expensive as illegal in Ireland as they would be in Britain, and utterly useless to me. There are sharpened tools, of course, and an abundance of chemicals with strident cautions about their corrosive effects on skin, but they are just as useless. There's no tunnel to the house, no water, no torch. I didn't even find any spare batteries for this weak little thing. I did find some spare clothes, there were two chauffeur's uniforms and the lockers here in the office. Partly it's the grey colour and the high lapelled cut of the jacket that tells me they were worn by a professional driver, but mostly it's the two caps sitting on the shelf. On the brim is that same golden wave that the fleeces have on their breast. Neither suit is tailor-made, and from the slightly tapered waist and the positioning of the buttons, one was for a woman, the other a man. I can't say why, but I doubt Kempton kept a chauffeur on staff. I bet it was a case of whoever was free would have to wear the uniform. It's given me something clean to wear, and that's the next best thing to a decent wash. The only problem is that the uniform doesn't keep out the chill. Even though the days are hot, and perhaps because they're often cloudless, the nights are getting colder. It's not being trapped here that makes me wish for rain. I have this other fear. Calling it a concern about nuclear winter is 180 degrees wrong. Nuclear summer is closer to the truth, but no more accurate and just as unhelpful. No one on the island can remember any theories that nuclear war might bring about rapid global warming. My own nightmare theory is that because so many of the targets were in or near the sea, the Gulf Stream has been disrupted. I have no way of proving it, and I am almost certainly wrong, but until the wind picks up, the rain pours down, and the first frost settles on the ground, I don't think I'll be able to relax. You see, my fear about the weather is connected to another. Gwen's expedition to Blackpool wasn't the only group who set out. The team that went down to Cornwall only made it a mile inland before the radiation levels spiked and they were forced to retreat. We did get a message back from Chester and Nilda, the two people who went to Hull. They said the radiation level was normal, but we lost contact with them soon after. We lost contact with the group who went to Birmingham after a single cut-short message. That's the fear I'm dancing around the one I can't get out of my mind these last few weeks. We travelled within forty miles of Birmingham during our escape from the undead. 
even when I looked at the maps and the tranquility of our kitchen. I wasn't precisely sure how close to the city we got. Both Dr. Knight and Admiral Gunderson say that none of us exhibit symptoms synonymous with a high dose. But that's not proof. It's why I want the weather to change. I want something, anything, to go back to normal. It's like we've been given a death sentence, but a storm would signal a reprieve. Foolish, I know. But it's hard to be rational in this world. The light flickered again. I don't know how long it is until dawn. It's still dark outside and the zombies are still beating and pummeling at the door. I think the noise might have lessened. I just can't tell. Writing's the only distraction I have, so I might as well continue to distract myself. I did promise Annette I'd write an account of what happened when she was away, but I suppose what happened when she got back is just as important. After all, that was what she wanted, an account of how she saved our little community. Before I can write that, I need to record how it was almost torn apart. Compared with our trip to Bangor, the rest of August was uneventful. Cholto spent his time with the satellite images and with Chief Watts from the vehement. I spent it with Daisy, sometimes at the school and sometimes in Menai Bridge, helping the Duponts and their tabletop garden. All in all, it was pleasant in a way that my entire life before the outbreak hadn't been. I don't know if it was the company, the gardening, or simply being around an increasingly happy child, but I was almost content. All that was missing was Kim, and as the days went by, I came to realize how very much I did miss her. And Annette, of course. Chapter 9 Anglesey, the 1st of September, Day 173 There she is, I said. Can you see her? Daisy looked at me, frowned and followed the line of my finger, squinting at the wide expanse of the harbour. She... Sholto and I stood on the quayside, waiting for Annette and Kim's ship to come in. The vehement was half suspended at the dock to our right. I'd never seen a nuclear submarine up close. Even with hoses sneaking out of the hatches, there was something impossibly elegant about the sub. The closest analogy I could think of was a whale, but this one was beached, stranded, dying. What's the latest from the vehement? I asked Sholto. Since its return, he'd spent his time with their communications specialists, working on the satellites. Aside from trying to calculate how much propellant each had, and whether the orbits were stable, there had been a debate as to whether Kempton satellites could be used to access others still in orbit, at which point in his explanation I usually tuned out. Though we had pictures of the hordes tramping through Britain was as far as my interest went. The problem's spare parts and a lack of a dry dock, he said. If they can affect repairs before the winter storms, then the sub might survive until spring. It'll need a sheltered harbor, or to spend the winter under the waves. It can't stay out here, but right now it can't submerge or be moved. It's a catch-22. Ah, then it's most likely it'll have to be scuttled, I asked. Pretty much which means the Santa Maria won't be able to stray far from Anglesey for the foreseeable future. I'll need to find another boat to take me across to the U.S. How's that search going? Possibly quite well, he said. It's too early to be sure. We found a few likely-looking ships close to shore. The question is whether they floated into the harbor or ran aground. We won't know whether they're seaworthy until we've inspected them. Liverpool might be our best bet. If we get the oil, I murmured, looking back at the approaching shape of the smuggler's salvation. As soon as the boat had reached radio range, a messenger had been sent to our cottage. That was at 4 a.m. The only news beyond that everyone was safe and well was that there was oil on Svalbard. The message was scant on details, and there weren't many more to be gleaned from the radio room when I'd arrived at the school. Daisy and I were getting underfoot, so we'd come to wait. 
first by the bakery, where she'd enjoyed her now customary complimentary second breakfast, and then on the quayside by the old ferry dock. We'll find a ship, I said, and then you can go back to the U.S. Yeah, hopefully before winter. I want to get it over with, he said. I've been looking at the images we downloaded before the satellite's orbits were changed. Towns, cities, villages, countryside. It seems like America is nothing but ash. It's hard to believe it's all gone. Hard, but I've got to accept it's true. It's like Britain, but on a larger scale. The larger population led to more zombies. The larger landmass led to more bombs being dropped. Then there's the borders giving access to the undead from two continents to drift north and south, and, well, I need to go. To stand among the ruins and see and, and know that there's nothing more I can do. If I don't, I'll regret it. And I have too many regrets to add another to the catalogue. And then you'll come back. We'll come back, he said. I'll recruit some people from among the crew of the Harper's Ferry when it arrives. Sailors who know how to fire a gun and know when not to. We'll go, confirm it's as bad as I think, then come back and... And I don't know what happens next. It's hard to predict, isn't it? I said. The smuggler's salvation drew near enough that I could make out the figures standing at the rail. Here we go, I said and began mentally preparing for my speech. It was a good one. I'd spent as much time on it as I had on anything else those last few weeks. I'd rehearsed it, rewritten it, and edited it down to a mere two minutes. It was an unreserved apology and plea for understanding. There were themes and similes, alliteration and epistrophe, litotes and puns, and the moment that the boat hit the shore it was all forgotten. Annette jumped down. She opened her mouth. I hugged her, hard. She broke free and ran up the road. Now that, Kim said, jumping ashore, could have gone a lot worse. Shalto laughed. Daisy looked confused, and I was just heartily glad to have them both back. So, what news from the frosty north? Shalto asked, as the four of us ambled away from the docks in the direction Annette had run. At least three of us ambled while Daisy squirmed in Kim's arms. Well, you're right, it's cold, she said. That's right, Daisy, seriously cold. Have you been to the Arctic? No, I said. Have a centrally heated hotel in Greenland counts, yes, Sholto said. Only if you sleep in the walk-in freezer, she said. I... Daisy reached her hand to Kim's face, as if confirming that she really was there. You are a fidget, aren't you? I'm sorry about leaving and leaving like that, but I hope you don't mind if I say that after a day at sea, the thing I most regretted was not bringing any warm clothes. It's savage up there. The weather, the landscape. There's a beauty to it, but it's a harsh one. Still, I'd always wanted to see more of the world, and now I have. I'm really glad to be home. Me too, I said. Did you hear the news? she asked, brushing over the awkward moment. We heard there's oil in the supply dump, Sholto said, but that's about it. You didn't get the report about Astrid Magnuson? she asked. Who? Ah, Kim said, we really need better communications. We'll be using satellites in future, I said. Seriously? How? she asked. Tell us about Astrid and we'll tell you about the satellites, Sholto said. Who is she? Well, there are survivors on Svalbard, Kim said. You know there's a seed vault there. They kept samples of the plants found across the planet, in case of something apocalyptic. I think the current state of the world counts as that, Sholto said. We could do with some seeds. Unfortunately, we won't find them there, she said. They kept specimens from all over the globe in case a flood or volcano wiped out a species that was critical to the local food chain. The procedure was for those seeds to go to some regional lab where they'd be bred up into planting stock. That would take years. There are no sacks of wheat or banana seeds ready to be sown. In time, sure, we could grow pretty much anything. But not this year or next. But there are people. There are the scientists at the seed vault and the survivors from Longyearbyen. 
a few at-sea sailors whose boats drifted close enough to be saved, and a few refugees from Norway and Finland. And then there's the workers from the coal mine. There's a coal mine? Sholto asked. Oh, yes, she said. There was a Russian mining effort on the archipelago. The politics of that place were weird. Anyway, all told, there were 214 people. They've survived mostly on the rations that were in the supply dump, by using the oil to power the engines of a giant icebreaker. That's being used as a generator to keep the electricity supplied to the seed vault. And they're zealous about that. Astrid Magnusson was the lead scientist in charge of the vault. She says that humanity isn't just people. It has to be ideas. And the idea behind the vault is as important as any work of art. Therein lies our problem. She won't hand over the oil without a power source in return. Specifically, she wants the vehement. Or because of its nuclear power plant. I found myself glancing back towards the harbour, now lost to the curving road. She's out of luck. Did you see it as we came in? I did. What happened? The damage it sustained during the fight with Quigley's submarine was greater than they thought, Sholto said. The repairs didn't hold. It's unlikely to survive being towed far enough out to sea that it can be scuttled, let alone survive the winner. Ah, Kitty, she said. We'll work something out, I'm sure, but it'll take time. One step forward, three sideways, and two back. We always end up somewhere, but never where we thought we'd be. Isn't that the truth? Sholto said. So, if they've survived this long, they've got food? Military rations, seal meat and fish, Kim said. The rations were in the supply dump, along with small arms ammunition and emergency medical supplies. Did you know that the Russians knew about the place? I mean... It was actually set up with their knowledge for any ship that survived the nuclear war, regardless of nationality, to attempt to make it to the Southern Hemisphere. I mean, what's the point of mutually assured destruction if you then create something like that? It's about ratcheting down tensions, I said. Getting rid of the bombs would have made more sense, she said. The more I learn about the politics of the old world, the more certain I am that power drove everyone mad. Anyway... Problems aside, there's another few hundred people. Compared to what we've all done to survive, negotiating the fuel from them won't be impossible. It won't even be hard. I mean, did you notice the woman on the boat? Her name's Nilda. We found her on an almost barren rock out near Iona. She survived the last three months on crabs, roots and water from a stream. She lost her son in Cumbria, made it out and into Scotland. She was chased by a whore, jumped into the sea, only to be rescued by a boat full of survivors from Scotland. Except, they'd all been near Glasgow. They died of radiation poisoning within a few weeks of running aground on that small island. She buried them, actually buried them, and then somehow kept going. It's a miracle she survived this long. But if she can do that, we can negotiate the oil from Svalbard. So that's it, really. There are some details and stories to tell you, but they can wait. What's been going on here? Locally, uh, we've been doing a lot of finger-painting and tormenting the teachers at the school, I said. Isn't that right, Daisy? She gave a slightly suspicious nod. Otherwise, we've, um, well, we've got another survivor here. We were over on the mainland, and he sort of walked right into us. Bill thought he was a zombie. He was about to shoot him. Sholto said. You didn't need to say that, I said. One more survivor and no one's died. Isn't it a shame that counts as good news, she said. What about those satellites you were talking about? Now that's a story that ends with Bill almost shooting poor old David Llewellyn, Sholto said, with a tad too much relish. He began to spin a version of events in which I came across as the quintessential bumbling Englishman that I felt was completely unjustified. Okay, mostly unjustified. His tail stopped as we turned the corner in the road and saw Annette. She was sitting on the boot of a car, half parked in a ditch. Hi, I said. Hey, she said. I wasn't sure what to say next, and neither it seemed did she. Kim and Sholto didn't offer any help. I missed you, 
I said. Oh, okay, she said. There was a long pause before she continued. They have chocolate in Svalbard. They do? I asked, eagerly grasping the olive branch. Was this with military rations? No, I mean chocolate plants, or the seeds, anyway. That's good, Sholto said. What about coffee? Yeah, I guess, she said, as if that was of far less importance. They've got pretty much everything. So we need to build a big greenhouse like they had at Kew, and I leave books on Darwin. You know he used to be really into growing plants? We ambled home, and the conversation matched our pace, drifting from anecdote to joke, from Longyearbyen to Menai Bridge, Borensburg to Bangor. A truce had been declared. All was, if not forgotten, then forgiven, at least for now. I'm really sorry about the way I left, Kim said. I... I think Annette and I were suffering from the same problem. Well, maybe not the same, but we had similar issues. I should have taken her off the boat. But I wanted to leave as much as she. More, really, maybe. I don't know. It's not that I wanted to be anywhere else, or that I didn't want to be here, but I was able to bottle everything up while we were out there in the wasteland. Coming here, all of a sudden being safe, it was too much. Everything came back in a flood. The danger, the violence, the... I... I guess because I was finally truly safe, my subconscious decided it was time to deal with what happened during that time in Longshanks Manor, but then realised it really didn't want to. It's something I do need to talk about, but not now, not today. I won't push, I said. It's just nice having you back, both of you. We turned our collective gaze to the kitchen window. Outside, Sholto and Annette, with Daisy watching from a suspicious distance, were arguing over the best place to position the barbecue. It was a half-oil drum design, and had been quietly rusting in the garden of a house a quarter mile up the road. The two of them had just spent the past hour dragging it back. I can't work out which of them wants to set it up underneath the tree, and which of them is trying to explain that it's not a great place to start a fire, I said. They're getting along, she said. That's good. It's good for him, I said. He's been morose these past few days. It's the satellite seeing images of places that have been destroyed. He holds himself personally responsible. A lot of people on Svalbard felt that way about themselves, she said. It'll pass. Give him time. It really was good to have Kim back. I didn't realise just how much I'd missed her until I had her close again. The debate in the back garden reached its denouement. Sholto dragged the barbecue away from the tree, and Annette headed back across the lawn to the house. She opened the door and stuck her head inside. We're going to start the barbecue, she said, and wanted to know what there is to cook. A good question, I said. I stood and went to the cupboards, opening one and then the next. We've got some rolls, freshly baked this morning. They're already cooked, she said. There's some lettuce. No hot dogs, she asked. Did you go shopping while we were away? Shopping, I asked. There's a baker, so there have to be shops now, she said. Aren't there? What have people been doing? I mean, we were busy working, so why hasn't everyone else been doing the same? Kim laughed. It was a wonderful sound. You're right, she said. If you want to just go online and add some steaks and burgers to the shopping basket, we could have the supermarket deliver it in a couple of hours. That's not funny, she said. It kind of is, I said. Is the lettuce fresh? Kim asked. From the Duponts at Menai Bridge, I said. And they gave us some raspberries and blackberries. You can't barbecue those, Annette said. There's fish, I said. It's not really barbecue food, Annette said. Remember what we talked about, Kim said warningly. Annette scowled and took a deep breath. Fine, we'll have fish, but it won't be the same. Grumbling, she went back outside. She was looking forward to a barbecue, Kim said. I've no idea why. Who are the Duponts? I told her about Menai Bridge, 
and that segued into a discussion of greenhouses and gardens and the state of our own home. It sounds like a nice community, Kim said, and you sound as if you want to move there. This house is great, I said, but we need to be surrounded by people, and you're right, they are an actual community. Are there any children around Annette's age? Ah, no, there's no children at all, I said. Hmm. Before I could ask her why that gave her pause, there was a knock at the door. It was George Tull, out of breath and leaning on his bicycle for support. We, we really need to get some cars, he muttered. What's wrong? Kim asked. Nothing, not really. I, I just overdid it on the road coming up here. The mind is, uh, his will in, but my bones increasingly aren't. You'd better come in and sit down. I said, no, no, there's no time, he said. I'm sorry to trouble you like this, but uh, Mary would like a word. With me? Kim asked. With you and Annette, George said. Call it a debrief, if you like. I'm not sure there's much about Svalbard we could tell her that Miguel or Francois haven't, Kim said. Not about Svalbard, George said. It's Nilda, the woman you found on that island. Why? Kim and I asked in unison. The situation has developed, George said, but I don't want to say any more, not yet. Miguel says you spent some time talking to her. You heard her story, and we'd like your opinion of it. It shouldn't take long. What's going on? Annette asked, coming out to join us. You and I are going back to town, Kim said. There's no rest for the weary travellers, not yet. Would you mind? Taking Daisy with you? George asked. I've got a job for the lads that's not suitable for the young lass. Like what? Kim asked before I could. Like, uh, watching someone, that's all, George said. If you'll take the girls down to the school, Kim, I'll give them their marching orders and come and join you in a bit. Come on, George said when they'd left. We'll walk and talk. You remember that kid, Rob, the one who hangs around Marcus and his lot? From Carnarvon? I asked. Skinny kid with a sword, about twenty, twenty-three years old? Sholto asked. Five-nine, but with thick-soled boots to give him an extra couple of inches. Came from uh, somewhere in northern England, right? That's him, George said. Nilda says the sword belonged to her son. She led a group who took refuge in a school in Penrith. Rob was part of that group. They were overrun. Her son died. She didn't see the death, but Rob did. He says it was zombies, and that there was nothing he could do about it. Thing is, he took the sword. She thinks he killed her son for it. For a sword? Sholto asked. He didn't tell her he had it. Shortly after her son died, they fled from Penrith. In that fight, half the group died. Nilda blames Rob for their deaths. She herself would have died if she wasn't immune. I thought back to our conversation after we discovered the body in the university. We should have organized judges and police, I said. Like so much it had been forgotten amidst the mountain of other pressing tasks. I'm working on it, George said, but that won't help us now. Personally, I think they're both telling the truth. I think Rob saw her son die and took the sword for himself. He kept it hidden because he wanted to keep it for himself. Now, perhaps he stood back and let the kid die. But let's be honest, no amount of forensics will prove it. Whoever else survived Ben Rith, none of them made it here. So it's a case of his word against hers. The rule we have is that what happened out in the wasteland isn't held against you here. I'd like you two to watch him. When Nilda saw Rob, she tried to rip him in two. One of my lads, Chester, pulled her off, and I've got him keeping an eye on her. But if she slips away, this could all end very badly. I can't see how it could end well, Shalto said. Maybe so, George said. Maybe not. Mary's got a few ideas, but for now I'd like to make sure we don't end the day worrying about murder. So watch him. Talk to him. See if he tells you anything that can settle this quickly. 
Where is he? I asked. The inn, George said. Afternoon, gents, Marcus said. I just can't keep you away. The pub was less active than on our previous visit. The stalls outside were vacant, though there were a few people loitering near them, presumably in expectation they would reopen. Inside, the two women sat either side of their books, but they weren't reading. Paul sat at the bar chewing nervously on a pencil. The bearded man had his eyes on the door and his hand not far from his belt. There was a younger group, all men in their early twenties, sitting at a table in the other corner, but they weren't drinking. They were watching. Expecting trouble? I asked. Obviously. It seems to have walked through my door, Marcus said. We'd like a word with Rob, Shalto said. Where is he? In the back, Marcus said. Sholto eased onto a stool. Would you mind getting him? The words were polite, but there was no conciliation in his tone. Do you have a warrant? Paul asked, his tone nothing but scorn. Marcus gritted his teeth. Of course they don't have a warrant. There are no warrants any more, because there are no courts to issue them, right? We help one another, and in that way this little world of ours keeps on working. Rachel? Rob? he called. There were a few sounds from the back room, and a moment later Rob came out. Rachel followed. But he was being guarded, told me Rob was more of a flight risk than in danger of starting a fight. His sword was missing, but so was his knife. The sheath had his belt flat emptily against his leg. Take a seat, Rob, I said, pointing at the stool next to my brother. Rob glanced at Marcus, then at Rachel then at the door. His shoulders slumped. He walked around the bar and sat down. Did he tell you what happened? I asked. We saw it, Paul said. The woman came sprinting down the road and tried to throttle him with her bare hands. There was a muted comment from the group of young men, followed by a quartet of sniggers. Rob blushed. Marcus slammed his palm down on the bar. The sniggering stopped. Did Rob tell you why? I asked Marcus. That was a mistake, Rob said. An accident. Why was it a mistake? What kind of accident? Shalto asked. Is it important? Marcus asked. I'd like to know, Rachel said. Her expression was tight-lipped, almost angry. Then you better start talking, Marcus said with a smile completely absent of good humour. There's not much to say, Rob said. We were at this school. It was her idea, Nilda's. Me and me mates had secured this street. It was a good location. We had everything there, but she wouldn't hold a school without us. She needed us. She needed protection. So we went there to help, but she wasn't a leader. She just didn't know how. Didn't have the knack. The school was overrun, and it was obvious it was going to happen. I went out with her son, and this soldier took, except she was deaf. She was useless, but insisted on tagging along. I tried to tell her not to, but she couldn't hear, could she? It's her own fault. You want to blame someone, blame Tuck. We were looking for a way out of town. We got surrounded. They died. I managed to escape. That's all there is to say. What about the sword? Shalto asked. What? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I went back, didn't I? I mean, uh, I wanted to check they were dead. I mean, you know, check whether they were still alive. I thought they might be immune, you see. And they weren't. They were both zombies. But the sword was there. I picked it up and fought me way out. Why didn't you give Nilda the sword? I asked. I, uh, I thought it might upset her. I mean... She was a wreck when I told her that her son was dead. She wasn't going to be any use in a fight. I figured I'd give it to her when things were quiet there. And then? I asked. Well, we got separated when we fled the town. I told them we needed to stick together, but they wouldn't listen. They didn't go fast enough. It's their own fault. I thought she died. There were holes in his story. Obvious gaps that would be easy to pick apart. Paul was almost twitching, though I couldn't tell why. 
Marcus looked thoughtful. But I was more interested in Rachel. Her expression was completely blank. What do you think? I asked her. There can be only one punishment for murder, Rachel said. But is this murder? Marcus asked. It's an unfortunate series of accidents compounded by the fact that this woman, Nilda, clearly doesn't like Rob. I can't imagine why. Rob glared at Marcus and began to stand up. Sholto put a heavy hand on his shoulder and forced him back down onto the stool. It's an odd place, this, he said, speaking to Marcus. It reminds me of somewhere, but I'm finding it hard to place. You were in politics, weren't you? Marcus asked. You read his journal? Sholto asked. I glanced at it. He said, personally, I prefer a good thriller. It didn't serve, though. You did? I asked. I was a civilian contractor, Marcus said. Drove a truck. I got the idea for this place from Baghdad. Ah, Shalto said, that's it. You were there? I asked, surprised. In Iraq? Sure, my brother said. Before the war, or between the wars to be more precise, there was a place there that did the best coffee I've ever drunk. We can't match it. Marcus said, but we can't offer something black hot and full of caffeine. I'd be obliged, Sholto said. I'll get it, Rob said, trying to stand up again, and again Sholto pushed him back onto his stool. You'll sit there and wait, he said. For what? Rob asked. For a decision to be made, Marcus said, and that decision isn't going to be made in this room, right? He was looking at me. I guess not, I said. They'd probably heard some of Rob's story before. They would have got more out of him after Nilda's assault earlier that morning. As such, they were a couple of hours ahead of me. It was Rachel's comment about punishment that clicked a few other pieces into place. When I talked with George and Mary about the body we'd found in Bangor, we discussed evidence and policing, judges and juries. We had talked about crime but not about punishment. It's an odd thing we're creating here, I said. It could be a mirror of all that went before, or a continuation of it, or it could be something better, something new. What we do now isn't as important as how we do it. Success is synonymous with life, and if we fail, there will be no future generations to look back on our history with scorn. Responsibility hangs heavy on the head that melts down the crown, Marcus said. He reached under the counter and brought out a tall bottle containing a clear liquid. He poured a measure into a small glass. You want some? It's our own concoction. You have a still? I asked. We have a still that hasn't blown up this week, he said. I saw there was no point wasting rhetoric on him. He didn't want to talk. He was waiting for a decision on Rob's fate. The question then, the only one that mattered, was what was he going to do if he didn't like whatever it was? The answer came an hour later, when George came in. Afternoon, lads, ladies, Rob. I'd like a word. Outside, I think. Why, what are you going to do with him? Paul asked. Marcus frowned and I guessed he'd planned to ask the same question, but more diplomatically. That's none of your business, George said, his voice hardened. And you really, really don't want to make it yours. There was steel in his tone. Not a threat, but a promise. Unfortunately, right then, Shalto and I were the hard edge giving weight to the words. With deliberate care, Marcus refilled his glass, downed it, and slammed the glass on the bar. Everyone had been watching him, except for Paul, who still had his eyes on George and his hand on his belt. He jumped. You heard the man, Marcus said to Rob. Go on. Rob looked around the room. His eyes stayed longest on Paul, but there was no support for him there. The young man eased himself off his stool and slouched to the door. Thanks for the coffee, 
Sholto said, standing up. It was his turn to look around the room. Yeah, we could make something new. But isn't it the case that whenever we try, what we create always looks a lot like something very old? I followed him outside. Rob was sitting at one of the picnic tables. George was standing over him, listening to the young man talk. We kept our distance. You really went to back Dad? I asked. Sure, Sholto said. Once. I wanted to see the world, the Taj Mahal, the pyramids, you know, all the ancient sites. I drew up a bucket list and put Babylon at the top. I got food poisoning on my first day in Iraq and spent my entire time in the hotel. You didn't go to a coffee house? I barely made it out of the bathroom, he said. So Marcus was lying about being in Baghdad. Possibly, Shalto said. It does confirm he's not who he appears to be, and certainly not who he'd like us to think he is. We already knew that, but we're left with a puzzle of who he actually is. Aside from that he's dangerous, I couldn't even begin to guess. I don't like mysteries, I said. Not any more. So you went to Egypt? No. After Iraq, I scrapped those plans. I went to Las Vegas instead, got food poisoning there, too. Rob stood, glanced at us, back at George, then at the road leading from the pub. With a clear air of reluctance, he went back inside. George pushed himself to his feet. The one lads. We were fifty yards down the road. He spoke again. What do you think? Do you mean, did he kill Nilda's son? I don't know. I said, he doesn't seem like a murderer. Well, they often don't, Shalto said. What about you, George? What do you think? I know I don't like the man, he said, but there's no proof. So what are you going to do? I asked. For now, nothing, George said. I'm putting off having to make a decision. Nilda's going back to the mainland, just as going with her. She wants to go to Cumbria, to bury her son. She won't find him, but it's important she tries. Chester's going to Hull, and she'll be good company for him on the journey. Hull? Shalto asked. Why? Those wind turbines you mentioned, George said. Svalbard wants an electricity supply in exchange for the oil. We're going to propose a wind turbine. The thing about their seed vault is that it doesn't require a constant electrical supply, so wind power is ideal. Don't ask me how we get the turbines up there. Mary has an idea of using the helicopters, but personally, I'm hoping that it'll be enough for those people in Svalbard to know we're trying. How's intact, then? I asked. According to the satellite images, the turbine factory looks okay, George said and I gave Chester one of the sat phones so he can stay in touch. The boat they're taking to Cumbria is going to head straight back to Svalbard. We filled it with a few chickens, some other supplies, and another sat phone. We'll be able to conduct negotiations a little more easily, and maybe get the fuel situation resolved this side of Judgment Day. And Rob? I asked. You can defer the decision, but what about when Nilda returns? What then? By then we'll have found some judges to make the decision for us, he said. I've begun interviewing the lawyers, or those who claim to have a law degree. Right now it's a case of working out who is the least worst candidate. But it's a start. And if you don't finish before Nilda gets back from Hull? Sholto asked. Is there a backup plan? Not exactly, George said. But I've got another delaying tactic. We'll ship Rob to Svalbard. Out of sight might be far enough out of mind that Nilda will forget about him. And that will give us time to work out quite what we're going to do next. Time? Maybe it's just my age, but there never seems to be as much of it as there used to be. I never knew an egg could provide so much entertainment, Kim said. We were sitting in the garden of our house. The sun had dipped behind the spreading chestnut, casting a welcome shadow 
on the infant trampled lawn. Sholto and Annette were by the barbecue, now a safe distance from the trees, but perilously close to the rickety fence delineating the garden from the neighbouring fields. Their attention was on the metal plate placed on the barbecue, and on which they were frying eggs. Those had been a gift from Mary O'Leary after Annette had explained our lack of grillable food. Kim stood, walked over to Daisy, and picked her up. Unlike before, she was no longer reluctant to be carried by Kim. Didn't you notice? Kim asked. What? Daisy doesn't like the fire, Kim said. It must be because of how we escaped that tunnel. Should I tell them to put the barbecue out? Kim gave that a moment's thought. No, it's not something she'll be able to avoid. She gave a sigh. It's a strange life we've found for ourselves. Strange place. Doesn't feel real. Yet it seems more real than anything I've ever known. What do you make of this business with Nilda? I think that there's more to it than Rob told us. But I don't think he's a murderer. Not that I'm any judge, and not that we can judge people for what they did out in the wasteland to survive. I think it more likely that they were in a situation where he saved himself but not Nilda's son. Perhaps he even sacrificed Nilda's son to save himself, I don't know. I can come up with plausible theories, but that's not what you're meant to do, is it? That's the real question, she said. How do we decide? How do we judge? That's what Mary's puzzling over, creating a judiciary. I didn't tell you about the body we found, I said, and told her about the corpse in the university. I don't know, Bill, she said. It's hard to remember what I imagined safety was going to be when we were out in the wasteland, but the reality is a lot harder than I'd ever dreamed. It's like the period of grace is over, and the real work now begins. I don't know where we should start or what we're going to do, but if it doesn't get done, life will keep getting worse. It's such a depressing realization, she added, because it really means that the best we can hope for is that things stay the same. That's what Mary was getting at, I said, and George too. I didn't quite grasp it at the time. It's why they've got me planning the election. It's why there's going to be an election. I mean, it would be far easier simply not bothering, and honestly, I don't think anyone would object. You found your niche, then, and one not too dissimilar to before. That's good. She smiled and in it I saw an echo of the torment that had led her to join the expedition north. Fried eggs, charred fish, burnt rolls. It was a feast, and the company made it the best meal I'd ever tasted. Daisy wasn't convinced by the toasted bread, but had been mollified with a jar of raspberry compote Mrs. Dupont had given us a few days before. Annette emptied half a jar of ketchup onto a fish fillet sandwich, took a bite and shook her head. I miss Burgess. I know we can't have him again, but we could have ice cream. Ice cream? Kim asked. Sure, Annette said. Sholto was explaining it. I was explaining why we couldn't have it, he said. No, you're thinking about it wrong, Annette said. You said we need sugar, cream and ice, right? Well, sugar's something you grow, right? But for cream and for burgers you need cows. True, I said. But there's only four on the island. Fortunately one of them's a bull, but it's going to be years before we can spare any meat or milk. Yeah, but we have the satellites now, don't we? She said. So, we could use that to find more cows. I, I suppose, I said. Though I think we should use it to find survivors first. I thought that's what the radio was for. Annette said. Radio? What radio? I asked. The one Kim's going to build, Annette said. We were talking about it on the boat, Kim said. It started when I was trying to explain why the ship-to-shore radio stopped working. Do you remember me telling you about my time in America? You were a student on a year abroad, I said. It's where you learn to shoot. I loved the family I was staying with. I, um, 
Sorrow flashed across her face in that common expression everyone has when they think about those who must inevitably be dead. While I was there, I did some work at the local radio station. I didn't get paid, of course. It was more for fun, and it mostly was. You were working as a technician? Sholto asked. No, it was reading the news, the weather, that kind of thing, because of the accent. She added, Because a British accent is more trustworthy? I asked. Sholto laughed. No, it definitely wasn't that, Kim said. After the news, they had a segment where people would phone in and do their best impression of me. Most people settled for doing their worst. It was pretty popular. And you said we could build a radio station, Annette said, bringing us back on topic. The transmitter on the island was destroyed, but we can make a new one, Kim said. I was talking about it with Colette and Francois. We were really talking about a way for ships to communicate with Anglesey. With the sat phones, that problem's half solved, but a radio station would have other uses. A music station would be welcome, Shelto said. As long as you let a song play right to the end before cutting to a commercial break. Of course, there won't be any adverts, will there? You know, there's a music exchange down near the bakery. It's essentially a way to collect unwanted tablets, phones, and laptops, storing them against the day we'll need them, but they're copying all the music and movies. Along with the CDs on the island, it should be enough for a varied playlist. Maybe it will even encourage people to record something new. A news program would be invaluable during the election, I said. We are going to have public debates, but this would be a way for more people to hear what the candidates have to say. Imagine it, Kim said, laughing. There's some poor survivor living on the roof of a multi-story car park, using the last of her batteries to power a radio, knowing this will be the final twist of the dial, her only hope of salvation. Then she hears it. Other people. She leans in closer to the tiny speaker, and what precisely does she hear? An election debate. Cholto and I laughed too. Annette looked puzzled. That'd be good, though, wouldn't it? She asked. More or less, Kim said. But that was the plan. Yes, we'll broadcast whatever's useful for the survivors on Anglesey, but since the distance the signal will travel is a function of how high we build the transmitter, there's no real reason we can't construct something that can broadcast across Britain. But realistically, Sholto said, what are the chances that after all this time anyone is wasting batteries on checking for a radio signal? That's why you have the drones, Annette said. Now it was my and Sholto's turn to look puzzled. Drones? A concept that Francois taught her, Kim explained. There was a bit of a storm and Annette was feeling very, Hey, you promised not to tell, Annette said. And you were sick too? True, Kim said. Francois was trying to distract us, and he doesn't know very many stories, certainly not many that could be considered soothing. So he talked about the airfields he'd flown in and out of and that brought us onto drones. Right, so the radio station tells people we're here, Annette said, and that they should hang flags from the windows, like at the safe houses. We use the satellites to find them, and then the drones can go and take them supplies. I guess we could include one of those sat phones. Then we could speak to them and find out if they need to be rescued, or if they can make it here on their own, and that way, you see, we can use the satellites to look for cows. It was simple. It was obvious. It would work. Not the part about ice cream and cows, but the rest was well within our abilities. We'd need to find some drones, I said. The satellites will tell us which RAF bases are intact, but we'd have to send people in to find out if there are drones still in the hangars. I'll forget the RAF, Kim said. Francois knew from where the French operated theirs. It'll be like George's Railroad. Sholto said, but on a global scale. I mean, why keep it to Britain? Why not Europe? Africa? America? The radio signal won't carry, but we can broadcast from a ship. The airfield took a battering, I said. It might not be possible for anything, even something that small, to land. You know the person to ask? Scott Higson, the baker. He said he was a pilot. He'd be able to tell us. Are we going to try it? Annette asked. 
It won't be easy, Kim said, and there will be a lot of problems to sort through, but I think so. Once we've found the drones, there's virtually no risk to anyone here, just a lot of work. Good, Annette said. Find the people, and then find the cows. What? Animals are important too. The sun dropped. The shadows lengthened. Sholto and Annette sat with a tablet going through images of distant places, playing Spot the Cow. Every few seconds, Daisy would join in, stabbing her finger at the screen with a victorious yell of, Cow! There wasn't a cow, or any suggestion of survivors, but it was a wonderfully tranquil end to a most peculiar day. We were together. In that moment, it was all that mattered. Chapter 10 Anglesey, the 2nd of September, Day 174 I woke at four, with the obvious solution to half of our problems. Careful not to wake Kim, I went down to the kitchen. The light was on, and Sholto was up. Can't sleep? I asked. I haven't gone to bed, he said. I just got back from the docks. The Harper's Ferry has arrived. How, how is it? I'd say we need this radio station more than we'd realize, he said. Rumors and half-truths get repeated across the island until they become fact. The Harper's Ferry isn't a hospital ship, not technically. Those things were almost as large as a Nimitz aircraft carrier. I guess Mr. Mills knew. Must have told Mary O'Leary and I never asked. What are you saying? I asked. A hospital ship had beds for a couple of thousand patients, with a staff to care for them, and the defensive weaponry and crew to protect them. You never seen one? Did you ever see one of the nuclear-powered supercarriers? Only on the TV. They were like mobile cities. A hospital ship isn't much smaller. It is, literally, a hospital. There's no way a fishing trawler could tow one back. Not even one as large as the Santa Maria and I should have known. I paid for it, didn't I? I mean, yeah, if you were describing it to a civilian, you'd call it a hospital ship because it's certainly not a warship. No. The Harper's Ferry is a support ship, a tender. Think of it as an ambulance boat, a place for the helicopters to land and the patients triaged before being flown either to the real hospital ship or to a shore-based military facility. It was deployed with the troops providing training, logistics, and communication support for that police action in North Africa. There are a few rangers and some special forces to complement the ship's marines, but we're mostly talking about the walking wounded. After this long, that's all who's left. The others, the more seriously injured, died. How many? I asked. Dead? I don't know. Alive? A hundred sailors, fifty medical staff, and forty marines from the original crew. There's another two hundred soldiers, sailors, and civilians that you could call patients or passengers. I'm not sure of the ratios of injured to hail, and after months becalmed on an angry ocean, there's not many who can be described as hearty, but it adds up to three hundred and ninety-six souls. I weighed that up. You say it has a helipad. What else? If we had the fuel, could the ship sail again? The boilers cracked, the propellers broken, and most of the electronics are fried. They'll know in a couple of days whether it can be fixed. As to how long that will take, it'll depend on what parts are needed. They've got a helipad, but no helicopter. I asked, and there was bitterness in the reply. I think the pilot took it in search of help, but never came back. What about MRIs and CT scanners and other medical equipment? I asked. No, they've nothing we don't already have in the clinic. That's why we need the radio station. And preferably, one with a call-in show so people can ask the questions that we forget, like how many people were on board. I'll add building a telephone exchange to our list of morning chores, I said. Sholto didn't smile. It's more survivors, I continued. That's good. That's what we should celebrate. It may not be a floating city, but it's not like anything has changed. 
I thought I'd be going back to America with a few hundred soldiers and sailors. He walked over to the kettle, glanced up as if seeing the rest of the sleeping household above, changed his mind, and took out a saucepan instead. I had an idea that we could set up a railroad like George did. He filled the saucepan with water and placed it on a stove. We'd broadcast a radio signal hundreds of miles from the coast. We'd have a helicopter or three to collect survivors, and then we could bring them back here. You still can, I said. Not on the same scale, he said. Not in time. In another year after a harsh winter, how many people will be alive out there? In two, whoever's here will be it. Maybe we'll have found another five thousand, maybe ten thousand at best. But that'll be it. That will be humanity. He gestured at the tap. Running water. We take it for granted, but for how long will the treatment plant remain operational? All the talk has been about the power plant, and what we'll do if it has to be shut down. But what'll we do if we have no clean drinking water? Four hundred souls? Not two thousand soldiers? Yeah, you're right. Nothing has changed. What about Sophia Augusto? I asked, wanting to shift the conversation into less gloomy territory. Did you see her? You were friends, weren't you? Before the outbreak, I mean. I knew her, he said. I don't know if she'd call me a friend, and I'm not sure there are many people I've described as that. There was Max, of course, but he's as dead as anyone else. I guess Sophia is the only living person who actually knew me, or some part of me. It went strangely. We're both alive, and when we'd established that, we found we had little to talk about. Certainly not much in common. I guess you could say that though we knew of each other before, we didn't really know each other. But what was I expecting? I kept her on the hook so she could smuggle me past border controls. It wasn't exactly the relationship of two friends. Uh, yeah, I guess. After everything that's happened these last few months, I was starting to believe the hype that I was this crusading hero trying to save the world. I was just another gangster with a better motive than most. The water began to bubble. I opened a cupboard and took out a tin of coffee. You want to talk about it? I asked. Not really. There's not much to say. I think I knew it deep down. Whether I hold myself responsible for all that happened or not, it wasn't my fault. Yet I still have a lot for which I must make amends. We might not apportion guilt for what people did during the outbreak, but that doesn't absolve me from what I did before. I'm not sure how long my penance will take, when I know in what form it has to be carried out. He forced a smile. Enough, Gloom, you're right. Four hundred people, let's be glad of that. And fifty doctors, nurses, and technicians, that's a boon. What about you? Why are you up? A bad dream? The opposite, I said. I think I have the answer. Admittedly not to the question I went to bed asking myself. Svalbard wants to protect the seed vault. They won't give us the oil unless we give them a power source. We have electricity, so let's bring the seeds here. They'll only last for a year in the permafrost without power. They'll last longer in the freezers. It's a temporary solution, but there's no permanence to anything anymore. Right, right. He leaned back, and I could see his brain trying to fix on the problem. As transportation? How would you manage that? That fishing trawler has an insulated hole, doesn't it? It's got an ice machine to keep the catch frozen. Well, that's how we move it. Ideally, we'd find some larger vessel capable of moving them in one go, and if we can't, the Santa Maria would do. That's the obvious solution. Assuming that the people on Svalbard go for it, he said. I poured the water into the mugs. I'll speak to Mary this morning, I said. Hopefully that means one less problem to worry about. You're really settling into this, aren't you? Sholto said. Running your own little country. I'm hardly running it, I said. Not yet. But give it a few years and you will be. 
if we have a few years, and I suppose that's what I'm trying to ensure. What about the election? He asked. How's that coming along? It's all rather straightforward, really, I said, and began outlining my plans. We sat and talked, and soon the conversation moved away from the future and to the past, and the political campaigns we'd been involved in. We talked until soon after dawn. Our laughter woke the rest of the house. A night's sleep hadn't dampened Annette's enthusiasm for a radio station, or for drones. If anything, it had leached into Kim. As they went to inspect the runway at Anglesey's small airport, I was ordered to take Daisy to the school. There was a lot of excited chatter among the handful of staff and parents. After I'd deposited Daisy with Dr. Umbert, I found the reason for it outside. Mary O'Leary was in the playground, her wheelchair pulled close to the solitary adult's picnic table. On that was a tray of tea, a couple of bread rolls with enough crumbs to suggest there had recently been a lot more and an almost empty jar of jam. Two women sat on either side of the tray. From their bearing, both were military, though there was no rank or insignia on their boiler suits. One was around my age. She looked exhausted, but her mouth was fixed in a slightly bewildered grin. Her eyes were on the classroom window behind which the class of the youngest children stared back. I raised a hand and waved at Daisy. Daisy waved, and the other children copied. The woman began raising her left arm. She stopped. Below the wrist was a stump where her hand should be. She raised her right arm instead, and gave the children a brief wave. Her expression changed. There was still that edge of bewilderment to it, but the exhaustion had been replaced by one of triumphant joy. The other woman was older, at least fifty, but probably older than that. Her hair was iron grey, cut short, her skin weathered and tanned. She turned her piercing green eyes to me and gave me a searching look. Admiral, may I introduce Bill Wright, Mary said. The author of the journal we've been hearing so much about? The older woman asked. She had the Scandinavian twang of a Minnesotan. The very same, Mary said. Bill, this is Admiral Janet Gunderson and Captain Annabeth Devine. Admiral, Captain, I said, shaking their hands, from the Harpers Ferry? It was an unnecessary question. I didn't think such a small ship would have an admiral in charge. Gunderson? The name was vaguely familiar, as was the face, though from before the outbreak, and I don't think I'd ever met the woman in person. I'm a doctor, the admiral said. I was on an inspection tour when the outbreak occurred and on shore when the orders came in recalling all personnel. I made it to the Harper's Ferry, but wasn't going to take up space on a helicopter, not when there were patients in need of more treatment than the ship's facilities could provide. After three days at sea, we were told to sail due south. We were still in helicopter range of the USNS Hope and kept sending our patients to better treatment, or so we thought. I was in the operating theater for most of that time. Three weeks in... The electronics failed. What did you call it? Prometheus? When the engine stopped working, we knew it was an EMP. It's hard to mistake when your electronics die. Restoring power to the engines took a week, but we didn't have enough fuel to run both the engines and the desalination equipment. The boats found us, the captain said, reaching for one of the rolls. Sailing boats. They'd set out from Africa simply wanting to get away, Gunderson said. It makes me wonder how many other crafts set out and how many of those found nothing but a watery grave. We put our marines onto a yacht and sent it to the last position of the USNS Hope. She'd been overrun. Zombies. Since then, we've been dead in the water. Sending the yachts to shore to find help. For sure they found water and sometimes food, but no help. Just the undead. Was that Africa? I asked. Senegal. Mauritania, the captain said. Even Cape Verde. It's the same everywhere. It's good to be on dry land again. The Harpers ferries your ship? I asked. Devine shook her head. I'm a Marine. Military police. 
We were gathering evidence for a war crimes trial, IED, she added, raising her stump. The day before the outbreak. The Admiral got me out of there, but a missing hand wasn't a serious enough injury to be evac from the Harper's Ferry. I think that tells you everything you need to know about what it was like. It did. Mary, clearly sensing the darkening mood, changed the subject. And what brings you and Daisy here this morning, Belle? I would have thought you'd be spending the day with Annette and Kim. I was. Well, I was kicked out of the house for making too much noise. Devine laughed. Sorry, that's just wonderfully normal. We're meeting up for lunch, I said. A picnic on the beach. But they were going to come here first. They wanted to check on the runways at the airport of the RAF base and then see what damage the old radio transmitter sustained. They've got an idea that involves drones and a radio station. I'm intrigued, the Admiral said. I'll let them explain, I said, though I had an idea myself. It's to do with Svalbard. Since we have electricity here, we could build our own sub-zero vault to store their seeds. That would be far easier than trying to transport wind turbines there from Hull. Svalbard? the captain asked. Mary explained about the survivors there. And bringing seeds here, she added when she'd finished, is just one of the suggestions I'm going to put to them as soon as our ship gets there. Ah, you'd already thought of it, I said. Of course you did. It's uh, blindingly obvious. Mary smiled. My first thought is that we should plant the seeds, at least those that bear fruit. Lemons, oranges, bananas, Imagine eating those again. It would take years before we'd have a crop, but the same can be said of any plants we gather from the mainland. Travelling to Spain or Sicily would be dangerous and a tad redundant, as we'd be getting the oil from Svalbard where we could get the seeds. That being said, the seeds are secondary to the people. They are the real prize. I have to say, the Admiral said, it's a shock being here. I'm not sure what I was expecting, but it wasn't this. Everyone says that, Mary said, with a touch of pride. She was telling us you tracked down the man responsible, Devine said. Quigley, he wasn't exactly responsible, but he was one of those who took advantage of an accident to try to seize power. We got the highlights, the Admiral said. What are the details? I glanced at the wide classroom window. Daisy and the other children had been corralled around a big desk, but they were still watching the newcomers. Okay, I said. It began a long time ago. In a way, it began with my father. Speaking of which, you'll want to talk to my brother to get that part of the story, but... Uh... I began recounting the now far too familiar tale, and had reached Braisley Abbey, when, through the gate, I saw Donnie cycling towards us at breakneck speed. Something's wrong, I said. The captain's hand dropped to the sidearm at her belt. The admiral narrowed her eyes. Mary pushed her chair around. We all waited as Donnie sprinted the last few feet and almost threw himself off the bike. It's Llewellyn, he said. He's dead. What? I asked. Are you sure he's dead? The admiral asked. Yep, positive, Donnie said. It's, well... He glanced at the window at the children, and then down the road. Spit it out, son, Mary said. It sort of looks like a zombie did it, Donnie blurted. My blood froze. No, I murmured. I said, sort of, Donnie said. That's why I came here instead of raising the alarm. What do you mean, Mary said. Be succinct. There are bite marks, Donnie said. I mean, you can see them, and it looks like he was eaten but the gate was closed and there's no zombie in the garden. It's got a high fence, so it can't have got out. It doesn't seem right. That's why I came here. The gate could have banged closed in the wind, I suggested. Sure, Donny said, but the wind wouldn't have pulled the bolts back after it. Bill, will you go and have a look? Mary said. I'll get... She paused as if trying to think of whose opinion and experience might be relevant. Do you have police on the island? The Admiral asked. No, Mary said. 
We've been discussing it, but haven't appointed anyone yet. I'll go then, Devine said. Do you have a car? We have bikes, I said, gesturing to the rack near the entrance. Half a dozen bicycles, all belonging to various employees at the school, were stashed there. Donnie led us to a two-story cottage opposite the entrance to Willow Farm. The cottage's upper level was built into the eaves. The brick was crumbling, the paintwork recently washed though cracking around the lintel. In the front garden, to the left of the path, leading up to the front door, was a heap of cut branches, bracken and leaves. To the left of the path was a patch of recently dug dirt. At the side of the house was a metal gate with a bolt at top and side. You closed it? Devine asked Donnie. I did, he said. She drew her sidearm. Following her lead, I did the same. What's going on, Donnie? A voice called from the other side of the road. A group was gathering by the gate that led to Willow Farm. None of them looked worried. Keep them back, Devine said, examining the path, and then the muddy garden. Donnie went to speak to the neighbors. Open the gate, Devine called to me, gesturing at it with her stump. Her gun was kept unwaveringly pointed down the narrow alley between wall and fence. I hurried over, reaching through the railings and pulled the bolts. I pushed the gate open. Devine went through. I followed down the narrow path to the rear garden. It had been entirely dug over. Not a single errant blade of grass remained of the lawn that had been there a few weeks before. The fence was eight feet high and covered in a web of string and wooden trellis. It was an impressive amount of work for such a short time. There was nothing else to see in the garden, and so I had no excuse not to turn my attention to David Llewellyn. He was lying on a metal-framed reclining chair, positioned on the patio at the rear of the house. Above him was a retractable canvas awning, bolted to the wall. Below him was a congealing pool of blood. His legs were stretched. His arms hung limp either side of the chair. His eyes were open, and he was unmistakably dead. Blood had stained the chair's yellow padding and dripped onto a plastic crate underneath. Why do you know about him? Devine asked, holstering her gun. He joined us a couple of weeks ago, I said. We were in Bangor, the city on the mainland. We'd gone ashore searching for sat phones and other supplies. Half the group had rigged up a barricade at a pier. We made a stand there and killed a few hundred of the undead. As we were checking the bodies, he... he staggered towards us. I thought he was a zombie at first. He was reasonably incoherent, suffering from dehydration, exhaustion and fear. But he'd found a map directing him to Anglesey. A map? It's something old George Tull's been doing, I said or organizing, at least. People go out, they set up safe houses and leave some food, water, and a map telling people to come here. And so he came. What else? He was alone? When he reached us, yes, I said. Originally, he was with a group of survivors. He was bitten, and they left him behind, handcuffed to a bed. So no friends, no family? She asked. Not when he arrived, not that I know of. Did you know he was British Army? He was? I asked. The regimental tattoo on his arm, she said. Did he say anything about the people he was with? Were they soldiers? Civilians? He didn't say. Not to us. Not then. Interesting, she said. Though I wasn't sure why. Can you secure the house? Check there's nothing inside? There was a momentary flash of fear. Though I had a deep sense of foreboding... It wasn't for my immediate safety, but for the consequences of what I might or might not find inside. The back door was unlocked. It opened onto an immaculate kitchen. The surfaces were empty except for a kettle. A doorway led to a living room furnished with a wooden table and two chairs, a bookshelf with an eclectic collection, and an armchair with an easy table on one side and the window on the other. On the table were an exercise book and a mug. 
It was half full of something that might have been tea or coffee. The room's other door led out into an entrance hall. The front door was to my right, with a door to a small cloakroom immediately opposite. To my left were stairs going up. I climbed them. Upstairs were three rooms. The bedroom held a made bed and a wardrobe that contained the mismatched clothes of someone who'd arrived with only the rags on their back. The bathroom contained a bar of soap, a toothbrush, a flannel, and a stack of faded cut-to-sheets newspaper. A box room overlooking the front garden contained absolutely nothing at all. It's empty, I said going back outside, not just of zombies, but almost of everything. Except you weren't expecting to find any zombies here, were you? Any signs of a struggle? She asked, avoiding my question. No, I said. Do you think there was one? Hard to say. But it wasn't a zombie, I said. Why do you think that? She asked. Look at how the garden's been dug up, I said. It was done recently and hasn't yet baked hard. Aside from the question of how a zombie got out through a closed gate, there should be footprints in the dirt, and the only ones in it match Mr. Llewellyn's boots. I'm right, aren't I? I think so, she said, her eyes fixed on the corpse. I forced myself to look at the body. I've been trying not to. The left trouser leg was torn, with the skin around the shin gashed, as if it had been scraped off. The bottom four buttons of his short-sleeved shirt had been ripped, exposing his stomach. Just above the hip was a bite mark, where the upper set of teeth had left a perfect indentation. There was another bite on his right forearm, though it was more scabbed with blood and so less distinct. A finger was missing from that hand. It lay amid the blood below. Most of that had come from the savage wound on his neck. It was as if a chunk of flesh had been ripped from his neck and shoulder. Why do you think this wasn't a zombie? I asked. She didn't immediately answer, but squatted down, peering at the man's right hand. She stood, but kept her back to me, her eyes on the man's ruined face. We were gathering evidence for a war crimes trial, she said, for a trial we knew would never happen except in the court of public opinion. Did you see the footage? From the Civil War? Sure. That wasn't even the half of it. You can't force an ordinary person into savagery overnight, but if you nudge them along, each day getting them to do something only marginally worse than what went before, then it's not long before you've created a monster prepared and willing to do more than your worst nightmares. Did you see how unconcerned the neighbors were? How they came out of their cottage curious as to what had happened? They didn't hear any screaming. How could you be sure? I know human behavior, she said. If they'd heard screaming, they would have come to investigate. If they knew the victim was dead, and as they didn't report it, they would have stayed in their homes when we arrived. They would have stayed inside, not drawing attention to themselves. No, the victim died quickly, before he had time to call out. If there was a fight, it was a brief one. From the blood underneath the seat and on the cushions, he bled out here. From the neck wound? I asked. Yeah. Do you see the bite marks? She asked. Yes, of course. Precisely. Look at the one on the arm. It's partially covered in scabbed blood. Now, look at the wound on the side. There's very little blood, I said, because he was already dead. The leg was done first. That was a practice, hence the blood on his calf and on the cushions. Then the finger was bitten off because this was meant to look like a zombie attack, and what do zombies do? They go for the extremities. The bite mark on the victim's side was done last. It was an afterthought, after the killer had taken a look at his masterpiece and decided that it was sorely lacking one final element. Look at where you're standing. Somebody walking in would see the body, see the hand, and then see his side. They were meant to run, screaming in panic, calling for others. Dozens would come, trampling the evidence, or lack thereof. Is it common knowledge there are no police here? It is. Then I'd say your killer has at least some experience of law enforcement and procedure. That doesn't help us too much, I said. 
but it was the neck wound that killed him. So, are you saying that someone grabbed him and bit his neck? No. Look at the teeth marks, they're too perfect. I think they were made with a set of false teeth. What killed him was a knife. He was stabbed in the neck, the blade cut the carotid artery, it was quick, at least. The muscle and tissue were ripped and scraped away to cover the wound. But you can see a section where the neat cut is visible. This must have been at night. The kitchen light is still on. Open the door and find the light switch. Don't touch it. There's a switch just inside the door, I said, and no security light, so the work was done by the light coming through the kitchen window. Or by torch, I said. Unlikely. If it were, then a better job would have been done disguising that first wound. This was planned, then. Just not very well. I mean, who carries around a set of false teeth with them? Someone who wears false teeth, she suggested. But yes, I'd say this was planned. The crate suggests it. The crate? I bent down so I could see it better. I'd noticed it, but not what was inside. Looks like beer. Sixteen bottles, she said, half with their tops missing, the other half unopened. We're meant to think he was drunk. That would explain why he didn't wake up when the supposed zombie attacked. I'm guessing the killer brought the beer here with him, and it's that gift that got him access to the property. I doubt any was drunk, but the autopsy will confirm it. The killer stabbed the victim and then held him down on the chair as he bled out. The killer then attempted to leave bite marks on the skin, but it proved more difficult and so took longer than he'd planned. By the time this last set was left, there was little blood left in the victim. We can take a cast of a knife wound and another of these teeth marks, but uh, if the killer has even an ounce of sense, both knife and teeth will have been disposed of. Even so, she shook her head, what kind of sick place is this? I held up my hands. This is the first time we've had anything like this, I said. Up until now, our big problem has been trying to get people off their boats. It's just a coincidence that it happened the night you arrived, except... except it's not a coincidence, is it? You better not be saying someone from our crew did this, she said with a flash of anger. I'm not, I said quickly. We weren't expecting you, not so few of you, I mean. We thought it was a hospital ship with two thousand beds and as many sailors, all coming ashore for the first time in months. We are agreed that whoever found the body was expected to run, panicking into town. Add that to the confusion of a few thousand new people, and rumours of a zombie invasion would have filled the island. It would have taken days to sort out, weeks perhaps. That's why he was killed last night, and perhaps even why it was done like this. The news, what we heard, what we saw on the USNS Hope, it was terrible, Devine said. What we saw on Cape Verde, the undead. She shook her head. That was bad. This is worse. It's like what you'd find in the old world. You see here? She pointed at a pockmarked scar on the left side of Llewellyn's abdomen. Bullet wound. There's an old shrapnel scar on his shoulder. I stared again at the body of a man about whom I knew nothing. So who did it? She asked. Have no idea, I said, but ignorance wasn't a shield. He hasn't been here long enough to make any enemies, so it had to be someone from before. And you don't know any of his story? She asked. He was dehydrated and delirious, I said squatting down to get a different view of the body. I went with him as far as the clinic, but hadn't seen him since. I saw the crate and the label on the bottles inside. That's Hopvar, I said. The beer. It's a cheap imitation brand. The people who run the inn found a lorry full of it on the island and still have some in stock. You're saying you know where this beer came from? She asked. Perhaps. The pub is run by a guy called Marcus, uh, no, I can see him killing someone, but not like this. It's so, I don't know, imprecise, obvious even. When you take out the horror of it, it's almost amateur. And you're saying he's a professional? No, I don't think so. 
I say he likes to think of himself as a scoundrel and nothing worse. This, this is evil. And I've met evil before. Cannock, Barrett, Quigley. I shook my head, trying to rid it of memories that were never far from the forefront of my mind. Who? Long story. No, I think Marcus would be happy with theft and probably with violence, but not murder. Not unless it was in self-defense, and even then I can't see him staging the body like this. What would be the point? But the beer may have come from the inn. If so, he might have a record of who traded for it in the last few days. There was the sound of footsteps, followed a moment later by Donnie appearing around the side of the house. They want to know what's going on, he said, and I don't know what to tell them. It's not my call, Devine said, turning to me. I saw the anxiety in Donnie's face. He's barely a decade younger than me, but that's another way of saying he's only a few years out of college. He'd seen a lot. We all had. But there's a difference between killing the inhuman, undead, and brutal murder. Tell them that Mr. Llewellyn was attacked. I said, and that we're looking into it. Maybe you should speak to them, Donny said. Maybe you should, Devine agreed. Find out what they know about the victim, whether they saw anyone come here yesterday, or whether Mr. Llewellyn had regular visitors. What do you know about him? I asked Donny, as we walked around to the front of the house. Not much, Donny said. He was helping out in the hospital. The night after he arrived, he started sweeping the floors, tidying up that sort of thing. Dr. Knight came in the next morning and found him washing the windows. He sort of got the job of janitor because he was happy doing it. And the house? I found it for him, Donnie said. He was sleeping in the ward, but there was nothing physically wrong with him. Dr. Knight didn't want him moving into an office at the hospital. She thought if he did that, he'd never leave. If he had a house somewhere, he'd have to go out into the fresh air twice a day. She said that was as much help as we could find for him. I thought a house here near Willow Farm would mean he'd see people every day who didn't work in the hospital. So there was nothing physically wrong with him. He just couldn't forget what he'd seen, Donnie said. But who can? Good point. Did he talk about how he'd survived the last few months? No, he didn't talk much. Nothing about his friends or family or past life. Nope, Donny said. Pity. The crowd from Willow Farm was still by the closed gate. Morning, I said loudly enough to carry, though all eyes were already on me. Last night Mr. Llewellyn was assaulted. Did anyone hear anything? See anything? It wasn't us, a bearded man said. He was around forty, but the grey streaked beard made him look a decade older. His skin was tanned, and though his clothes were clean, his hands were ingrained with dirt. I didn't say it was, I said. It couldn't be anyone here, a woman said. Her head was covered in a wide-brimmed straw hat, held down with a bright blue scarf. It was one of the few colourful items on a group otherwise wearing drab greys and browns. There's no violence here. I've heard that said before, I said. Violence and aggression created this nightmare, a younger man said. Only through peace and love can we restore true harmony. On the page those words look harmless, but there was something about his tone. There was a fervor, a passion, that when taken with the group's general demeanor made me think they shouldn't be taken at face value. How well do you know, Mr. Llewellyn? I asked. He wasn't one of us, the young man said, answering before anyone else could. And he didn't want to be. We invited him to join, he refused. We left him alone, as were his wishes. He left us alone, as were ours. Did you see him last night? I asked. Did anyone? The young man asked, turning to look around the group. Eyes darted back and forth, and then a woman raised a tentative hand. You saw him? I asked. Not him, she said. I saw another man. He was carrying something, something large, in two hands. When was this? I asked. Around dusk, she said. I was watering the cabbages. 
Can you describe him? Not really, she said. I didn't get a very good look. He was across the road and I was in the garden. You sure it was a man? Donnie asked. Oh, yes, she said. He had blonde hair. Does that help? It was down to his shoulders. Blonde hair. And he was carrying something to the house or away from it, I asked. To, to the house, she said. That's all I saw. Thank you. Did anyone else see him? There was a general shake of heads. Did anyone see anything? He's dead, isn't he? The young man asked. Otherwise he would have told you about his visitor. I mentally cursed, but there was no point lying. Yes, I said, he's dead. We're not sure what happened. You see? The young man said, addressing his group. Do you see? Perhaps they did see, but I surely didn't. Back inside, he said. There's nothing for us here. He corralled them away from the gate and back down the track. From their expressions, they all went willingly. We went back to the house and met Captain Devine coming around from the side. Anything? She asked. A possible suspect, I said. We got a description of a blonde man coming here around dusk. That's not much, she said. It is on an island where most people shave their heads. There's a man at the pub with long blonde hair. He'd have had access to the beer. Right. I'm going back to the ship, Devine said. We don't have any forensics equipment, but I can piece it together. I can collect evidence and take samples, and you can work out how to analyze them later. There's a patch of damp soil on the far side of the patio. I think the beer might have been poured away. There's possibly skin underneath the nails of the victim's left hand. I'll collect it. You can decide what to do with it after that. She paused. We're grateful for the landfall. From what Sophia Augusto said, this might be a safe harbor for us. From what I've seen, it might not. Again she paused. This time I heard the unspoken threat. Donnie, can you watch the body? I asked. I'll go back to town, speak to George and Mary, and get some of Mr. Mill's crew to come and stand guard. Sure, he said. Devine and I collected our bicycles. I led her back to the port and then went to find Mary and George. They were in the library. They weren't alone. Kim and Sholto were with them. I summarized what I'd seen. I don't get it, Kim said. It doesn't make sense. If someone wanted him dead, why not shoot him? The undead don't shoot people, Sholto said. It sounds like Bill says someone wanted this to look like a zombie attack. You sure it's Paul? Yes and no, I said. We have the description of a man with blonde hair carrying something large to the house. We've also got the crate of beer underneath the chair. So the beer was a peace offering, George said. Paul took it there, hoping that Mr. Llewellyn would forgive him for some past transgression. A fight ensued. Paul killed him. We don't know that, Kim said. A man with blonde hair going up to the house. That doesn't mean it was Paul, or that Paul attacked Llewellyn. The beer doesn't mean much either. Didn't you say that's the brand they can't even give away? We're talking about murder here. We have to do this correctly. We do indeed, Mary said. The Admiral has gone back to his ship. They were all going to come ashore, but the entire crew has been confined until this is dealt with. If they leave, if we get the next few hours wrong, how many more boats will up anchor and sail away? They've no oil, Sholto said. They'll find it hard to get anywhere. Besides, the Harper's Ferry's engines are shot. We have the small quantity of oil that Svalbard gave us, Mary said. I don't want to see the Admiral attempt to take it nor do I want to see her take some of our sailing ships. They won't be given willingly. Dozens would die. Those are the very people we need. The ones who must. She coughed and spluttered into silence. You are right, Mary, George asked, stepping close. Fine, George. <laughs> Fine, Mary said, though she didn't look it. Devine will gather evidence, I said. In the meantime, we need to act or to be seen to be acting. 
At present, the only thing we can do is interview Paul. And anyone else who's got long blonde hair, Kim said, assuming that witness is reliable. We'll start with Paul, George said. I'll go and get him. No, Mary said. We'll get some sailors from the Viermen to do that. You don't want to send in the Navy, George said. Kim's right. We've got a blonde man carrying something to the door. That's not the same as a suspect for a murder. Let's see if he'll come quietly. And if he fights, Mary said, if Marcus fights for him. I won't go alone, George said. I'll take these two. Marcus knows them. It'll be less confrontational, and I don't think Marcus will want a confrontation with me. You go in, you ask for him, any refusal, any trouble, you walk right back out again. Mary said, Kim, go and find Mr. Mills, apprise him of what's happened and tell him I want him up here. George, be safe. You ever done anything like this before? George asked as he, Sholto, and I headed to the pub. Nothing quite like this, Sholto said. I'm not really sure what this is, I said. Me neither, George said. I've planned for most things. The power plant melting down, the grain ships being sunk, the arrival of thousands of new survivors, and that their arrival also brings an outbreak of typhoid or worse. I worried about scurvy and dysentery, and the next generation growing up feral. I was naive to think we could ignore crime. I'd call it wishful thinking rather than naivety, Sholto said. Uh, maybe you're right. George said, but whatever you call it, the blame lies with me. Absence of law doesn't make a crime-free state. I shouldn't have dragged my feet about those judges. Of course it's easy to drag your feet when you've got your head in the sand. We lost someone. Someone good. Let's make sure David Llewellyn is the last one. Mr. Tull, welcome. A pint? Marcus asked. The pub was emptier than usual. The bearded man was in his chair, and the two women sat at their table with a pile of books that might have been the same as the ones before. The group who'd sat by the window were absent, but Paul was there, sitting on his stool at the edge of the bar. He stared at us, his eyes flitting from George to Sholto to me. The left side of his face was scratched, and he was sporting a new black eye. My mouth went dry, and my hand went to my belt. I had to keep reminding myself that there's a difference between evidence and proof. This isn't a social call, Marcus, George said. There's been a death, a murder. Oh, Marcus asked, joviality dropping from his voice and face. You're serious? Where? When? Who? The man who Bill and Sholto rescued out of the mainland, David Llewellyn, George said. Someone stabbed him last night. Paul's face paled. He turned to look at the door. You think it was me? Marcus asked. Was it? It was movie night, Marcus said. A Romero double bill. I can give you a list of witnesses. I bet you can, George said. What about you, Paul? Where were... The man sprung up, a gun in his hand. Sholto dived forward. I dived sideways, just as Paul fired. George fell with a grunt of pain. I looked down. He was clutching his shoulder. I looked up and saw Paul disappearing through the back door of the pub. Sholto vaulted over the bar. Go! George hissed. I limped to the front door and was outside before I realized I'd never catch him. I crossed the car park to the wall that separated it from the road. Below, I saw Paul running down the road, gun in his hand, his fists pumping. Sholto was thirty yards behind and closing. I'd drawn my pistol without even thinking, and had it half raised before I forced my hand down. Even if Paul was standing still, it was unlikely I'd hit him. Sholto was gaining. Twenty yards. Fifteen. 
I wanted my brother to shoot Paul, but Sholto hadn't even drawn his gun. Time seemed to slow as the distance between them shrank. Paul spun around, pivoting. His gun hand came up. There was a loud, echoing shot. Paul collapsed. Momentum kept Sholto running a few more steps. He came to a halt by the corpse. His hands were empty. He'd not fired. Paul hadn't fired. So who had? The shot had come from my right. I turned that way looking for the shooter. I'm not sure whom I expected. Marcus, perhaps, or Mr. Mills, or maybe one of his sailors? It was Rachel. She stood near the rear door of the pub, holding an ancient hunting rifle. She lowered the gun, placed it on the ground, and then crossed to the low stone wall. She sat down and hung her head. Sholto had a hand on his belt and his eyes on the woman. Around him in the street were dozens of people. I'd been so intent on the pursuit, I'd not even seen them. Rachel. Paul. It was all too much to process. Then I remembered George. I ran back inside. Marcus and the bearded man were bent over the old man, applying a bandage to his shoulder. I didn't know, Marcus said speaking to me as much to George. I really didn't. I had nothing to do with it, I swear. It's a through and through, the bearded man said, his voice gruff and low. The bone's not broken, but we need to get into the clinic. Rachel shot Paul, I said. She did? Marcus asked. He looked at me, and I at him. There was something in his eyes. Confusion, yes, but something else. No, I realized. It was a lack of something. For some reason he didn't seem surprised. This isn't the place to have a discussion, Dr. Knight said. A group of us had gathered in the clinic outside the small ward in which George now lay unconscious. We need Mary for this, I said, and the Admiral. Both women were by George's bedside. How is he? Kim asked. Asleep, Dr. Knight said. If we had more morphine, I'd say he was sedated, but I've only enough to take the edge off the pain. The bullet went through muscle. He was lucky, but it's still a bullet wound. At his age, he may never recover full use of his arm. He certainly won't be going out into the wasteland this year, and never again if I have my way. He won't like that, Donnie said. He'll be grateful he's alive. Dr. Knight said. Why did he do it? George or Paul? Donnie asked. We might as well only do this once, I said. Can we go in? You can use the room next door, Dr. Knight said. Five minutes later we were sitting in uncomfortable armchairs facing one another. Mary was pensive, only half with us. The Admiral looked as if she was still weighing up whether she and her crew were going to stay or leave. Mr. Mills looked furious, though I think it was with himself. Captain Devine sat at attention, as if she'd retreated into the familiar comfort of regulations. Donnie was sitting with George, and I thought he might well be the lucky one. Heather Jones kept glancing back and forth between the military officers. Word of Llewellyn's murder had spread to Menai Bridge and she descended on Hollyhead with Lilith, Will, Lorraine, and Simon. They were waiting outside, along with Gunderson's escort. I'll be honest, the two groups reminded me more of rival war parties than bodyguards. Kim looked worried, Sholto tired, Dr. Knight anxious to get back to her patient. Leon was halfway to Svalbard, and Sophia had already headed back out to sea. Our group was hardly democratic, but that was the crux of our problem. Since no one else was talking, I began. At least fifty people saw Rachel shoot Paul, I said. We told them, the same as we told Marcus when we went into the pub, that Paul was wanted for murder, and that he ran. Why did Rachel do it? the Admiral asked. A good question, but I didn't have a good answer. She said it was because he shot at George. 
She said it was self-defense. It was hardly that, Sholto said. Not from that range. He had a gun almost pointing at you, Kim said. That's right, isn't it? Paul was turning around. There was a gun in his hand. He knew Sholto was pursuing him, I said. He appeared to be aware that someone was pursuing him. Devine corrected me. Did you gather any evidence from the crime scene near Willow Farm? Heather Jones asked. I collected samples from underneath David Llewellyn's fingernails, Devine said, and from the damp area of soil into which I believe the beer bottles were emptied. I took fingerprints from the light switch, the bottles, and the chair. There was an exercise book in the living room. Next to it was a half-drunk cup of tea. I believe that the victim was writing in the book at the time the killer came to the house. The first seven pages were ripped out. No other pages have written on them. I have to assume that was done by the killer. We can store the samples, but we can't do anything else. There's no forensic lab on this island. When it comes to DNA or running a spectroscopic analysis, we'd have to salvage equipment from somewhere else. Captain, do you think that this man, Paul, was the murderer? the Admiral asked. A plausible narrative to that effect can be constructed from the available evidence, ma'am, Devine said. Meaning? Mills asked. Meaning probably, Shalto said. Paul shot George. He's guilty, and he's dead. That's what matters. What matters is what we do with Rachel, Mary said. Her voice was low, almost a whisper. The room went quiet again. The silence grew expectant, uncomfortable. Again, I decided to break it, because there was only one thing to say, only one course open to us. There has to be a trial, I said, a proper trial, with a jury and a judge. She shot a man in front of fifty witnesses. Yes, I believe Paul was going to shoot Shalto, and that man had just shot George. I'll say as much in court, but the words do need to be said in court, because what I believe, what anyone believes is true, isn't the same as the actual truth. Look, we know what's going to happen. We know the outcome. She'll be set free, but it has to be done properly. We here can't decide on her guilt or innocence any more than we could on Paul's. Not because we don't know the outcome— not because we can't draw as fair a conclusion from the evidence as anyone else, but because of the precedent. This won't be the last time there's a crime. It probably won't be the last time there's a murder. How we respond in the future will be determined by how we act now. We need laws. We need justice. More than that, everyone needs to see that we have them. It's a waste of time, Mills said. What's the alternative? Kim asked. Ask her nicely not to do it again? I don't know the details of how you survived the outbreak, but you've read Bill's journal. You know what happened to us, to me. You know what we did. Everyone does. It's trite to say bad things happened, and foolish to believe only the victims survived. We say that what we did out there is forgotten. But look at Nilda and Rob. Look at how that could have ended. No, Bill's right. What matters here is precedent. We need the trial to mark an official turning point, the moment when we distinguish past from present, the point where we say that it is what people do that matters, not where or when it was done. Not an amnesty, but an acceptance, that we're all flawed, all potentially guilty, but that we live in a place where everyone will get a fair hearing, a fair chance. We might know why Paul was running, but everyone else only knows what we told them, that he was wanted for murder. Do we want a society where a death doesn't need to be investigated if it's claimed that a deceased was wanted for questioning? I don't want to live somewhere like that. But there's nowhere else. It's Anglesey and Svalbard, and that's all. If we want civilization to have a future, it has to be here. Then have a tribunal, Mills said, like we did with the petty thefts. We'll hold it in public. Everyone can watch. 
Quis custodiet ipsus custodes? Sholto murmured. And do the watchmen write the laws as well? We can stick with the old laws for now, I said, and repeal them when it becomes apparent they no longer apply. The key principle is to have a system where the laws protect everyone, apply to everyone, and can be challenged by everyone. Otherwise, we might as well call ourselves a dictatorship and be done with it. How do we organize the trial? Mary whispered. Admiral, I said before anyone else could speak, would you be the judge? I'm a doctor, she said. I don't know anything about British law. You're also an admiral, I said, and the rank brings a degree of respect. But you're a doctor gives you more, and that you're an outsider, newly arrived, gives you more impartiality than anyone else. Admiral Gunderson looked at Devine before answering. Agreed. Inwardly, and careful not to let it show, I relaxed. The Admiral could change her mind, but that was as close to a guarantee that she wouldn't depart as we'd get. At least she and her crew weren't going to leave immediately and right then, though I'm not sure everyone else realized it. That was the greatest danger to our fracturing community. How do you pick the jury? Sholto asked. We'll do it the old-fashioned way, I said. Use the electorate but I think this is a time when a chance to sit on a jury might actually encourage people to register to vote. A judge? A jury? Mills murmured. You know what you've missed? Punishment! Those have to be known and announced before the trial. What punishment can there be? I asked. We can't afford to imprison people, not for an extended period of time. We can't find them, so what's left? Hard labor, exile, or death? That's harsh, Kim said, but necessary, Mill said. There was a general murmur of consent from everyone except Kim and Mary, who had her eyes on the floor. I don't like it, Kim said. This isn't like being out in the wasteland. We're sitting here making up these rules, but we've no authority to do so. No right except that we happen to be here, literally. If Annette and I hadn't spent more time at the airfield this morning, we wouldn't have come to the school in time to find out about Llewellyn's murder. It's not right that I get a vote here when no one else does, yet not right that I wouldn't get a say. We can spend winter wrangling over a constitution, I said, but for now we need to hold things together. I glanced again at the Admiral. We just need to stop it from unravelling. Gottlieb, Mary said. The room went quiet again. I'm sorry? Kim said. Rachel Gottlieb. Mary said, that's her name. Rachel Gottlieb. David Llewellyn. Paul Harding. She sighed. This is not how I imagined it. I thought, if we could wait until winter, the cold would force people off their boats. We'd plough the fields next year and plant them the year after. It would only have needed a few of us working on the longer problems of what to do when we shut down the power plant, of salvaging the helicopters, perhaps even getting rid of the undead. Within five years we'd have had a blueprint for civilization, having salvaged all that was good from the old world, not just material possessions, but ideas as well, leaving behind all that was archaic and rotten. Now, I can't see any of it coming to pass. At best we might recreate what went before. At worst, I don't want to think of it, though now it's clear how much worse things can get. There and then, she seemed older and frailer than ever before. I wanted to offer the comfort of some kind words, but there were none. It's a fantasy, I said, a delusion from which we're all suffering. It's the same one those people ensconced in their boats are immersed in, at least when they disappear into old movies and older music. They're not pretending they're doing anything but seeking an escape from reality. Take George's Railroad, 
the people traveling the mainland ostensibly in search of survivors. They might find one or two and kill just as many zombies, but not enough of either to make a difference. Captain Mills here may call himself Mr., and he may have dropped the HMS from his boat's name, but he's still commanding his submarine and crew as if he was Royal Navy. Heather Jones and her people and Menai Bridge are preserving houses, but the bricks will have turned to dust before our population is large enough to occupy them again. Dr. Umber acts like he's collecting data to present at some psychiatric conference. Marcus thinks he's running a smuggler's den in 1940s Marseille. Sholto has dreams of saving the world from an apocalypse he's already failed to stop, and me? I'm house hunting and thinking of picnics and birthday cakes. We each had a vision of the future, an idea of what safety meant. It was what sustained us, what got us through the horrors, but none of us have let it go. Now we have to, we have to accept it was a mirage. So what do we do differently? Kim asked. That's the wrong question, I said. It's not about what, but how. How do we do things differently? I've no idea. You're right. This here is it. We are it. This isn't civilization, but it's the only seed out of which it will grow. The trial, the election, that will be a distraction. It'll hold things together for a few more weeks, but nothing more, and we sorely need something more. I don't know what, but we have to come together as a proper community, not just a collection of individuals with our individual dreams. And that was what I was trying to do, Mary said. She cleared her throat and forced some resolve back into her voice. I suppose... I shall just have to try harder. We all will. As you say, people need to know what happened. We should tell them. We should tell everyone. There needs to be a formal meeting. Dr. Knight, Mr. Mills, myself and... No, I, I don't think you should be there, Admiral Gunderson. This isn't the time to introduce you. Captain Devine, I think you should be there as an officer of the law albeit a now defunct one. I would like to present the evidence that was gathered which proves Paul's guilt. Devine narrowed her eyes. I'll present the evidence, she said, and I noted the omission, but even that would prejudice any trial. It's already prejudice, the Admiral said, finally breaking her impartial silence. The woman will be found innocent, so let's keep the peace. Do you have printers, ink? Can you run up a statement that can be handed out? Something that will stop fear spreading? I can manage that, I said. And this morning you said something about a radio station, the Admiral said. We don't have one yet, Kim said. I wanted to build one. Pity, the Admiral said. It would have been useful. That's one more thing that must be done, Mary said. One more thing on an increasingly long list. Chapter 11 Anglesey, the 3rd of September, Day 175 Kim was up before me, but then I'd sat up for half the night trying to square the three-dimensional polygon that was our current societal mess. Sholto and Annette went into town, Kim said as I came into the kitchen. Annette has a plan, and she roped in your brother. I'm not sure what she's up to, but they took Daisy. Ah. I opened the cupboard. There was one tea bag left. The coffee jar was empty. I sighed and poured a glass of water from the tap. On any other day, I'd say we should take advantage of the solitude and do something. Just the two of us. Any other day, she echoed. The public meeting had been a haphazard affair, taking place in the embarkation lounge of the ferry terminal. To an audience of less than a hundred, Mary had given a speech, Devine had presented her evidence, and Dr. Knight had given a brief statement of an even briefer analysis on Llewellyn's body. 
By the time Mr. Mills stood to offer a few pro forma words on law and order, news had spread among the boats, more people had come ashore, and Mary had to start again. She'd given the same speech five times and answered the same questions just as often, before the crowd finally thinned. I'd run up a few thousand copies of a short statement that echoed Mary's words, but doubted it had done little beyond fanning the flames of suspicious interest. Can we hold things together? Kim asked. Sure, I said, for now. You're right and wrong about civilization. Whatever survives here, however democratic or dystopian, and however large a population it has, it will be civilization. As to whether we can forge something no worse than what we had a year ago, we'll know in a few weeks. There's a bigger problem looming. It's something I didn't think about until George mentioned it, but it's not been far from my mind since. We have a generational gap. Two hundred and seventy children. In twenty years, I know, she interrupted. But that's a problem to which there's an obvious solution, just not an immediate one. The immediate problem, she opened a cupboard, then another, we can't leave, simply because there's nowhere within range of a sailing ship we can reach, not that we have a sailing ship, so if we're staying, we need more supplies, organizing an election should entitle you to something, I'll write it into the rules, I said, only half sarcastically, then in the meantime, let's see if we can blag some coffee from the bakery. I want to go down to the harbour anyway. You do? Why? I asked. To see how many boats are there. I bet a lot left with the first tide and have no intention of coming back. I froze, with my hand halfway to my belt. There'd be no sound or other hint of immediate danger. I just realised how automatic it had become to leave the house armed. I buckled the belt and then reached to the shelf above the door where we kept the ammunition out of reach of Daisy. I sighed. Yes, whatever this is, however good or bad, it really is all we have. We've got to make it work, I said. We really do. It was a beautiful morning. There were enough clouds to give shade, but not so many as to dull the late summer heat. The hedges and trees were still green. The birds still flew, though I thought there were more robins and fewer starlings than when we'd first arrived. I made a mental note to ask someone whether that might be due to migration, or whether it implied something else. It was promptly forgotten, as Kim and I talked around and about the murder, the trial, the island and the future. Having reached no conclusion satisfactorily to either of us, conversation turned to the election. I outlined the plans I'd reached, and how I thought they could be adapted to help in our current situation. I don't like it, Kim said. If people want to stay on a ship, they should be able to. I'm not saying they can't, I said. What I'm saying is that to register to vote, you'll need an address on shore. It doesn't mean you have to live there. It could be a nominal address, the bakery, the pub even. That's another problem that needs a solution, Kim said because I bet they charge for the privilege of registering to vote from there. No, scratch that. What I think Marcus will actually do is use that as a way of engineering it so his candidates win. Perhaps. I'd not thought of that. I'd thought it might get another few hundred off their boats and into houses. It's not worth it, Kim said. Not for adding conditions to someone's eligibility to vote, especially not when it might hand control to Marcus. What are we going to do about him? What can we do? There's no evidence suggesting he was involved, and I don't know why, but I don't think he had anything to do with David Llewellyn's murder. He seemed genuinely shocked. And his first instinct was to help the old man after George was shot. Rachel didn't shoot Paul in self-defense, Kim said. Whatever the reason is, Marcus has to know. It has to be something to do with a pub and that should be enough to have it shut down. Not if she's found not guilty, I said. The incident came back to me. She seemed shocked. Afterwards, I mean. It's an odd emotion. Is it? I think so. I'm not sure. I should find some time to talk to Captain Devine. 
or perhaps to Dr. Umbert. Perhaps there's a psychological explanation to... to... I trailed into silence. We were two streets away from the harbour, but there were more people about than usual. Their numbers could be counted in dozens, not hundreds, but it was still far more than we'd ordinarily see. I smiled a greeting and got a nod in return. What's going on? Kim murmured. We found the answer in the old charity shop opposite the bakery. Three flat screens had been set up in the window. Outside was a small crowd of people. I craned to see over them. Satellite images, I murmured. Under the screens were pieces of card, with Blackpool, New York and Belfast written on them in a very familiar hand. Near the door was a whiteboard with the instruction, Write down your address and we'll find the picture. I recognise the handwriting, I said. I recognise the spelling, Kim said. Underneath the misspelled missive was a long list of place names. Some were in Britain, but most were elsewhere. We pushed our way to the door, and I pushed it open just as Annette pushed her way through the crowd inside. In her arms was another flat screen. Oh, cool, you're here. You can help, she said, shoving the screen into my hands. What with? I asked. We need to expand next door, she said. There's not enough room in here. What for? I asked. The satellites, she said. Could we have a little more explanation than that? Kim asked. Come in then, I can spare you five minutes, Annette said. Kim and I shared a glance that was as much confusion as it was amusement. It looked as if the contents of the shop had long since been stripped. The racks and shelves had been haphazardly stacked at the rear. In the middle were a row of tables on which were flat screens. Behind the counter was a stack of tower units with cables trailing this way and that. My brother was on his hands and knees, coaxing a wire through the door leading to the back room. You need some air conditioning in here, Kim said, wiping the sweat from her brow. Tell me about it, Annette said. And why don't you tell me what's going on? I said, it's the satellites, she said, gesturing at the screens in the middle of the room. In front of each was a cluster of almost transfixed people. Satellite images of where? I asked. Everywhere, Annette said. Mostly New York and the east coast of the U.S., Sholto called out from the floor. A wide swathe of the ocean, Belfast and the area around the airport, and Hull, and a hundred square miles of the northeast English coast. It's the images we downloaded before the satellites were repositioned to track the hordes. I took another look at the nearest screen. It showed three very square blocks of housing perfectly divided by wide roads. I guessed it was somewhere in New York. The roads were full of stalled traffic, but otherwise I couldn't see anything of interest. Why? I asked. It's what we decided, Annette said. We talked about it, didn't we? You were going to sort out the drones, and Kim was going to build the radio, so I'm finding the survivors. By looking at satellite pictures, I asked. We look at the images, and then we mark them off on the maps. Annette gestured to the stack of atlases and road maps on the table near the wall. Anything that looks like it might be people gets noted down. We're going to draw up a list, so when we can change the orbit of the satellite, we'll know where to look. Why here? Kim asked. Why not at home? Annette pointed to the crowd outside. I thought people might be interested. I was right. We have to start somewhere, Sholto said. So let's start with what we've got. I sensed he wasn't talking about the satellites. I'd not seen much of him after the shooting. In retrospect, I realized that I should have made time. He was the one who'd almost been shot after all. Whether this was how he was dealing with it or whether he'd come to some deeper understanding of our situation, he'd found a way to work through it. And what he was working on was far more productive than my fretting over the future. You did this yourself? I asked. Oh, no, Annette said. Thaddeus helped. Helped? He muttered, taking a pair of wire strippers to the cable's plastic coating. I glanced around the room again then out the window. It had seemed like a lot of people. In truth, it was about thirty, but
but that was still significant. People were looking at the screens, writing down a location on the board and then drifting away. I remembered what Lorraine had said on our boat ride to Carnarfon, that a few weeks before everyone had feared Quigley's submarine would kill them all. What people had needed was hope. I, George, Mary, all of us who had claimed some portion of leadership, had failed to provide it. Here it was. It was small, almost to the point of insignificance, almost, but it was tangible. It wasn't the hope that some relative's home might be found intact and full of life. It was simply the knowledge that there was a world beyond the island, ruined, wrecked, yet still there. All those grand schemes for elections and economies, currency and constitutions, they were important, but too abstract. The images shone a light on the terror that had gripped each of us since the power first went out. It was why the journal had been so popular. It provided proof of a sort, where before there had only been rumours and hearsay. An image on a screen was believable. It was understandable. The image on the screen immediately in front of us certainly was. Which airport is that? Kim asked. Belfast International, an Australian voice said. I realised the man standing right in front of me was Scott Higson, the baker. That's where there's helicopters and tankers full of aviation fuel, I asked. That's it, he said. You can't see them from here, they're a mile to the south. Can we drag the image? I began, reaching for the mouse. Of course not, Annette said, in an almost perfect imitation of Kim. Honestly, Bill, it's not like an internet map, it's just pictures that we've downloaded. We need special software to stitch them together before you can... Her eyes narrowed as she tried to remember the explanation she'd been given. You know, before you can click and drag and stuff. You can't expect us to have done that as well. Fair enough, Kim said. So what's so interesting about the runway? Do you see it? Higson asked. The runway, sure, I said. That's my point, Higson said. You can see it. Not all of it, Kim said. A couple of jets have crashed halfway along. Oh, that's a Boeing 757, and that one, that's an Airbus A320, Hickson said. So the question is, how wide is the gap between the wings? You can see the damage to the Boeing's tail section. And you see the shadow under the Airbus? Its undercarriage has collapsed. I peered at the screen, uncertain which shadow I was looking at. You mean you can't fly them? Kim asked. Oh, I can fly anything, Hickson said, as long as it's airworthy. But those two aren't. No, it's a matter of clearance. That's why I was looking here at the hangar. I'm positive that's an old VC-10. I'm lost, I said, and realised that everyone inside the room was listening. It's a supply plane, Hickson said. The RAF used them for refuelling and transport. They were retired from service a few years back, but I'm sure that's what it is. Begs the question of how it ended up there, of course. Must have arrived during the quarantine. Otherwise, why'd it be in a hangar? I reckon someone started taxiing it out onto the runway, then changed their mind. Now, conscious of my audience, I chose my words with care. And why is that plane important? Of course, it's the runway, isn't it? Kim said. I'm sorry we didn't tell you, Bill. So much happened that I forgot. I didn't, Annette said. We went to the runway yesterday, Kim said, while you were... And she hesitated, as if she'd just become aware of all the people listening. While you were investigating the murder, Annette and I went to the runway. And you should have just come and asked, Hickson said. There's a few potholes to fill and some debris to clear. But give me a couple of days and a few strong backs and it'll be fine for your drones. More importantly, it'll be perfect for a VC-10. They were originally designed for ramshackle runways. I still don't follow, I said. Why do we need a plane? It's the fuel, Hickson said. Those fuel tankers near the airport. The plan was to bring it back in helicopters, but what do we need them for? We want to fly drones, right? That's the plan, isn't it? Well, a drone needs far less fuel than a helicopter, so why not fly it in? 
We send some people in, secure the runway, fill up the plane and fly it back. Simple. It'll be no more than a day's work and an hour's flight. It would be more work than that, but I didn't say so. There had been a muttered agreement from the people in the room, and it was edged with enthusiasm. I, I suppose, I said slowly, but, um... I'm not sure we can spare the special forces and sailors for this, and we can't ask the Americans, not yet. They're going to need a few weeks to get used to dry land. We'd have to get volunteers. Yeah, no worries, Hickson said, addressing the room. So who's up for it? And there was an almost enthusiastic response. Almost. That enthusiasm might disappear before there was a boat ready to leave. A large portion of it would disappear as soon as everyone left the shop. Perhaps it was because departure wasn't imminent that people were happy to volunteer. It didn't matter. It was something, and it was more than we'd had a week before, and infinitely more than either Kim or I had expected to find when we'd left the house. So, what about it then? Hickson said. Is it a gower? I had no authority but they'd all read the journal. They knew me and what I'd done, and knew that I was, if not in power, at least in close proximity to it. At the moment, the satellites are tracking the hordes for the groups that are on the mainland, I said. As soon as they're back, we'll get some more pictures of Belfast and the airport. We'll need a route in and a route out, and a lot more planning besides that, if we're going to do it safely. But I think so. I'll take the idea to Mary and see what she says. That was unexpected, I said to Kim when we were outside. Was it? Kim said. Why should we be the only people worrying about the future? In fact, when you think about it, those people on the boats must do little else. Otherwise they really would come ashore. As for Annette, she must have heard us talking last night. It must have terrified her, but she'll never admit it. She wants to control her fears, I think, though I'm saying that because it's what I try to do. She felt she had to do something, so she ran with the idea that we discussed. The radio, the drones, that was just idle talk, I said. I don't think she knows what that is, Kim said, and to be honest, that's for the best. There's an opportunity here, something we can build on, a moment that could become a movement. Then we'd better speak to Mary and George, I said. You do that, Kim said. I'm going to find some more screens, some more computers too. Maybe see if Scott will provide bread and coffee for all these people, and then see if I can get them to help clear the runway before their enthusiasm fades. Yes, Bill, this really could become something. George was in the clinic and still in his hospital bed. Mary was by his side and tried to shoo me away. But the old man welcomed me in. That girl of yours has hidden wits as well as deaths, Mary said, after I'd explained what Annette had done and how people had reacted. We were planning a trip to Belfast, but not like this. What do you think, George? As you keep reminding me, he said, know your weaknesses, know your strengths, and know them in others, too. I don't know where we'll find any drones or whether there's really any point looking. But that fuel could power some tractors. Not many, Mary said. But maybe it'll be enough, George said. Bringing back one plane is easier than a squadron of helicopters that might not have the range. I think it's time to accept our old plans need to be torn up. Even if we persuade Svalbard to hand over their oil, how are we going to bring it down here? How long will it take? No. One trip, one plane, and we might have enough fuel to get the fields ploughed before the first frost. What else do we need the oil for right now? We can row to Carnarfon and Bangor, and sail to the Isle of Man and Island. If the Admiral wants to leave, let her, and let her have Svalbard's oil. She can't possibly use it all. And what does it matter if she goes? As long as she knows she'll always find a safe harbour here. She's talking about leaving, I asked. She is, Mary said, 
Until her ship is repaired, it's a threat more than a promise, but it has been made. Hmm. She closed her eyes for a moment. I'll be glad when someone else is doing this job. Drones! I cannot see how they would help us rescue anyone. It was an idle conversation, I said, but I don't think Annette realized that. If we find signs of people, we'll launch a rescue mission, George said. Of course we will. And if we manage to get some drones, we'll find a use for them. Right now what's important is taking advantage of people's enthusiasm. It's better than forcing them into action through fear. And that's what we were planning to do with this trial. You don't think we should have a trial? I asked. He raised his hand to his bandaged shoulder. An inch lower, and I wouldn't be saying anything at all. Not ever again, but no. There has to be a trial. I've got a list of lawyers in my notebook at home. There's a star by the name of those I think could be judges. They're impartial, he added, or as close to it as you can get. Hold a trial and do it quickly. Don't cover it up, but let it be overshadowed by all of this. Mary mulled it over. I wanted people to leave their boats. I wanted them to come ashore, to live without fear, to farm, to live an older style of life. But they don't want to, Mary, George said. Not yet, at least. No, she agreed. Then let's put out another statement. We'll ask for volunteers to report to the airport. Then we'll know how deep this enthusiasm runs. Belfast won't be enough, I said. We can use the satellites to survey the coast. We could dispatch sailing boats to anywhere there might be supplies or people. It doesn't matter whether any are found. What matters is that people go, return, and are willing to venture out again. The lad has a point, George said. But as it's important that people return, we should pick the places we send them with care. Nowhere too far from the coast, Mary said. The Isle of Man, perhaps. That emergency beacon that Kim saw as they were sailing north to Svalbard didn't turn itself on. And then there's the woman she found, Nilda. How many others are clinging onto some barren rock in the middle of an angry ocean? I wanted people to leave their boats. But perhaps we can make use of their desire to live afloat. What about that house in Ireland? The one with the turbines and solar panels, George said. Didn't Shalto say it was close to the coast? I dare say people would enjoy looting a billionaire's mansion. I dare say they would, Mary said. But not you, George. You heard what the doctor said. Yes, we'll abandon our old plans. But we've got the beginnings of a new one. Chapter 12 Elysium The Republic of Ireland 0930, the 21st of September, day 193 That was far from the end of it. There was a trial in which Rachel was found not guilty. Dozens of expeditions were organized, but that wasn't the only byproduct of Llewellyn's murder and Paul's death. There is a lot more to tell. But it will have to wait, because as I was writing, I heard gunfire. I left the small office, climbed up onto the garage's roof, and crawled along to its edge. The zombies by the sheet metal shutters had already begun drifting away. They moved in such an erratic fashion that it was hard to pinpoint precisely where they were heading, but it wasn't directly towards the mansion. I waited, half hoping for more shots. They didn't come. I saw two possible explanations for the gunfire. It might be deliberate, an attempt to distract the undead as Kim, Simon and Rob made an attempt at rescue. I lay there, watching, waiting, hoping, but saw no one. The other darker and more plausible reason for the shots was that they'd run out of ammunition for the assault rifles. Simon and Rob's SA-80s and Kim's sniper rifle have suppressors. An unsilenced shot meant they'd resorted to their sidearms. To me, 
that spoke of desperation. I counted to five, then to ten, twenty, thirty, a minute, two. All the time, I told myself to watch and wait, that I'd see a zombie fall and the rescue begin. Five minutes passed, and I'd seen nothing except the undead slowly lurching away. Whether the worst had happened or not, the zombies were distracted, and that gave me an opportunity that I had to take. I had to get to the mansion. If Kim had escaped, I wouldn't be able to catch up with her. If she was in danger, I might already be too late. A hasty survey of each of the roof's four sides gave me a rough estimate of the danger I was about to throw myself into. There were still twenty zombies within a grasping arm's reach of the metal shutters. Another ten were drifting towards the fountain twenty meters to the north. There were none directly between the garage and the western side of the mansion. However, there were many more near the tennis court, pushing their way through the branches of the fir hedge. I ignored them. The mansion was my goal. As quietly as I could, I climbed back down into the office and moved the filing cabinet from where it was blocking the door. Agonizing over the rasp of rusting metal, I slid back the bolts. I wasn't going to escape through that door, but I've been trapped too often not to leave an escape route prepared. If I couldn't get inside the house, I'd need somewhere to which I could retreat. I climbed up onto the roof and pulled the ladder up after me. There were only two zombies on the western side of the garage, and I'd already decided that was where I would descend. The creature furthest from the mansion was bareheaded and scalped. Otherwise, it was so covered in mud, I couldn't tell if it was wearing the outdoor gear of one of Kempton's people. It was squatting, chin against chest, with its knuckles lying languidly on the ground. The other, the zombie closest to the mansion, wore a black and white fur hat and an American-style baseball jacket. It had heard me. At least, it had heard something. It had risen from its somnolent crouch and now stood, back bent, head swiveling from side to side, but its attention was on the house. I'd have about three seconds' advantage. I positioned the ladder on the roof, ten feet from the scalped zombie, and then crept back along the edge. I dropped the pike so it landed spear point first in front of the jacketed creature. With a snarl, the zombie swiped at the weapon. I ran back to the ladder, dropped it over the side, and hop jumped down. I spared half a second to stamp on the bottom rung, digging the ladder's legs deep into the loose soil. The scalp zombie was only just beginning to stand, so I ignored it. Drawing the hatchet, I raised it above my head as the jacketed zombie staggered towards me. There was just enough time to register the receding-lipped snarl on a sunken face, the mud-coated jeans, and the nape-to-navel rip in its red-checkered shirt. It lurched a final step, and I swung the axe down. The blade split skin, cracked bone, and destroyed brain. For the fleetest of moments, its expression froze and almost, almost looked human. It fell. I tore the axe free and jammed it back in my belt as I limped over to the pike, still vibrating back and forth in the soil. I ripped it free, twirling it round and up in a fountain of mud and grass. Keep moving, I thought, and don't look back. That was easy to think, hard to do. I could hear the zombie lumbering behind me, but there wasn't time to fight. I reached the garage's edge. The zombies beating against the shutters had heard me. They were bumping into one another as they staggered my way, arms outstretched, mouths gaping open. Don't look, I thought, and fixed my eyes on the house. To my right came the sound of two dozen sets of decaying lungs expelling unbreathed air. I limped on. My eyes stayed glued to the ten marble steps leading up to the door of the mansion until I sensed movement to my right. Three zombies rounded the corner, 
walking so close together, it was almost as if they had their arms on one another's shoulders. I reached the steps. Using the pike as a crutch, I hauled myself up the steep, worn stones, dragging my bad leg after me. The brace, which had made walking almost as easy as it had been a year ago, made the steps as much of an obstacle for me as they were for the undead. I reached the top. The door was locked. I pushed. I slammed a fist into the wood. It didn't move. Of course. It was locked. I spent so much time debating the fate of Kim, Simon and Rob, I'd not given thought to the obvious. Cursing loudly, I turned around. The trio of zombies were less than ten paces from the bottom of the stairs. A slip stepped down. They got closer. When I was on the fifth step, I gave a wild, one-handed swing of the pike. The blade hit the lead creature's face. The axe cut into its eyes. The force knocked it back a pace and into the arms of the zombie behind. They stumbled, but I lost my grip. The pike fell. There wasn't time to pick it up. I threw myself down the last steps as the trio of zombies pushed and shoved their way free of one another. I ignored them, and the creatures coming from the garage. I drew the pistol as I limped around the perimeter of the house. My attention was now on the windows. The four on the ground floor to the left of the door were covered, and there wasn't time to force an entry. I reached the edge of the house just as a figure staggered around the corner and almost into my arms. A jagged gash ran down a forehead stained blue with paint. I hesitated, but only for a heartbeat. Those eyes were unmistakably inhuman. Sorry, I said, ramming the pistol's barrel under its chin. I fired and didn't look at the corpse as it fell. I kept on, passing one window and then the next, down the long length of the large house. My eyes caught the glint of glass in the flower bed outside the fifth window. It was five feet above the ground and surrounded by a jaunty pine trellis. As I drew level with it, I could make out the dim outline of the room's ceiling. I hesitated. There were ten zombies following me and I could hear a sea of rustling cloth behind them. If I went inside, I'd be stuck there. If Kim had fired the shots as she escaped, I'd be unable to go after her. The zombies drew nearer. If she'd escaped, she might be alive. If she hadn't, she might be dying. I swept the pistol along the bottom of the frame, knocking the jagged shards clear, reached up and pulled myself inside. The floor was lower than I'd thought, and I landed heavily. I pushed myself upright, blinking, as my eyes adjusted to the gloom. All the light was behind me, so the door had to be closed, though I couldn't see it. I couldn't see much. There was a long table in the middle of the room with chairs around it. Two had been knocked over. Then I saw a familiar face staggering towards me. I froze. It was Simon. His eyes were blank. His nose was broken. Blood stained his shirt from a horrific wound on his neck. Simon, I began, but managed to say no more as the zombie fell on me. The gun fell from my grip, and we fell to the floor. I shoved my forearm up, jamming it under Simon's throat. I wanted to keep those snapping teeth away from my face. I wanted to tell him to stop. I wanted to scream. More than anything, I wanted to get the butting, kicking creature off me. With a heave, I rolled us over so that I was on top. Simon pushed, pulled, shook and kicked, and I did the same until my hand was free. I drew my knife and stabbed it down through Simon's eye. I pushed myself off the corpse, grabbed the edge of the table and pulled myself up. Simon, I said, staring at his body. Simon. My brain was finding it hard to process the obvious in front of my eyes. One thought rose through the babbling recriminations clouding my mind. Kim. I searched for the gun, found it, and only then thought to check that there was no one else in the room. I was alone. The glass was outside, I muttered, 
I should have realized there are zombies in here. I looked again at Simon's body. The wound on his shoulder didn't look like it had come from snapping teeth or clawing hands. You're stalling, I said, and got a sighing rasp in reply. It came from outside the window. Withered, broken, desiccated arms brushed against the frame. I upturned the table and dragged it to the broken window. It was an ineffective barrier, but it made me feel better. The zombies could still get in. I'd seen it before at Brazley Abbey and elsewhere. When they scrummed against a solid wall, pushing and shoving and trampling one another to try to get to their prey, the weaker creatures would be pushed underfoot and so form a rampart for the others. If that happened here, they could push against the table and push it out of the way, but that would take hours. Out of sight isn't out of mind, as the zombies are never far from the surface of mine, but it pushed them from the forefront and gave me time to think. Kim, I murmured. I found myself looking again at Simon. Did she and Rob escape? Is that what happened? But you stayed behind, holding off the undead. If that was the case, then she was truly on her own. I wouldn't be leaving the mansion any time soon. I'd have to search the house and simply hope I didn't find her. If you weren't trapped before, you are now, I murmured, as I bent over Simon's body and pulled my knife free. From outside came another rasping, gasping sigh. I crossed to the door and leaned an ear against it. Nothing. Almost reluctantly I holstered my pistol and raised the knife. I dislike knives. They require getting far too close to the enemy. I had little choice. Guns are too inaccurate, at least in my hands, and corridors are almost always too narrow to swing a hatchet. I confirmed that when I opened the door, took a quick step out and then two back. What I'd seen was a narrow hallway about five feet wide, empty of ornaments, ornamental furniture, and even a carpet. It had also seemed empty of the undead. After I counted a five, and none had appeared in a doorway, and no sounds had emerged from beyond, I stepped out into the hall. Closing the door, I scored a line through the white paint. The color scheme was repeated on the walls, with a slightly paler shade on the faux banister, running at four feet above the ground. It was plain, simple. The house had the feel of a 1910s build, where construction had been interrupted by the revolution. There was something about the set of the windows on the inland side that suggested they'd been added a decade or two later. From these windows, I'd say the mansion has at least ten rooms on each of the three floors, with another six in the attic. What I hadn't considered was that the house, like the garage, would also contain a series of basements. I followed the corridor towards the centre of the building, passing closed room after closed room until I reached the entrance hall. To my right was the front door. It was nailed shut with hefty planking. Wedges had been inserted around the base. I doubted I'd be able to get it open from this side, and saw I stood no chance when I'd been on the other. Opposite the door were the stairs. Again, there was no carpeting. But I was far more interested in how they continued down below the ground floor. This wasn't a set of servant stairs leading to kitchens, and I'd spent enough of my youth in grand houses to know what they looked like. The stairs going down were the same as those going up. As adrenaline wore off, Thirst was making itself known. Supplies were more likely to be found in the basement, but I had to know what had become of Kim. The best place to start my search was the room from which they'd hung the sheets, so I went upstairs. Like the walls, the stairs were painted white. Like the hallways, they were uncarpeted. Like my bones, they creaked as I climbed. The post-action adrenaline crash was setting in made worse by hunger and thirst. My eyes 
felt suddenly heavy, and I had to blink them into focus. Then I saw the wall by the landing on the first floor. That brought me back to fearful alertness. Three huge gouges had been hacked out of the paint and plaster. I'm guessing they were done with a fire axe. There was no blood, however, and no bodies on the landing itself. The white paint looked a little discoloured, but I was more interested in the doors. The stairs led onto a hallway a little narrower than the entrance hall, but still at least ten feet wide. Off it were four doors. Two, opposite one another, were close to the stairwell. The other two were flush against the far wall. On each, an X had been carved into the woodwork. That had to have been Kim. I crossed to the nearest door on the left and tapped the knife against the frame. I listened. The only sounds came from outside the house. I tried the handle. The door wasn't locked. My first thought was that it was a TV room. There were enough screens. Fourteen of them were positioned in the middle of the room in three curving rows around a central desk. My second thought was that it was a security room. I'd seen a few surveillance cameras, and they would have been monitored from somewhere, though it seemed odd that it should be done from one of the house's master rooms. My third thought was satellites. By the time we left Anglesey, Annette and Sholto had taken over a small gym, lining up screens in not too dissimilar a fashion. Despite that our satellites were once owned and operated by Kempton, it's odd that she'd have a room like this. It suggests that Sholto was wrong, and the presence of the cameras wasn't an afterthought or part of Kempton's attempt to camouflage the satellite's true purpose. Perhaps the satellites had been designed for some post-apocalyptic plan. In which case, Kempton's preparations went back a lot further than my brother thought. Like the bodies in the garage, it was an interesting addition to a footnote in history, and one to be investigated later. The room was empty of the living and the undead, so I closed the door and tried the one on the opposite side of the corridor. It was an office, with two leather chairs almost the same shade as the red oak desk between them. The matching effect was spoiled by the pine filing cabinet against the far wall. The top drawer was open. On the desk was a folder embossed with Kempton's logo, a stylized golden wave. The folder was empty. On the tag was a single word, Embarkation. Embark for where? I murmured. And paper files? Kempton didn't rely on digital, not entirely. The reason was obvious, but there was something else I was missing. No dust, I realized. The folder had been placed on the desk recently, presumably by Kim, and she was no longer there. I left the office. The other two doors off the landing led onto corridors. I was tempted to search them, but the room from which Kim had hung the sheets was on the next floor. I decided to assume that the crosses marking the doors meant that Kim had already confirmed there were no undead beyond, and so I was unlikely to find her there. I returned to the stairwell and went up. This landing was different. Again, there were scars on the walls, and they were joined by splits in the wood, by a trio of bullet holes in the ceiling, and a deluge of dried brown bloodstains. A battle had been fought here. Twenty-five cheap identical cabinets were stacked at the top of the stairs. Just over two feet high and a foot and a half deep, they could have come from any flat-pack furniture store. They'd been piled around the stairwell as a barricade, though it was hard to tell on which side the defenders had stood. The ground under my foot felt tacky. Then I realized it wasn't a battle that had been fought there, but two, and the second had been so recent the gore and blood had yet to dry. Hello? I called. There was no response. Beyond the barricade was a landing, similar to the floor below. However, the corridor that ran alongside the exterior windows wasn't sealed behind a door. There were only two doors, each a foot from the landing. 
both led to bedrooms furnished with queen-sized beds, a small desk, a wardrobe, and an easy chair. There was no TV, though one room had a stack of books on the table, the other an e-reader still plugged into a defunct wall socket. On the desk in the room with the books was a photograph of a suited and smiling couple. Going by the blurry white shape of a bride in the background, it had been taken at a wedding. I hate photographs like that. The reminders of the happiness that used to fill the world. I closed the door to the bedroom and walked along the landing to the corridor. I looked up and down it and saw two things. First, the garage was visible through the windows. Second, there was a thick trail of blood leading to a closed door halfway down the corridor. I knew what I'd find there, and I was right. There were twelve bodies, all undead. Eight had been killed recently, the other four died months ago. It's hard to say when, but it would be more useful to know when those eight had become infected. Of those eight, seven were women. It was a similar ratio among those I'd killed in the garage, and they wore the same hard-wearing, cold-weather gear. I wasn't sure whether that was important or whether I was searching for an absent significance, in the hope it would bring understanding. They were shot, I murmured. Probably by Kim. Her body wasn't among the undead, nor was Rob's. The fight must have occurred shortly after they got inside. Kempton's people had to have been responsible for the barricade. That didn't explain why they'd built it on the second floor. One of them had been infected, turned, and attacked the others. That meant the zombies had got inside, and I wasn't going to learn how by staring at their twisted remains. I closed the door and saw the sheets, and saw I'd been wrong. I thought they'd been hung from a room, but they were hung out of the corridor window. From there I could see the garage, but not the hatch in the roof. It was just one more shadow among dozens created by the rows of panels, raised and angled so they'd catch the sun. Had Kim even known I was there? Had she seen the light? Perhaps not. Perhaps she'd thought I'd died during the scrabble to reach safety after the zombies appeared. Dark thoughts piled into one another, and I pushed them down. I'd waved at her and seen her wave back. I'd seen the light at night. She'd seen mine. I hadn't found her body. That's what mattered. It was all that mattered. Confirm Kim's really not here, I said, letting my voice carry to the other closed doors. If she's not, then she escaped. She'll come back or radio for help. But no matter how loudly I spoke, I couldn't believe the words. I opened the next door. It was another bedroom. There was a familiar pack on the floor. It was Kim's. Against the wall were two guns, not the SA-80s we'd brought with us from Anglesey, but the same model of stubbier submachine guns I'd found in the garage. They were unloaded. Her rifle isn't here, I said, grasping for the only thread left. You've not found her body. The words brought no relief. There's no one here, I said, almost shouting. There was no response, just the muffled shouting rustle from outside. Simon. The shots. His rifle. A wave of relief washed over me. There was no rifle in the room in which I'd killed Simon. Nor had I seen one immediately outside the window. Someone had fired those shots. If it wasn't Simon, it had to be Kim. I seriously doubted it would be Rob. In which case she had escaped. I headed for the stairs, telling myself I had proof she was alive. In the entrance hall... I could hear the thumping of undead fists against brick, but not against the front door itself. I fished out the torch and followed its beam down to the basement. There were twelve steps to a landing, and another twelve after that. They ended in a small corridor with a windowless sliding door of a design that completely failed to match the wood and paintwork upstairs. 
I gave it a tap with a knife and listened. Nothing. I slid the door open. It led to a hall with a ten-foot-high ceiling. About thirty feet long, it extended far beyond the front door. I wondered if I was wrong about there being a tunnel. Then remember the zombies in the garage. Had there been a tunnel, those people would not have been trapped there. A better question was why this property had been extended underground. Leading from the subterranean vestibule were two doors, one on either side. Half expecting to discover an underground lab like at Lenham Hill, I tried the one to the left and found myself in a spectacularly equipped kitchen. Six identical workstations, all with sinks, counters, cupboards and ovens, were arranged in a fashion that reminded me of a reality cooking show. Along the walls were more ovens and hobs, except where there were floor-to-ceiling doors. I assumed they were cupboards and cold rooms, and that at least one would lead to a walk-in freezer. There was no sign of Kim. I allowed myself to breathe out. I closed the door to the kitchen and tried the door on the opposite side of the vestibule. It led to a narrow corridor, eight feet wide. I shone the light up and down and thought its beam caught the far end, but couldn't be certain. On either side were cheap plyboard doors. All were closed. My mind whirred, trying to figure out what this place was. The answer was behind the first door. It was unlocked. In fact, there was no lock at all. Inside were two sets of bunk beds, with four narrow metal lockers opposite the door. The beds were made, and untouched. The lockers were empty. Whoever was meant to sleep there had never arrived at the house. My impression of this underground lair wasn't quite military, but it was definitely not civilian. That fit the image of Lisa Kempton that I developed from conversations with my brother. She'd wanted a base in rural Ireland in case the conspirators' plans for world domination went sour. The turbines, the solar panels, the farmland, all of those could be explained away to the world. Building cottages for... I stepped back outside and quickly counted the doors. Building cottages for at least forty full-time employees, who presumably didn't come from the local area, was going to arouse attention. The next room was just as empty and just as small. As I scanned the light on the regimental precision of the sheets, I revised my opinion again. The rooms upstairs had beds, books, and comfortable chairs. These basement rooms were temporary dorms, not semi-permanent homes for the estate's everyday staff. Or was I wrong? Was this basement room some kind of fallout shelter? Stop speculating, I murmured as I pushed at the next door. Something pushed back. There was a whistling moan. Hello? I said, stepping back a pace. The moan came again, and this time I was sure it was undead. Do it quick, I thought. I raised the knife lowered my left hand and awkwardly turned the handle while kicking the door open an inch. I brought the light up to what I thought was head height. Nothing appeared in the narrow gap. I shone the light down until it illuminated a withered, three-fingered hand clawing around the door. Unable to manage the simple combination of pushing the handle down and stepping out of the way, the zombie had pawed at the wooden door until its fingernails were worn and broken stumps. It banged into the door, and that slammed into the sole of my boot. I kicked back, then shoulder-barged the door. It flew open. The creature fell down as I slashed the blade through empty air where its head had been. I waved the light around until I found its battered, withered face. I screamed then, an echoing bellow of rage and regret. I dropped onto its chest, stabbing over and over at the head until it was still and my hands were covered in gore. I pushed myself up and drew the gun. I was still screaming, but rage had coalesced into a single word, buck over and over, Kim! It wasn't a call for her, but a plea 
and mournful lament. That zombie wasn't her, but for a moment I'd thought it was. She could be the next one, or the one after that. During the outbreak I'd been alone in my flat with no friends to fret over. When I'd left, I had no family to search for. I'd seen no loved ones die. I'd had no loved ones to watch die. Yes, there'd been Jen, but that had been different. By then, whatever love I'd held for her was in the past, replaced and superseded by Kim. Finally, I understood the horror, the fear, the nightmare that those people on the boats had suffered. They had escaped the outbreak, yes, but they had done so with their families, their friends. The infection had gone with them, and there, out on the empty ocean, they'd seen those they loved become the impossibly inhuman monsters they had to kill. Yes, finally, I understood their torment, and knew they would never be rid of it. Nor would I. Not in life, not until I found Kim, or the zombie she had become. Pistol raised, I went from door to door, kicking open one, then the next, until again I found resistance. I kicked the door with all my strength, and the weight of the leg brace and the depth of my fear gave the blow extra force. The hinges snapped, and the door pivoted sideways as the zombie tried to get out from behind it. I aimed at a face that wasn't Kim's. I fired. It fell. But the sound of the shot brought me out of my rage. I was at the last room on that stretch of hallway. I'd reached a T-junction. The corridor stretched off in either direction, with dozens more doors along it. There's a time for rage, and there's a time for caution. My blood was cooling from a boil to a simmer, and I wanted to see daylight again. I stalked slowly back along the corridor, retrieved my knife from the dead zombie's skull, and went back to the vestibule. My mouth was dry. My water bottle was empty. If there was water to be found anywhere, it was likely to be in one of the store cupboards in the kitchen. I opened the door. Something was wrong. One of the doors at the far end of the room was open. I moved the light left and right, knowing the zombie was in there. A leathery sound echoed. I stabbed the light into the darkness. Cupboards, taps, counters and shadows. I found nothing else. I forced my teeth closed against the yell of frustration and terror forcing its way up my throat. I listened and heard a slithering sound drawing nearer, and I thought I knew from where. I swung the light across the workstations, realizing almost too late that the sound was coming from the ground. I stepped back, shining the torch on a creature four feet away, crawling towards me, one arm, then the other slapped into the floor as it pulled itself along, dragging its useless feet after it. For a moment, I saw a different face in that wrecked visage. Not Kim's, but I imagined it was Mary O'Leary. Then the moment was gone. I fired and blew off the creature's ear. It snarled and squirmed and I fired again. This time, the bullet blew its head apart. The now open door that I thought led to a cupboard didn't. It opened into a walk-in larder at the end of which was a closed metal door. There were two handles, one at the top, one at the side. It had been a cold room, but without electricity it had become the tomb of the dead woman who lay on the floor. She'd shot herself. I was grateful for that. At least I was grateful that it was clear how she'd died, otherwise I wouldn't have known if I could trust the water. There were eight full bottles left, and it felt wonderful to down first one, then another. I stopped myself there. The remaining six might be the last of it in the mansion. I took those bottles, her revolver, and her suicide note, and went back upstairs to the entrance lobby. I can hear the undead outside, but until I've checked every last room, it's the safest place to be.
Let me rephrase that. Until I've decided whether to check every room or just to take my chances and limp away from the house as fast as my leg will allow, the entrance hall offers the most opportunities for escape. I don't mind dying while fighting for my life, but I don't want to become trapped, like Yolinda Day. That's the name of the woman who shot herself. Rather, it's the name that's at the bottom of the note I found next to the body. Here's what she wrote. Dear Miss Kempton, Unfortunately, circumstances prevent me from continuing in your employ. It must seem strange to you that anyone would wish to cease working in such a distraction-free location. The opportunities and experiences of the past months truly made me see the world anew. I look back at my life in Dublin with sheer wonder at the pointless extravagance and unproductive frivolity. Theatre, cinema, restaurants, friends. Who needs those when you have military rations to eat and solar panels to clean? It is with the deepest regret that I must tender my resignation. However, I would like to stress that my greatest regret is that I cannot do it in person. After all, this gun does have enough bullets for the both of us. Yours, Yolinda Day. Underneath, she added, To anyone else who finds this, my name is Yolinda Day. I lived at 19 Marshalls Mews, Dublin, until I took a job with Lisa Kempton. That was eight months ago. The idea of working directly for someone with her reputation wasn't a chance anyone could turn down. It was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, literally. I thought I was taking a job in corporate acquisitions. Instead, I ended up here. There were thirty of us originally. We were meant to keep this house ready as a refuge for two hundred survivors. Of course, we asked, survivors from what? They said that there was a ninety percent chance that Yellowstone was going to erupt, blanketing the earth in a thick layer of volcanic ash. Kempton had developed an early warning system for the U.S. government, so had advance notice of an eruption that was otherwise being kept secret. That was when they said we'd be allowed no phone calls, nor be able to leave until the danger had passed. There was anger at that, since it wasn't part of our original agreement, but they countered by offering us ten times our salary if they were wrong. If Kempton was right, we were told we were being offered a chance at survival. I can't say we had no choice but to say yes, as there was no explicit threat made if we didn't, but none of us said no. For me, greed won over common sense. The survivors never came. Yellowstone didn't erupt, but the world did end. While we were arguing about why the British emergency broadcast was being played on RTE's frequency and whether, when they said there were no outbreaks in the UK and Ireland, they meant the Republic as well as the North, the military arrived. They arrived on foot. That should have been a warning, as should the British uniforms and English accents. At about the time we realised they must have come by boat, the shooting began. I didn't see the battle as I hid down here in the kitchen. When it was over, there were a lot of dead soldiers, but only fifteen of us left. Sorrita Locke, Kempton's representative in Ireland, if not on earth, said they weren't soldiers, just mercenaries wearing the uniforms. I was more interested in why Locke had stored a small arsenal in the house. She told us that it was for this very eventuality. That was when I realised just how great were the lies we'd been told. We hid the bodies. We waited, expecting more soldiers to come. They didn't. Instead, the bombs fell. I don't know how those monsters got into the grounds, let alone the house. Nor do I know if Loch is dead, though I think she is. She led a group to fight her way into the garage in the hope of getting the cars out. That was a month ago. And now the zombies are inside the house. I was bitten an hour ago. I don't want to turn. 
I'll take my own life so I can be sure in death that I'll not take anyone else's. All I'd ask, whoever you are, if you find out that Campton is alive, if you find her, kill her. That was all she wrote. And I don't know what to make of it. I suppose that if we found out when Yolinda Day first came to the house, we'd be able to calculate precisely when Kempton thought the conspiracy might lead to the apocalypse. But to what end? The cabal is a footnote in history, and I'm concerned with the present. I took a break halfway through writing this entry to check the other ground floor rooms. I didn't find Kim. I found another kitchen one more in fitting with the decor of the above-ground house. It's got a utility room, leading to a back door, which is sealed tighter than the main entrance. Next to it was a billiards room, complete with table and cues. The window there was broken. The glass was on the inside, and there's a bullet hole in the wall. I think that's how Kim, Simon and Rob got in. I didn't find much else, and still haven't found Kim's body. There's an old-fashioned library complete with old-fashioned books, a dining room, and a conservatory. There are no plants in there, just more chairs. I'm not sure what Kempton planned to do with this place. Presumably, she had visions of her employees farming until they were too exhausted to do anything but sleep. There was no food in that smaller ground-floor kitchen, but there has to be food somewhere. I hope there is. During my inspection, I looked outside. I could hardly avoid it. Zombies surround the house. I'm going to guess at two hundred, but it's probably more. Assuming the gunfire I heard was Kim, and I am going to assume that, then I heard it at least two hours ago, possibly as long ago as four. She's had time to get back to Will and Lilith, and for them to charge in here that I've not heard any gunfire in the distance means they're either waiting for reinforcements or they sail back to Anglesey to collect them. So, either I find supplies or I fight my way out of here. I guess I have a decision to make. Chapter 13 Ardnamara, The Republic of Ireland 2100 Hours the 21st of September, day 193. After I finished that last entry, I glanced back at what I'd written, and then looked more intently at the previous entries. I realized what an idiot I'd been, or at least what an idiot my conscious mind has been. Fortunately, my subconscious made up for it in droves. The satellite images of the mansion and the fifty acres surrounding it had shown an estate absent of the undead. Those pictures were taken a week ago when the satellite made a pass over the house and grounds on its way to a stationary orbit over Belfast International Airport. The absence of the undead is why so few of us came on this expedition. We expected it to be a brief excursion ashore, a one-mile walk from the safety of our ship to an empty house. We'd spend a night gawking at how a billionaire lived, spend a day assessing any farming equipment in the barns, another weighing up whether the mansion could be a base for exploring this corner of Ireland, and then we'd return to Anglesey. We were expecting it to be safe. On discovering that it wasn't, on being surrounded by the undead, I should have asked myself where they come from. Instead, I turned to the comfort of a journal, that familiar crutch that kept me sane during the months of solitude and terror. So where did the zombies come from? The high wall, ringing the estate, had appeared undamaged on the satellite images. The part we'd seen for ourselves as we'd followed it to the gated entrance had been intact. It's possible that the wall has collapsed somewhere where the spreading canopy of a tree hid the fallen bricks from the camera's lens. Possible and unimportant. All that matters is that the zombies were inside the estate when we arrived, but not anywhere in obvious view. Where were they lurking? It has to be inside the barns that appeared so dilapidated on the satellite images. The basements here and in the garage were the clue that nothing was quite as it seemed. 
surely Kempton wouldn't have limited the underground excavations to these two buildings. Yolinda Day wrote about the undead, and how a group had fought their way to the garage. Thus, at some point, the zombies had been surrounding the house. Somehow, they'd ended up inside those barns. How? There's only one explanation. They followed someone there. Actually, considering what Yolinda Day wrote, it's more likely the zombies were lured there. Going by the contents of the suicide note, I couldn't imagine one of Kempton's people sacrificing themselves to save others. So how had this person escaped a barn full of the undead? A tunnel. If this was anywhere else, I'd have considered it an improbability. But here, with the extended basements, it's logical. After all, this entire property was built out of a sense of well-founded paranoia. A tunnel seems mandatory. More than that, it explains how the zombies got inside the mansion, and it gave me the method of my escape. So where was it? I tried to think like a megalomaniacal billionaire, and decided that the basement was the logical place to start my search. I went back downstairs and began with the dormitories, cautiously checking room after room, looking for a hatch, aware I might find more of the undead. I found neither. There was a small gym, a rec room, and two large washrooms, all collecting dust. I went back to the vestibule, searching for a hidden panel. I didn't find one. That left the kitchens. Beginning to second-guess my conclusion about a tunnel, I went inside, stepped over the dead zombie, and began checking the doors at the far end. The one next to the walk-in freezer, in which I'd found Yolinda Day, led to a shallow cupboard barely two feet deep. The shelves were empty except for salt, pepper, mustard, and five jars of hot sauce. The next was a similar cupboard filled with stainless steel saucepans, the third led to a storeroom, about the same dimensions as the walk-in freezer. There were a few boxes inside, but before I could check their contents, I heard a knocking sound. It was faint, but distinct, though I couldn't place where it was coming from. The next door led to another shallow cupboard. The final door was also a cupboard, though three times as deep as the others, and perhaps ten feet in length. Against the rear wall the bottom four shelves had been removed, and the panelling had been taken down. There was a hatch, about three feet square. Made of unpolished steel, it had two bolts opposite each of the hinges. From the other side came the sound. Rat-a-tat. Rat-a-tat-tat. Rat-a-tat. There was only room for one zombie against the hatch. That didn't mean... There was only one zombie in the tunnel. I already had the pistol in my hand. I looked around, checking my escape. I could close the door to the cupboard, but it had a simple latch, not a lock. I thought of Yolinda Day, and the question of how she got infected. She must have known about the tunnel. Perhaps she'd planned to escape that way herself, only to have opened the door and had a zombie tumble out. I was stalling, delaying the inevitable. I couldn't ignore the zombie. The door would break, it would get out, it had to be dealt with. I raised the gun, dragged the bolts aside and jumped back. I shone the torch on the swinging open hatch. The knocking had stopped, replaced by a coughing rasp. A figure tumbled out, falling onto the floor. A familiar face turned upward toward the light. Kim! My heart stopped. I froze. <coughs> Took you long enough, <coughs> she gasped. I'm sorry, I said, a flurry of emotions later. I'm an idiot. So am I, she said. What happened? I asked. The short answer? Rob, Kim said, and coughed. I passed her the bottle of water, and she downed half of it. He locked me in there. Tricked me into going in there, too. I assume it was a trick. Have you seen him? He's not in the house. Simon was. He... He was infected. A zombie. Oh. Did you... 
She trailed off, but I knew what she was asking. Yes, I said, yes, I did. Oh, Kim sighed. What time is it? I glanced at my broken watch. I don't know, about noon, I guess? The shadows weren't long the last time I looked, and that was just before I found you. The watch broke. Well, that's a pity. Wait, noon? Then it's only been twelve hours. It seemed longer. Are you sure Rob isn't here? Pretty sure. I heard gunfire, unmuffled shots about... Again, I glanced at my broken watch. I'm not sure, two hours ago? Perhaps three, perhaps less. It wasn't Simon, and as it wasn't you, it had to be him. Unless there was anyone here when you arrived. No, she said. There was no one here but the undead. We better check the armory and see if anything's missing. There's an armory? I asked. You didn't find it? I was looking for you, I said. I thought, I assumed, I thought you were dead or worse. She smiled. I'm not. The smile vanished. Rob, why? I looked at the bolts on the hatch. There was no way they could be thrown by accident. Where's the armory? I asked. The attic, she said. Attic? I, yeah, I forgot to check there. I just, I, I stammered into silence, unsure what I was trying to say. I know, she said. I really do. I followed her out of the kitchen and to the stairs. So what did happen? I asked. You remember when we got here, Simon and I went to check the house. You and Rob went to the garage. Sure. In retrospect, he didn't do a good job of checking the place was clear, I said. Well, I went up onto the roof. He was meant to check the garage. We can't have given it more than a glance. He didn't notice it was built on two levels and that the basement was full of the undead. Were those the gunshots we heard? Kim asked. That was you shooting the zombies. That's right, I said. Ah, uh, well, going back to when we arrived... Simon and I found the back door and discovered it was wedged tight. Next to it is a conservatory. Did you see it? No plants, lots of chairs, I said. And bulletproof glass, Kim said. Seriously, Simon actually shot at it, and the bullets bounced off. I almost lost an ear. She raised her hand to the side of her face, and her lips curled in a half-smile that froze and then vanished. He's really dead. He was a nice guy. Always cheerful. Kept telling me you'd be okay. She sighed again. One of the bullets ricocheted into a window on the main house. It fractured, and after a few blows with the butt of my rifle, it broke. We checked the room was empty, and that the corridor outside was clear when we heard Rob. We dragged him inside. He was babbling about zombies. He said he thought you were dead. I didn't believe him, and went back outside. By the time I got to the front of the mansion, there were dozens of zombies between the house and the garage, with hundreds more traipsing through the trees. Simon dragged me back inside. He was being rational about it. We had the rifles after all. If we were going to start shooting, why not do it from a secure and elevated position? Of course, the house wasn't secure. The undead were inside. We'd reached the second floor, and the knocked-over barricade. We put the bodies in a room over there, she said. I found them, I said. The attic's this way, just down here. By the time we'd killed those zombies, the grounds outside were full of the undead. That's when we hung those sheets. We paused for a moment by the closed window out of which they were hung, and looked down at the garage. I saw you on the roof, she said. I knew you were alive, but we couldn't get you on the radio. I lost my pack as I was trying to get out of the garage, I said. A zombie grabbed it, and I had to let it go. Ah, uh, you know Rob lost his rifle. He was empty-handed when he came running in here. Anyway, I called Lilith and Will and told them we were alive but trapped. They relayed it back to Anglesey. And? Did they say they'd send people? Sholto wanted to, she said. I said no. It would have been the Marines and Special Forces going to Belfast, and we weren't actually in any immediate danger. We had a secure location and enough ammunition to hold off the undead. 
I said Will and Lilith should stay where they were, and we'd wait for the zombies to become motionless, then we'd start shooting. Depending on what happened after that, we'd escape, or Sholto could launch his rescue. By then, Gwen would have returned to the island, so he'd have a way over that wouldn't require delaying the trip to Belfast. Sholto wasn't happy with that, but there was nothing he could do. Will wasn't happy either. I think he feels beholden to you, after you went to Carnarfon to rescue him. He wanted to rush in here, guns blazing. I told him not to. There were too many undead for him and Lilith to shoot on their own. At best, the zombies would have broken down the gate and followed them back to the boat. What good would that have done? Sure, you could have escaped the garage, but the zombies would still be out there. We'd still have to kill them if we ever wanted to use this house or scavenge what was left here. Lilith and I talked him down. So what went wrong? I asked. Rob. Simon and I watched the zombies in the garage. Rob, he kept disappearing. He said he was checking the house, the basement, making sure it was secure. I'm not sure I believed him. You were right not to, I said. There were zombies in the lower level. That was what you were shooting at. I never liked Rob. For someone who can't hold on to a rifle, he really did think a lot of himself. Last night, Simon was asleep, and Rob came up to say he'd found the tunnel. He said he'd gone through and it led to the barns. There were tractors and Land Rovers and two fuel tanks. He thought one might have been diesel or petrol, but he wasn't sure which. What he was certain of was that there were no zombies. He suggested we could drive one of the Land Rovers up to the garage and you could jump onto the roof, and we could drive off. I thought we could do what you did back near Q and use the engines to lure the zombies away. I wasn't sure we'd need to, but having a backup plan is always useful. I went into the tunnel. Did you make it to the barn? I did. Come on, the attic is this way. She gestured down the corridor. There are a couple of vehicles in the barn, bigger than Land Rovers, smaller than tractors, it was too dark to tell what they were. I couldn't see any fuel tanks, but I did see the zombies, at least ten, probably more, and not enough light to shoot them. I retreated back into the tunnel, secured the exit at that end, and crawled back along only to find the hatch was sealed. I'm assuming there was a sinister motive. I mean, it had to be deliberate. I guess, I mean... It's possible Rob thought I was a zombie, but that's not really an excuse. He had a gun, after all. I thought you said he dropped it. Not an SA-80, one of the MP-5s we found up here. There, that's the door. I pushed the door open. It looked identical to all the others we'd passed, but instead of leading into a room, it opened onto a narrow set of stairs. They and the walls were unpainted, stained with decades of dirt. At the top was another door. It's locked, I said, trying the handle. Good, you need the key, Kim said. Here. She pulled a sturdy iron key from her pocket and passed it up. The key was in the lock when you arrived. Yep, open it. I did. The door opened into an attic room about one-third the size of the mansion. Unpainted plasterboard walls sealed the areas to the left and right, though there was a small hatch on either side. It's quite clever, really, Kim said. Beyond the walls, there's another room divided by another wall. Each room has been subdivided into smaller and smaller rooms, making it hard to gauge how much space has actually been used. She walked over to a table a few feet from the door, on which were a row of submachine guns. Underneath was a crate of ammunition, with another empty crate next to it. We found these here like this, she said, but there's a compartment behind the water tanks. I think that's where they were stored. With all the pipework around there, a metal detector would be useless. I guess if someone was looking for a hidden room, they'd start by counting the windows outside, and then the ones inside, and they'd find each window accounted for. You can't leave an arsenal like this on display, I said, picking up a gun. A layer of grime had stuck to the oil but it didn't look as if it had been used. You found more downstairs? I asked. Near the bodies, she said. 
And ammunition? I asked. Sure. A couple of spare magazines and whatever was already loaded. They fired 9mm rounds, not the 5.56mm of the SA-80s. Hmm. They don't have silencers. I heard gunfire, I said. I heard it. Simon's rifle was missing. I thought you might have taken it, but it wasn't you. And it wasn't there, so it had to be Rob. But I heard gunfire. So? I don't know, it just doesn't make sense. Nor does locking me in that tunnel, Kim said. She bent down and opened the crate of ammo. There's some bottled water and canned food. More than enough to keep us alive until rescue comes. What worries me is if Rob's managed to persuade Lilith and Will that we're dead and they've set off back to Anglesey. She glanced up at the roof. Did you notice any paint anywhere? If we hacked a hole in the roof, we could paint a message and... No, it wouldn't work. They won't redirect a satellite until Rob tells them we're dead. About a minute after that, he'd have disappeared. I doubt we'd find him then. There are about nine hundred rounds. I've fifty-three for my rifle. How many zombies do you think are out there? In total? Three hundred, maybe four? Nine hundred rounds? Hmm. Tricky but doable. Nine hundred. I wonder why Kempton's people didn't shoot their way out. They probably did, she said. Or some of them did. The rest stayed behind, hoping that rescue would come. Or maybe they didn't have anywhere else to go. Maybe they thought, if they could wait long enough, the zombies would stop. It hardly matters, does it? I guess not, I said. Then we've two choices. Either we stay here, wait for Sholto, and use the time to kill the zombies, or we use the sound of the gunfire as a way of luring the undead to one side of the mansion so that we can escape from the other. We go after Rob and hope that Will and Lilith haven't left. Do you remember the time of the tides? I don't think I ever knew, I said. Wait, you're pack. Why don't we just radio them? Simon had the radio, and the Geiger counter, Kim said. He kept them in his pack and never went anywhere without it. But I thought you said it was gone, along with his rifle. The rifle was gone. I'm not sure about his bag. You should have said. Go and check. I'll start loading the magazines. The room in which Simon had died was barely changed. There was a little more light, a result of the zombies having battered the table until it had moved a few inches away from the broken window. That added distance meant that now only the tips of their fingers could reach it. The beating of fists had been replaced by an almost gentle stroking that was somehow far worse. Simon was still there, lying on his back. Some small part of me had hoped he wasn't. I guess, really, I was hoping that in the heat of battle I'd been mistaken, and it wasn't him that I'd killed. Dark blood had pooled up through his ruined eye where I'd stabbed him, but it was unmistakably Simon. Sorry, I murmured, though I knew he couldn't hear me. The apology was for me. It was the very least I could say. But all there was time to say, until we secured the house and could arrange a proper burial. He wasn't wearing his pack. I found it in the corner, and it had been partially emptied. There were no ration bars or ammunition, but it was possible that Simon had eaten the first and expended the second. His water bottle was missing, but he might have dropped it after he drank the contents. The Geiger counter wasn't there, but he could have left it somewhere in the mansion after he confirmed the radiation level was within safe parameters. There was no radio, and no simple excuse to explain away its absence. Why? Not just why was the radio gone, but why had Rob locked Kim in the tunnel? Assuming it was Rob. But who else could it have been? Not Simon. I'd not known him well, but I knew enough to place him as diligent, loyal, reliable, and honest. He was the kind of person you'd want at your back. Indeed. He was one of the first names that came to mind when this expedition was being organized. I found I was looking at his body, and then I saw it. I saw what had happened. And if I still didn't know why, I finally had a name for the crime. It was Rob. It was murder.
He had known there were zombies in the lower floor of the garage. He'd wanted me trapped in there and had assumed I'd die. When it became clear I wasn't dead, and that Kim and Simon were about to launch an almost certainly successful rescue, he'd tricked Kim into that tunnel. That he'd not shot us spoke both of cowardice and caution. From the journal, he would have known we were immune, and as such, even if he'd shot us in the head, especially if he'd shot us in the head, it would have been clear we'd been murdered. He'd have gathered that much following the revelation surrounding Paul. If we'd been torn apart by the undead, however, that would have aroused little suspicion. Simon was different. His death confirmed Rob's guilt, but I needed to confirm it for myself. I took out the bottle of water and emptied it over Simon's shoulder. In the gloom of the room and the shock of killing someone I'd known, I hadn't checked. It wasn't a bite. They were knife wounds. Simon had been stabbed five times, perhaps more. The number didn't matter, but the position did. Simon wasn't immune. Had Rob known that? Had Simon? I hadn't. Had Rob used his knife in the battle to secure the mansion, or had he deliberately coated it with infected blood? He trapped Kim and decided he had to escape. That meant Rob had to deal with Simon. He'd stabbed Simon and must have planned to disguise the murder as the death of a zombie, but Simon had turned. Rob had fled firing the gun when he was outside, perhaps to rile up the zombies, or because he'd forgotten the weapon wasn't silenced. No. He'd taken Simon's SA-80, so, though he might have fired the MP5 submachine gun when he was outside, first he fired at the glass, breaking it so he could escape. Coward that he was, after Simon had turned and Rob had found himself trapped in a room with a zombie, he had fled rather than fought. Coward? That word seemed wholly inadequate. I went back upstairs to find Kim. What is it? she asked. Are you all right? It was my subconscious, I said. All along it was trying to tell me. Instead, I wrote it down. Okay, she said. Try again, slowly this time. What is it? Simon was stabbed five times in the shoulder and neck. Here. I gestured at my own shoulder. Kim grasped the importance quicker than I had. Like with Llewellyn, she asked. And with a body we found in the university, I said. You think Rob did it, not Paul, she asked. Those other two were killed with one precise blow. The autopsy for Llewellyn showed that the knife went in just deep enough to sever the artery before the blade was withdrawn. That was done by someone who knew exactly what he was doing. Someone who'd done it before. And Simon was stabbed five times. Maybe more, I said. And he didn't die. He turned because there was infected gore on the blade. When we first met Rob in Carnarfon, he was with Paul. They'd gone with Marcus and a few others to the town, but disappeared before nightfall. They'd said they'd gone into Carnarfon but it's only about nine miles from there to Bangor. You could hike that in a night. If you found a bike, you could manage it in half the time. Why were they going there? The body in the university, I said. Remember, until Quigley died, everyone was planning on either scattering to the four winds or launching an assault on Northumberland. It was only with the destruction of his sub that anyone would have thought they were actually staying on the island long term. Paul would have realized that meant someone would go over to Bangor. The university would be looted. The body would be found. Paul had no boat and he didn't know how to sail one. He joined the first expedition he could, in this case the one to Carnarfon. He wanted to get rid of the corpse or perhaps destroy the evidence. Why? Kim asked. Why destroy the evidence? Why kill the man in the first place? No idea, I said. But he didn't destroy the evidence. They tried to get to Bangor, but failed. The key point is that Rob was with him. I guess he became Paul's protégé. Perhaps he helped Paul with David Llewellyn's murder. No one at Willow Farm saw him there. Hmm. What? No, I don't know, I said. It's an idea, but it's not important, not right now. 
Paul must have boasted about killing people with one blow. Perhaps he even showed Rob how, but showing isn't the same as doing. It took him five blows, and Simon must still have been alive, infected, but alive. Why? I mean, there has to be a reason. Does it mean that Llewellyn was connected to the man in the university? She shook her head. Maybe. But we don't have time to stand here and puzzle it through. Did you find Simon's pack? The radio's gone, I said. So is the Geiger counter and the rest of his ammunition. Then we need to get moving. It's a slim chance the boat hasn't left. But we can't let Rob get away. So we just need to get out of a house surrounded by the undead, I said. The Escape That's water and ammunition, Kim said, as she glanced out of the window. Not much food, though. We've been hungry before, and it's better to travel light, I said. We were back on the second floor, but by a window on the furthest side of the house and the room in which I'd entered, and by which we'd soon be leaving. Travel light and we might catch him. I dropped a hand to my belt. The knife, hatchet, pistol and torch were still there, but checking them was a compulsion. You ready? She asked. I wish I'd taken the time to find something more appropriate to wear, I murmured, sliding the window up. I still had on the chauffeur's uniform, which wasn't suitable clothing for any weather in our new world. No more delays. She raised the submachine gun taken from the stash in the attic and braced the stock on her shoulder. And if he's not at the boat, we won't be able to come back here. Stick to the coast, I said, raising my own MP5. Find somewhere we can light a fire or signal the boat when it comes. Okay. Last chance to change your mind. You want to? Kind of, she said. Chances are the boat's gone. We're not going to catch him. Sholto will come looking for us so we could stay here for a week, take our time and clear the property of the undead. We've enough ammo for it. It would be nice to rest, but we can't, can we? Not now, not ever. She fired, once, twice, three times, over and over, and each time the barrel moved a fraction of an inch. The corridor filled with the sound of gunfire. Below us, the zombies fell, but others rose, standing from their torpid crouch. They walked towards the mansion, arms raised, as if they were trying to reach up towards us. I aimed out of the window, picking a bare-headed, mud-splattered creature, as anonymous as all the others. I pulled the trigger. The submachine gun clicked. Safety, Kim reminded me. I found it, pulled the trigger, a dozen bullets sprayed from the gun before I'd time to let go. Select a switch, Kim said. I took aim as Kim returned to her robotic second-by-second shoot-aim-shoot. Shoot. I fired, and wasn't certain I hit anything, but it was a single shot and a bullet did leave the barrel. That was a small victory. From above, all I could see was a mass of dirt-covered, mud-colored shapes, bobbing and knocking and banging into one another. I picked a target and heard the sound of Kim reloading. The zombie was moving more violently than the others, its arms waving with such vigor it was knocking those near it this way and that. I thought, if I could kill it, the others would move less and so be easier to shoot. I aimed at its head and pulled the trigger. It must have been a miss, because there was no change in its ragdoll movement. I fired again, and again, and again, shot after shot, all aimed at that lanky, thrashing shape that just wouldn't stop jerking and dancing. The gun clicked empty. The zombie kept moving. I ejected a magazine and reached for a spare. I reloaded and found Kim was doing the same. I'm wasting bullets, I said. I'll check the other side of the house. She nodded. The expressionless mask she'd worn the first time we'd met had returned to her face. There was a set to the jaw, a depth to the eyes, a tension to the muscles that when added to the shadows in the room made me think of her as an avenging angel, irrevocably set on a course that would lead to death. But it wouldn't be hers. Just like old times, I murmured 
as I walked back along the corridor. It was obvious the simple trick was working before I reached the far end. Zombies from around the garage were already drifting towards the sound of the gunfire and the milling mass of the undead beneath Kim's window. Not all of them were moving. Three were still pawing at the garage's metal doors. Near the silent ornamental fountain, a zombie stood almost motionless. Another, near the far edge of the house, was slowly clawing at the brickwork. Perhaps they were blind, or deaf. It didn't matter. Immediately outside the room by which we were going to escape, there were ten zombies, with another twenty close enough that they would surround us as we climbed out. Two were already drifting away, then three, then four. How many had to leave? Kim was a good shot, but was she that good? Five, six, there were still too many. Beyond the creatures the fir trees moved, but not with the breeze. I walked further along the corridor, around the perimeter of the house, until I could see the road that led to the main gate. It looked free of the undead, and that meant it was time to go. I limped back along the corridor to Kim. About fifteen left outside near the window, I said, but the road looks empty. She ceased fire and slung the MP5. Count to twenty and shoot, she said. One shot, then count to five before firing the next. When the magazine is empty, go downstairs. I'll meet you there. Where are you going? She unslung her silenced rifle. To deal with those fifteen. I watched her leave, counted to twenty, and fired a shot out of the window. A zombie spun backwards, but it wasn't the creature I was aiming at. How many zombies in Ireland? I murmured, as I tapped my finger against the trigger guard, counting out five seconds. One million? Five? More? Less? I fired. In that squirming, swarming mass of undulating death, it was impossible to tell where the bullet went. There had to be at least two hundred zombies out there, but there was no point counting them. I fired again. It was a fool's errand, leaving safety, going after Rob in the slim hope that the boat was still there. But it wasn't empty-minded revenge that was driving us both. That phrase of George's has been buzzing around my head since I first heard it. We're the help that comes to others. I fired again. On the surface, it seemed an idealistically simple statement. As the weeks had gone by, I saw what the old man meant by it. There is no one else. We are alone. There's another fantasy we've all been clinging to, one deeper than that of a farmhouse and family. We keep expecting to find some last bastion of civilization, a city or culture that survived intact, a navy and air force ready to come to our aid. The satellites proved what we knew in our hearts. We are it. If any help is going to come, it will have to come from ourselves. We have no choice but to act, and no time to rest. I fired paused, fired, barely aiming, barely looking at the mass of the undead until the rifle clicked empty. I pulled the window closed and walked away, kicking a path through the drift of cartridge cases. Kim was waiting by the top of the stairs. I got them, she said. I think I got four, I said. You're improving. We walked downstairs in silence. There was nothing that needed to be said. Outside the broken windowed room, we shared a look. We're the help that comes to others, I said, voicing what I thought we were both thinking. I love you too, she replied, with a flash of a grin. I opened the door, spared a glance at Simon's body, made a quiet promise to return for him, and crossed to the window. I dragged the table away. A zombie crawled across the grass twenty feet away, but otherwise... Only the twice-dead lay outside. I climbed onto the sill and dropped down, landing with one foot on an undead corpse. I hopped, stepped and staggered away from the house as Kim dropped down behind me. I drew my hatchet, she her machete. 
pausing to hack down on the crawling zombie and giving the creature no more thought than that, we headed towards the road. I felt exposed. Inside the house it was easy to forget my injured leg. Out in the open I was quickly reminded how slow I can be. Kim easily kept pace. As for the undead, we were spotted by two that had been lurking near the corner of the house. They began a pursuit, but I was certain they wouldn't catch us. The road was a hundred yards away. The ground between it and us was filled with two-foot-high overgrown grass. I twisted around, looking behind. Stop looking, Kim said. It slows you down. Focus on the road. I tried. The trees screening the farmland from the mansion were moving and undulating, and I knew the undead were behind them. I tried to discern a pattern in the waving branches, looking for some indication of which direction the creatures were moving. Because I wasn't looking ahead, I didn't see it. Kim did. She darted forward as an undead arm barely three feet ahead of me reached up. She slammed her machete down, splitting its skull. Thanks, I murmured. The zombie's legs were missing below the knees. Run over, perhaps? Then my brain changed gears, processing what it meant. I turned around. The path we cut through the long grass was marked with a trail where we pushed the vegetation out of the way. Three other trails were slowly converging as unseen undead crawled and squirmed towards us. I limped. She ran faster than before. There, she said, pointing to her left, and then started running in that direction. I followed, and we were now running parallel to the road. I saw the next creature before she did. A clawing hand rose through the wispy seeding fronds. I swung the hatchet down and jumped over the fallen creature, uncertain that I'd killed it. Kim changed direction again, once more angling for the road. She leaped sideways and stepped back, hacking the machete down. Almost there, she yelled, just as something caught around my foot. I fell hard. My chin hit the ground. Everything went white and quiet for a second that lasted a decade. My vision spun, so I closed my eyes, pushing myself forward, kicking my legs, feebly at first, then with vigor, until they were free. A hand reached down and grabbed my arm. I twisted, trying to free myself from the iron grip. Bill, it's me! I let Kim help me up, and help me on as my vision cleared, and we ran the last dozen feet to the road. The feel of that hard surface was wonderful. Never again, I said, looking at the long grass, still waving and moving, as the crawling creatures dragged themselves towards us. We said that before, Kim said. Once more I began the limp hop step that was as close to a run as I could manage, and she jogged along beside me. I lost my hatchet, I said. You could have lost your leg, she replied. The road didn't run straight through the farmland. It dipped and curved as it led towards the perimeter and the main entrance. We'd reached the top of a shallow rise. Below us, on the road, were two zombies. Both were turning around. You see that? I said. They were heading towards the main gate. I spared a glance towards the house. Surely it was close enough for these zombies to have heard the gunfire. Evidently not but they'd heard us. They turned around and lurched our way. They seem slow, Kim said, drawing her machete. She eyed the farmland either side. I did the same. It's just those two, I said, drawing my hunting knife. For now, she said. We slowed our pace and waited for the zombies to pick up theirs. They didn't. One threw an arm out and staggered sideways with emotion. The other raised a leg and sagged forward at the waist. It's hard to describe, but it's almost as if they were tired. I moved to the left, Kim to the right. As I drew nearer, the zombie lurched forward, its arms raised up, but only a few inches above its waist. I grabbed the shoulder of its rotten suede jacket for balance and plunged the knife into its eye. It fell. I glanced at Kim. She was wiping her blade clean on the other creature's ruined clothes. We shared another look, one of mutual puzzlement at the zombie's odd behavior. 
It lasted until we saw movement to our right. Coming across the furrowed dirt of an empty field were four more of the creatures, baked hard by the sun. The ground offered no obstacle. Unlike the two we just killed, they moved just fine. The one in the lead wore a fleece of the same cut and style as those I'd killed in the garage. Was this the last of Kempton's people? Had none of them escaped? I don't know why, but I felt sorry for them, though only for a heartbeat. We continued down the road, increasingly aware of the zombies now following us. There was no way we'd be able to return to the house. The only direction was onward. Time goes slowly when I try to run, so I don't know how long it took before the pillars on either side of the gate came into view. After another ten steps of the road's shallow incline, the metal gate became visible. Where the wall ringing the property was fifteen feet high, the pillars either side of the entrance were twenty feet high. The gate was barely twelve feet wide and hardly formidable. Made of metal railings on a trio of hinges, there was a bolt in the ground and another in the middle. From the way it was shaking back and forth, only the bolt in the middle had been thrown. There was no gate house or postern gate for pedestrians, just a post box on the outside. Anything more sturdy would have been noticed and discussed until it had reached the ears of the local TD who'd backed the project. Going by what Yolinda Day had said in her letter, I guess they didn't have many visitors, and the gate was principally there to keep the employees inside. When we'd arrived, we'd found the gate closed, with an unpadlocked chain running through it. Now there were over twenty zombies pushing and shoving at it. Rob must have come this way, I said, as we came to a stop. Two hundred yards from our only route of escape, must have," Kim said, unslinging the MP5. "No point being quiet." I reached for my own gun, but changed my mind. I took the machete from her belt. "I'll watch our rear." She fired, and I couldn't help but turn and look. Damn it! It was a miss, but it got the zombies' attention. All but one turned around. She fired again. This time a zombie spun backwards as the bullet blew the back of its skull. Better, she muttered. To our right, I could see for a quarter mile. There was a ploughed field now filled with weeds, then an overgrown paddock that had a screen of trees shielding whatever lay beyond. To our left was a half a mile of dirt, weeds, and the undead. Dozens of them. Immediately behind us. I could only see for four hundred yards. The undulating road was clear, but I knew the zombies had followed us from the mansion. It wouldn't be long before they caught up. I looked again at the zombies lurching across the sun-baked mud. How many undead were inside the estate? Five hundred? A thousand? Again, I wondered how they'd come to be there, not how they got in. But why so many had found their way to this remote corner of Ireland? They'd followed someone or something here, but who? Why? Damn! Oh no, I did get it. Thought I'd missed. Kim muttered. I turned my attention back to the present and to our near future. We had five minutes, and then we'd be surrounded. Within ten minutes, we'd be overwhelmed. There was no escape behind us. Nor to either side. The only way out was forward, and that was full of zombies getting nearer with each second. Eight were down. Eleven staggered on, with one left by the gate. Kim fired. The nearest fell. The others lurched closer. She fired again, and this time it was a miss. The gap closed. The nearest zombie was less than a hundred feet away. I took a step to my left. Kim fired again. Again, she missed. Take your time, I said. We've got plenty. Thin them out. She grunted, aimed, fired, aimed, fired. The nearest was twenty feet away. I took a step forward, staying out of her line of fire, but giving myself room to swing. I raised my arm, fixing my eyes on the open mouth, 
a snarling grimace, the inhuman face. I ducked under its outflung arms, hacking low at its legs. The blade bit deep, almost severing its limb. It toppled forward as I jumped back out of the way. There were four left. My brain hadn't registered the sound of the shots. I hacked the machete onto the fallen creature's skull, and then swung it up, then down, hacking at the next creature's head. It fell. I stepped back. There were two, then one, then none except the zombie still standing by the gate. Okay? I asked. Kim nodded. We both turned around. The zombies following us were getting closer. I could count twenty bobbing heads less than two hundred yards away, and more than twice that number behind. We headed to the gate. I don't know why, but some part of me thought that last zombie would be Rob. It wasn't. It was just another grime-coated creature in unidentifiable rags. I hacked the machete down on its skull. We pulled the bolts, opened the gate, and left Kempton's apocalyptic retreat. We closed the gate and pushed the bolts, too. Outside, on the road, were two bodies, both undead. They were riddled with bullets. Rob must have come this way, Kim said, shouldering the MP5 and unslinging the sniper rifle. Yeah. I looked at the zombies lurching towards us. Soon they'd reach the gate. I wondered if it would hold. We'd find out when we returned. And we would return. The solar panels were intact, as were the electric cars and the turbines. When we returned, we'd kill the zombies and properly investigate the house and its former occupants. First, we had to get back to the boat. Though as we hurried along that old country road, I was certain we'd find it was gone. It wasn't. It was still there, tied up to the concrete jetty. But there was no sign of Will or Lilith, nor Rob come to that. Just two zombies standing on the quay, ten feet from the boat. Kim unslung the rifle, taking out the two creatures before I could tell her to stop. I wanted to see whether they were heading to the boat or following the coast. I was hoping, you see, that Lilith and Will had set off in pursuit of Rob. They hadn't. We'd come over in a sailing boat, a one-masted racing yacht bearing a picture of a setting sun next to its inauspicious name, Sleepless Dream. Lilith and Will lay inside. Both were dead, riddled with bullets. So was the boat, and it looked as if the rounds had struck the hull below the waterline. Their bodies were already surrounded by water, tinged red with their blood. I jumped down. The yacht rocked and sank an inch. I searched for a pulse, though I knew there was no point. They're dead, I said. Rob, Kim said from the jetty. It had to be. But why? Because Lilith and Will didn't believe we were dead? I said. Or because they didn't believe Rob at all? I saw the sat phone, underwater, and a few inches from Will's outstretched hand. Bearing in mind why the university had originally bought them, the device must have been waterproof. Perhaps it was. But a bullet had passed straight through the keypad. I dropped the broken phone back in the water. He must have been calling Anglesey, I said. That's why Rob opened fire. I could be wrong, but it didn't matter. The end result was the same. Will and Lilith were dead. The boat was sinking. Their rifles are missing, Kim said. Check the ammunition. It was gone, as was a large portion of the food we'd brought with us. We'd left it on the boat, not wanting to be over-encumbered when we'd gone to the house. There'd been enough supplies for all of us for a week. He can't have taken it all, I said. Let's hope he has, Kim said. He won't be able to walk fast carrying it. Do you think Will got through to Anglesey before he died? Perhaps. If he did. I glanced at the sun. 
it was heading towards the horizon. Dusk can be more than three hours away. They won't get here until tomorrow at the earliest. Rob will have headed inland, Kim said, away from any ship that might come. And away from the house, I said, looking along the coast. There was no path, just ragged patches of green grass and bare rock, and he's nowhere in sight. If he was, he'd have shot at us. We're going after him? It was barely a question. Kim nodded. I climbed back onto the jetty, took out the journal, and tore off a page. Rob did this, I wrote. He killed Simon. He tried to kill us. We're in pursuit, Bill and Kim. Pursuit So he's got Simon's rifle, an MP5, and Will and Lilith's weapons, plus all that food and ammo, Kim asked. How much is that going to weigh? A hundred kilos? That has to be more than him. He'd have to have dropped at least some of it, I said, turning my head left and right. We were walking briskly, roughly following the shore away from the boat. There was almost a track, though it didn't really deserve the name. It was just a curling line of worn rocks, where there wasn't enough dirt for any grass to take root. After a quarter mile, flowering heather began easing its way through and around rocks that were increasingly covered in a light green moss. A hundred yards after that, the nearly invisible path vanished as the ground turned to a cliff that dropped down to a rocky inlet. We headed inland, tromping through the increasingly dense heather with a stubby holly bush as our guide. It was strange. With a sound of the sea loud in my ears, I could almost imagine that the last eight months hadn't happened until Kim took a step past me. She raised the barrel of her rifle, pointing it at a dry stone wall. As we drew nearer, I saw the road on the other side, closer still, and I saw the rifle propped against the stones. It was an SA-80 with a silencer attached. Rob. Kim said. He's beginning to lighten his load. She picked up the rifle. He took the magazine. I knocked a few stones loose as I climbed over the wall. They rattled to the ground, and I paused, listening, but all I could hear was the sea. We followed the road, away from the mansion, our eyes and ears open, not saying a word until we reached a T-junction, where an even narrower road cut inland. He'd avoid the coast, I murmured, scared that someone on a rescue boat would see him, Kim said. But if we're wrong... She didn't finish, and I knew the fear. Rob had burdened himself down with loot, and that gave us the chance of catching him, but only if we found him before nightfall. Each branching road half the chances we would. We're not going to catch him standing here, I said, and took the turning heading inland. Kim paused, laying the unloaded SA-80 down on the road, so that the silenced barrel pointed in the direction we were going. If we find him, she said, are we going to try to arrest him? Will we take him back? I don't know. I think so, if we can. It's not going to be likely, she said. This isn't like Rachel or even Paul. He'll be armed, and we know his guilt. Are you saying we shouldn't try? No, she said. I'm saying I don't want to. And that's why we should. Summary execution isn't justice. And without justice, without laws, we're nothing. We're not a society or a community, just a war band with electricity. We have to try. We have to give him a chance, but only one. How can I describe Ireland? That was my first real sight of it. There had been a few trips to Dublin and a few more to Belfast, but I'd never ventured beyond those two cities. When we'd arrived, we'd gone straight to Kempton's estate with barely an hour between making landfall and being trapped by the undead. Ireland is wild, windswept and green. At least, it seemed greener than anywhere I'd recently been. Hollyhead? Carnarfon, Bangor, Menai Bridge, 
Those might be small, but they're still towns. Even Anglesey itself, though it's mostly farmland, has rooftops always on the horizon. Before we'd found that refuge, there was southern England. In my memory, it's a bleak and forlorn landscape absent of life. During our escape from London, we'd stuck to the train line until we'd been trapped by the horde. Then we travelled through a cratered landscape as barren as the moon. Ireland, or at least that small corner we saw this afternoon, was green and truly remote. I suppose that's why Kempton chose the location. Wait, Kim said, and jogged a few yards ahead and to the side of the road. She reached behind an ancient marker stone, so weather-worn that the name and distance were illegible. She held up another S.A. 80. She grinned a feral smile of delight and raised her rifle. Peering down the scope, she scanned the road, the hill to our left, and the road again. I eased the MP5 from my shoulder. Against the undead, I'd be wasting ammo. Against Rob, even an inaccurate burst would make him take cover. We began walking more quickly. He doesn't know we're following him, I said. No, Kim said. Lilith and Will were cold, but that might have been the seawater. He's got at least a three-hour head start, Kim said. Well, he's Rob, I said. He'd take cover as soon as he dared. It wasn't at the first house we came to. The building was empty, the door open, the windows broken. The roof had partially collapsed though it looked like a recent construction. Wind and rain, I guess, Kim said. Damn, another five minutes wasted. She sighed and continued walking down the road. Silence settled, but not for long. There, I said, pointing. Do you see it? A body. Kim's rifle came back up as we double-timed it to the corpse. It was a zombie and it lay just where the road bulged into the neighbouring field, providing an overtaking spot for any driver caught behind a slow-moving tractor. Recent, Kim said, gesturing at the black-brown gore still spreading from the dozens of wounds on the zombie's chest and legs, and oozing from the larger hole in its head. Twenty bullets at least. Probably an entire magazine. No. No, if it was, he'd have dropped the empty one here. We might catch him yet. Another ten minutes we came to another body. After twenty, a second, after thirty minutes, we found Rob. Justice I walked slowly down the road and stopped by the waist-high concrete wall. Access to the bungalow was through a wooden five-bar gate, currently held open by an undead corpse. Like the zombies a little further up the road, it looked as if it had taken at least a dozen shots for Rob to kill it. The other three bodies littering the driveway had taken a similar effort. It made sense, of course. Where in England would someone like Rob have learned to fire a gun? The question was whether it really was him inside the one-story house. The front door was closed, the windows unbroken, the driveway was empty, but I was certain there was someone inside. Smoke drifted lazily from an out-of-character chimney flush against the eastern wall. I was itching all over, but my palms were the worst. I hated having my hands empty, but it was necessary. I could almost sense someone watching me. I glanced back the way I'd come, but the road was empty. There were no undead in sight. No people either. Just me and the smoke. And then a shadow moving past the bungalow's window. Hello? I called. Is there anyone there? My mouth went dry. I wanted to duck down behind the wall. I told myself that, as Rob was such a terrible shot, the safest place to be was standing in plain sight. I waited. I was about to shout again, when there was a sound of something heavy being moved inside the bungalow. 
A moment later, the door opened, and Rob stepped out. He looked exhausted. He didn't look scared, but wary, confused. He had a silenced SA-80 rifle in his hands, but the barrel was pointing at the ground. Bill? he asked, and sounded surprised to see me. Rob, I said, and my tone was grateful, though not for the reason he might expect. I, I thought you were dead, he said. No. Yeah, he said, taking another step, looking around. Yeah, everyone else is. I'm sorry, but Kim's dead. Her and Simon, it was the zombies. I wasn't willing to play his game. When we first met near Carnarvon, I asked, you and Paul were trying to get to Bangor, weren't you? What? Yeah. He took another step and craned his neck forward, looking left and right down the road, as if confirming that I was alone. Why? What does that matter? Another judge might call that circumstantial, but it was enough for me. Did you know Paul before? I asked. Why are you asking? I wasn't sure whether to take that as a yes or no, but wasn't going to ask him again. His guard was rising, and there was something I wanted to know, a question that wasn't for me, but for a woman who must surely be dead. Did you kill Nilda's son? No, he said. I didn't believe him. Even so, there were a few questions that had to be asked, simply so that I could say the words had been said. What about Lilith? I said. Will. What about them? Rob said. I didn't know them before, if that's what you mean. I'm asking you why you did it, I said. Why did you kill them? What do you mean? The barrel of his gun twitched. He took a step closer. My own hands twitched in an involuntary reply, but I kept them down by my side. I saw the bodies, I said. I know it was you. You stabbed Simon. Did Paul teach you that? You weren't a very good student. You didn't do it well. Took you five goes. Even then you missed the artery. Why kill him? Why kill any of them? I didn't, he said, in a reflexive denial. You took their weapons, I said. That's Simon's rifle you're holding. His eyes went down, and his head fractionally bowed, so he could see the weapon more clearly. When his head rose, he met my eyes. A wicked smile slowly spread across his face until it turned into a bitter laugh. All right, Mr. Wright. You want to ask questions? Well, I have one for you. Why'd you bring me here? To give you a second chance, I said, to get you away from Marcus and allow you to show that you had some measure of worth. Yeah, you see, I thought you'd lie. You always lie, you and your kind. You killed all those people on the evacuation, and then you walk into Anglesey like you're in charge? Yeah, I read your journal, but I didn't believe it. You might fool all those people on the island, not me, no, no, I know that's a lie, and I know you're lying now. So why did I want you here? I asked. To kill me, of course. I knew you would. You got Rachel to shoot Paul, so I was going to be next, wasn't I? If I wanted you dead, why didn't I just kill you on Anglesey? I asked. Because of witnesses, because of questions. You know if they get asked your story will come apart, all your plans will fall down. So, you have to do it where there are no witnesses. Yeah, that's why you wanted me here. You're wrong, I said. You're seeing a conspiracy where there's none. Put the gun down. Oh, yeah? He laughed again. <laughs> you just don't get it. Your world's gone. It's my world now, all mine, my kingdom. I've inherited it. Don't you get it? Put the gun down, Rob, I said louder this time. 
put it down. Nah, your time's up. The barrel of his rifle began to pivot upwards. Your life's... I didn't hear the shot, but then neither did he. He spun and tumbled, crumpling into a heap. I glanced at the thicket of trees on the crest of the field to the left of the bungalow. I saw Kim stand. I raised a hand and then turned to Rob's corpse. It was a good shot. A bullet had taken Rob straight through the heart. Did he confess? Kim asked, coming up the drive, her rifle still in her arms. More or less, I said. He admitted he and Paul were going to Bangor. He didn't quite say it, but he intimated he killed Will and Lilith. It doesn't matter, since that's Simon's rifle. Did he say why? She asked. He thought we were going to kill him, I said. He thought we'd stage Paul's death, though I'm not sure who the we is in his delusion. But he admitted it, she asked again. Yes, I said, yes, he did. He did it. He killed Simon, Will, and Lilith. He was about to kill me. You were right to shoot him. It's not that, she said, or not just that. I want to know that in the end he admitted what he'd done. There was no remorse, I said, no apology, no regret. He laughed. I don't know if I can say the world will be better off without him in it but I won't mourn his passing. I knelt down and began searching Rob, taking the ammunition from his pockets. It was quickly done, but I didn't stop my search. What are you looking for? Kim asked. I don't know, I said. A confession would be nice, but I don't think he was the writing kind. Back in the mansion there was a folder on the desk of an office. It was open and empty. That wasn't you, right? No. It was empty. Yes. There was a label that read Embarkation. There was dust on the desk, but not on the folder. So if it wasn't you who took the contents, it had to be Rob or Simon. And Simon would have told you. Ah! I pulled a folded wad of paper from Rob's pocket. It was two sheets, both with the logo of Kempton's company. What is it? Kim asked. Two sheets of paper. This one's a list of numbers. I stared at it, but they were meaningless. The other... Ah, this is more like it. It's a list of addresses. Where? Um, I'm not sure. I think this one is Cape Verde. When we had Captain Devine over for dinner, didn't she mention a Cittage Velia? I suppose there might be one in Spain... There are some addresses in English, but I'm not sure they're in England. There are no countries listed. Do you think there are more estates with farmland and wind turbines? No, Elysium isn't mentioned. Embarkation? To go where? How, I wonder? Here, this one, Palace Kenry. That's a village on the southern side of the Shannon Estuary. Not quite, but almost opposite Shannon Airport. And if there was a place famous for transatlantic flights, it was Shannon. I doubt Rob knew how to fly. But perhaps it's a boathouse. Rob seemed confident, not scared, not like he was on the run. When he thought I was alone, his confidence grew. He acted as if he had a plan. The only thing that would have mattered to him is an escape or a refuge. As to which it was, we'll have to figure it out when Sholto arrives, and we've cleared Elysium of the undead. Or we could just use the satellites to get an image of the place. We could see what it is without having to visit, Kim said. That would be simpler, yes. I looked for somewhere to put the list and settled for the journal. You should write it down, Kim said, exactly as it happened, and do it now, while it's still fresh in your mind. Now? Why not? Sunset's less than an hour away. We didn't see any zombies coming up this way and none were following us. She crossed to the gate and kicked the corpse out of the way, allowing the gate to swing closed. She slid the bolts closed. 
It's a short walk back to the coast. If we get surrounded, we've got enough ammunition to fight our way out. Tomorrow, we'll go back to the coast and wait for the boat. Tonight, you need to write down what we did and why. We need a proper account that can be presented to the community. Our actions have to be judged like Rachel's were. Otherwise, she stared at Rob's body. Hell, Bill. Otherwise, what's the point? I really do wonder. Each day, it's two steps forward and three sideways. We never end up where we expect. Certainly not where we intend. And I'm not sure it's ever anywhere better. Epilogue, Ardnamara, the Republic of Ireland, 2330, the 21st of September, day 193. Poor Simon, Kim said, closing my journal after having skimmed through it. And poor Will and Lilith, so many people have died. I don't know if I have any tears left to shed. We said we'd find a time to mourn, but I wonder whether we ever will. She cleared her throat and forced a smile. You didn't need to explain who Lisa Kempton was. I didn't. Everyone on Anglesey knows. Annette certainly does. And you missed out the argument you had with Mary O'Leary about the vehement. I thought there were some things that should be forgotten. I said, or at least not written down. That's not how a proper chronicler would do it. You have to include everything, the bad and the good. You should have put in the trial at least. There wasn't time. I said. That's when I heard the gunshots. Well, you should record it. It was important. She said. What's there to say? Rachel was found not guilty, but it took more time selecting a jury than it did for them to come to a verdict. Right, precisely. That should go in. I'll get around to it at some point. I said. And the planning for all the trips? She asked. You barely mentioned the one going to Belfast. I can write about that when they get back to Anglesey. I said. When we get back to Anglesey too. I bet you won't. She said. But you should. There should be a record. I think, in some ways, I think it might help hold people together. We need something to do that. These expeditions, like Belfast and the islands and the Irish Sea, they've helped. But in a couple of weeks, everyone will be back on Anglesey. Well, not all of us. Or Simon, Lilith, and Will, she sighed. But when everyone's back, what then? The satellites will be a distraction for a while. But when winter comes and we can't leave Anglesey, interest in them will fade. The cold weather may prove Mary right, and people will come ashore, but I think it will just bring as many problems—problems problems for which I don't think another volume of my journal will be a solution. It might be, she said. It can't hurt. But if you don't want to do it for anyone else, write it for Daisy, write it for Annette, because you know she's going to keep nagging you until you do. She opened the journal again. And leafed back through the entries I'd made while stuck in the garage. There are parts missing, questions that need answers. Like what? We still don't know why Paul killed that man in the university, or why he killed Fluellen either. It probably never will, I said. But my money is on Paul being the one who handcuffed Fluellen to the bed and left him there to die. That's what the court record will show. Which is another reason for you to write an account of the trial," she said. I didn't argue. The list we'd taken from Rob's body fell out. She picked it up. Addresses. How did Rob know this list was in the house? If he thought we were going to kill him, why didn't he make his move straight away? Cowardice, I suggested. That would be a reason for him to have killed us the moment we got into the house. No, instead he kept disappearing. Kim said, "Why? He was looking for a tunnel." I suggested, "How did he know there was one?" Kim asked, "Because he did know. He must have known exactly where it was." You wrote that when you first went into the kitchen, there was no zombie in it. The second time, 
After you fired a shot, there was. The zombie had been hiding behind that door. Rob didn't open it. He must have known where the hatch to the tunnel was. You mean, someone told him? About the tunnel and the list of addresses, Kim said. I doubt Rob worked for Kempton, but what if someone on the island did? Someone who knew about this property, maybe someone who escaped from here. Not Kempton herself, because everyone knows what she looks like. I wonder who. It's another mystery to be solved, I said. An important one. But we won't solve it tonight. There was a sound from outside. The soft and almost unfamiliar patter of rain hitting the bungalow's window. Autumn's arrived, I said. A few weeks late, but it's here. If it's a storm, then our rescue boat might be delayed, she said. But you were thinking about the radiation, about Birmingham. I was. Don't, she said. Don't worry about things you can't change. Let's talk about something else. Something different. You said that you've been to Ireland before, Belfast and Dublin. I said, "Tell me about it." There's not much to say. I said, "There were conferences where I didn't see much beyond the airport and hotel." Tell me anyway, she said. We talked as the rain fell, and until she fell asleep. I'll do the same soon. Rob's dead, but so are Simon. Lilith and Will, David Llewellyn could be added to that side of the scales, but it's not balanced by adding Paul to the other. That's four good people dead, a good deal of ammunition expended, a boat lost, and nothing to show for the effort. We are the help that comes to others. If that's true, then we've done a poor job of it over the last few days. If I've learned anything since the outbreak. It's not to wallow in the past, but look to the future. The question now is whether there are others to whose help we can come, or is it too late? Does our community on Anglesey represent all that are left? Two steps forward and three steps sideways. We never end up where we plan, and each new journey is more difficult than the one that went before. Looking at Kim. Asleep on the mildewed sofa, I will say that for me, if no one else, that journey is worth making. I can't tell if our future is bleak, or in comparison to what went before, whether it is bright. Perhaps, it is both, just as it would have been for generations and centuries. Perhaps I think too much, and it's time to sleep. Tomorrow will come. Whether I'm rested or not, and whatever it brings, at least I won't be facing it alone. The end. This has been Surviving the Evacuation, Book Eight, Anglesey, written by Frank Tail, narrated by Tim Bruce, copyright 2016 by Frank Tail, production copyright 2017. By Frank Tail. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.